The NFL Draft is here again, which means billionaires are hiring millionaires to pick football players for them, mostly quarterbacks. Because a great quarterback is the key to a great team. But here's the truth. None of these billionaires, millionaires, actually knows how to determine what college quarterbacks will be great in the pros. They're all guessing, which makes the next few days actually hilarious. Get the popcorn. Get your popcorn in Kansas City where they are ready for the 2023 NFL Draft. See, the season of hope starts right now. The path to a Super Bowl starts in the summer. The path to a dynasty starts by nailing the NFL Draft. And this night, this weekend, is where every single fan base will believe that their team is starting that path to a dynasty. We are going to cover every single pick without a single commercial along the way for total chaos for the NFL draft. Field Gates, Harry Douglas, Spencer Hall, Andrew Hawkins, Harry Lyles. There will not be a pop quiz at the end, I promise. I'm Jason (laughs) Fitz, and we are going to get you covered for everything. Before we start on the draft, we need to quickly update you on the big news in the NFL. Happened just a couple of hours ago, Lamar Jackson and the Baltimore Ravens. We wondered, would Lamar possibly be on the trade block tonight? No. Lamar has signed a new deal with the Baltimore Ravens, ending any speculation that he's going somewhere else, but also raising an interesting point. As Dan Orlovsky pointed out on Twitter, look at the list of quarterbacks in the AFC. It is a gauntlet. And one of these great quarterbacks on this sheet is not going to make the playoffs. It speaks to why quarterback is such an interesting part of this year's draft. But, gentlemen, I think we can all agree this might be the most unpredictable draft we've ever seen. So we'll start with the basic. Spencer, what's the most interesting storyline in this year's draft to you? Oh, who's going to go get Will Levis? Because I don't think there is a more divisive prospect after you start talking about Anthony Richardson. Because I think people talk themselves in Anthony Richardson. He's big. He's shiny. He's huge. He does these, like, amazing superhuman things. And then you come back to Will Levis, and that's the point where I think people are probably most split on what exactly do we see there? So that's what I'm looking at. HD, what are you looking for? The corners. The corners in this draft, you know, from Gonzalez to Witherspoon, from Forbes to Banks, Joey Porter uh, Jr. Where are these guys going to be able to go? But I think you have five solid guys at the top of this draft at the cornerback position that can play at a high level in the National Football League. So looking forward to seeing where those guys go. Field, what do you got? The draft, believe it or not, this year has a twist. It starts at number two, not at number one, because we know it's going to be Bryce Young going to the Carolina Panthers. But what are the Houston Texans going to do? They've got two picks in the top 12, and it's, what, 8.02 p.m. on the East Coast? And we have no idea what the, what the Texans are going to do with either of those selections, number two being the one that's much more pertinent, because typically by now we at least have some semblance of it in a draft in which we believe there are at least four first-round quarterbacks. It would stand to reason that you must take a quarterback number two overall when your current depth chart is led by Case Keenum and also Davis Mills, who led the NFL interceptions last season. Will that happen with Houston? And if not, can you really justify taking a defensive player when there are so many teams that still need a quarterback number two overall in the draft? I'd argue no. I think it's quarterback or trade down or no matter who it is, I'm going to have a problem with the pick. All right, Hawk, what are you most interested in? I'm looking at the wideouts. I'm a wide receiver, man. That's what I care about. The thing about this, you talked about this draft being so unpredictable. When you look at the wideouts that are available in the first round, you can make a case for any one of them to be the first one off the board. It really comes down to fit from uh, Jackson Smith and the Jigba to Zay Flowers to Quentin Johnson. I mean, you name it, they offer something different, and I'm, I'm curious to see who comes off first. Well, that was what you're thinking. I feel like because of all the uncertainty that we have, whether it's because of the quarterbacks or anything else, I feel like we're going to see a trade. Maybe this is wishful thinking on my part, but because of this uncertainty, I want for somebody to reach. I want for somebody to panic. I want somebody to make a trade that we're all going to joke about on Twitter and have fun with. What's it chaos? Feels like, it, it feels like this is the night. You son of a biscuit. If that's the Raiders, I'm losing my <laughs> Jobs are on the line. line. Jobs you, are on the line. I'll give you a very quick thought. It's not from my standpoint, it's not smart to disagree with field. The only thing I would say, mm. though, <laughs> is that just because you need a quarterback doesn't mean you take a quarterback that's not the right guy. There's so much conversation about the top four and five quarterbacks in this year's draft. And I understand that we want one. And everybody, every fan base says, I need the next Mahomes. Just because you need the next Mahomes doesn't mean you reach at the positions. I just want teams 
to trust their board. All right, speaking of trust their board, there's a lot of talent in this year's draft. Take a look at the most recent top ten. And I'm pointing this out because there are a lot of names out here, not quarterbacks. This is from Mel and Todd's final mock draft. You see right. Bryce Young, quarterback, C.J. Stroud, quarterback, Will Levis. We've heard these names. You also see Will Anderson, Jalen Carter, two great defensive players. That's just in the top five. Take a look at six through ten. You'll see, again, even more players that are from outside the quarterback landscape. Uh, when you've got Devin Witherspoon, Christian Gonzalez, Tyree Wilson, Paris Johnson, Bijan Robinson, there are a lot of talented players. So let's just take the obvious here for a second field. Who's the best player in this year's draft? All right, so the best player, you have to decide whether you're talking about, like, who has the chance to make the most money over the course of their career, and then it will be the best quarterback in your eyes. But the best player, I think, and it's almost indisputable in my estimation, is Jalen Carter from Georgia, the defensive tackle. He won't go number one overall. He might not go number two overall, but he's the best player in this draft. Georgia, as everybody on this set knows, has been the most dominant force in college football over the past two years. And while they've had some incredible offensive players, guys who will go in the first round, like Broderick Jones tonight, the reason why they've won big is because they've been the best defense by far over the past two seasons. Last year, they had like nine guys get drafted in the first round. I think it was actually five from their defense. But basically, every year, the entire defense is draft eligible, will get drafted. Jalen Carter's been the best player of the defense over the past two years. What he can do, not just as a run defender, but as you see here, just wrecking shop against opposing quarterbacks, <laughs> has the chance to shape your defense for the next 10 years if he can stay on the straight and narrow. Hawk, I know you agree with him. What do you see there? Yeah, I mean, the same thing. I mean, the question becomes, can he stay on the straight and narrow? You talk about a bad sequence of events off the field, and that's where the questions become because we've all seen this plenty of times. There's super uber-talented players who's off the field – situations prevent them from reaching that ceiling. Now, you look at a person like Jalen Carter. Why is he great? Because there's literally not a scheme he doesn't – he's not incredible in. Like, literally, every scheme, every coach, every team gets significantly better with him on the D-line. He's young. He still has a lot to grow with just because he's only been a one-year starter. But, I mean, it's it's far and away he's the most talented. Uh, H.C., you on this uh, Jalen Carter trip too? Yeah, I am. When you look at Jalen Carter last year, Trayvon Walker was the number one overall pick. If he was eligible to come out, Jalen Carter probably would have been the number one overall pick. But you talk about a guy that's strong, can beat double teams. That game against Ohio State, right, he didn't, he didn't wreak havoc. It's because they were focusing on him. And then the absence of Nolan Smith – you know, not being there to add to that pass rush really hurt Georgia, but they're going to always figure out a way. But I love Jalen Carter and what he presents. I think at this level, it's imperative that he goes somewhere where you have those solid veterans that can lead and help guide him. And, Hulk, listen, you, you know how important that is to have in the locker room an older guy showing you the tricks of the trade, yeah. showing you how to be a pro, yep. guiding you along the way in your young career. Yeah, you're saying I don't know about that? What are you saying? Like, uh, okay. You're right. <laughs> no, right. no, no, no. Uh, from, we're going to just to clarify, HD because Harry and Harry. I got too many Harrys going on. So, Lyles, can you, like, create an argument here? Maybe, like, an old school wrestling match, a death match, something? Give me something. I else. mean, look, I don't have a great argument for Jalen Carter not being the best player, which I think, again, is a testament to his game, especially. And people forget last year, he had hurt his knee and came back in October and didn't look like he had any issues, right? Like, he's that good of a player. And to your point, HD, if he would have come out last year, he would have been the guy, right? Well, one player I will bring up that has sort of kind of gotten lost in the fold between the quarterbacks and Jalen Carter is Will Anderson. Mm. Will Anderson, is. there's a reason we talked about this man possibly being a Heisman Trophy contender this past season because of what we saw from him in 2021 with 17 and a half sacks and I think something like 31 tackles for loss. Now, that production was not the same this year because that spotlight was on him. You knew to prepare for him. Obviously, he didn't really have a standout game against Tennessee, but he is still a player that you are absolutely going to have to deal with. And between what he's able to do and what you saw him do in the SEC, I just can't ignore the fact that this guy, and, and I know, again, I am a college football guy. That is why I'm here. That is, at worst, the third best player, one of the three best players that I've watched the last two years. Mm. I, take a, I take a risk on a guy like that. And right. it's not a risk. I was well, going to say, he's like the anti-risk, too, right? Yeah, because, yeah, like, yeah. the floor for Will Anderson's the highest in the draft. Like, he is built in a Nick Saban lab, yep. and I say that in the most affectionate way possible. The guy is, like – squeaky clean like I'd like to find the one bad thing with him because if anybody can dig it up before he gets actually drafted it'd be the first bad thing that we've heard about Will yep. Anderson can't beat a triple team that's the only yeah who's he playing against is the question yeah <laughs> so give me who you got like just throw some flame on the fire 
Yeah, it was real cool that y'all picked the mutant who can lift a quarterback like a baby, right. which he actually did <laughs> on the field. That was a great job, y'all. Um, I wanted to pick somebody who was maybe a different choice other than that mutant, and it was a different kind of mutant. Why don't you get somebody who makes everything better instantly on the offensive side of the ball in B. John Robinson, okay? Because you got a 1,500-yard rusher who does everything, catches the ball well, is smart, is composed, is the kind of guy who gets better as the game goes on, and who, frankly, did all of that production. We say, well, he was a Texas. He's probably got a bunch of hosses blocking for him. Ah, it's not this Texas team, okay? They're not quite back. So, astonishing production makes everything on your offense better instantly the minute he takes the field, all right? From pass blocking to giving a legitimate play-action threat for your quarterback, it's somebody that you can just put right in. I'm all about short attention span gains, okay? I don't have to wait for him to be good. I know we have this bias against running backs in the draft. We do, okay? And I'm not saying it's not entirely without merit when you go value over time. But if you want to get better right now on the offensive side of the ball, Bijan Robinson is an outstanding pick. I don't care where he goes. He's the front runner for offensive rookie of the year. He is the player yeah. that has by far the best chance of being an all-pro as a rookie, which we can debate the merits of being a first-team all-pro running back for one season as opposed to potentially you know, five seasons like Jalen Carter down the line. But there's no two ways about it. Like I'm going to be conflicted on where Bijan Robinson – on when, when Bijan Robinson gets taken only because like – if he goes in the first seven or eight picks, I will have flashbacks to Isaiah Pacheco being the starting running back for the Chiefs last year out of the seventh round, mm -hmm. while also understanding that, like, if it's Atlanta as an example, like, all of a sudden Atlanta's offense, sorry, HD, just yeah. got a lot <laughs> scarier. <laughs> yeah. Excited. Hey, well, well, just one player. Yeah, hold up. Oh, <laughs> all right, I got excited. So, uh, uh, a couple of things to keep you guys updated on. Number one, and we got polls going on on YouTube. So if you're watching us, hanging out in the YouTube uh, chat, uh, we've got all sorts of chat out here. Right now, we put up a poll. Who should the Panthers select with the first overall uh, pick? I'm telling you that because the Panthers are now officially on the clock. Also, next to me, I have this gong. You might wonder why I have this gong. Gentlemen, just get ready for it. You ready for this? You ready for this? What is that? Other than obnoxious, it's the trade gong. <laughs> and I decided I would just go ahead and ring it because we need to remember that Carolina is on the clock by way of a trade with the Chicago Bears. Really, I just wanted to hit the gong. He right really wanted that, that gong. It's because yeah. we have not seen a bunch of top ten picks get traded in recent years. So you got to make sure that you use that now. We don't know when you'll be able to use it again. See, and, and you never know where this is going to go. But we do know, uh, by the way, at this point, everybody agrees with this. Jalen Carter, the most talented player in this year's draft, 52% to 48. It's actually very close. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, keep voting in the poll. Keep hanging out with us. The question is, your Carolina, you moved up. Everybody expects it's going to be Bryce Young. Real easy question. Hawks, should it be? I think it should be. I mean, when you look at the quarterbacks in this class, Bryce Young is clearly far in ahead in the way he makes his decisions, the way he places the ball in there. It's almost like he's handing the ball off to the receivers down the field. Now, the question's become size. Obviously, that's a sore spot for your boy, Vince. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't like these people discriminating on my guy because of his size, but the thing I love about him is that he has been the man from day one. He has been the guy everywhere he's gone. He has been the top ranked. You know how hard it is for a guy who is 5'9 on a good day to be the top quarterback? Like, that means something. And he just has the perfect makeup. And at the, at the Panthers, I think they've gone up to that spot for a reason. I think it's for Bryce Young. By the way, the number of times HD every – there'll be 400 of these plugs. Fitz and Harry on ESPN Radio from noon to 3 p.m. <laughs> Eastern. Every time somebody says a receiver is undersized – Harry immediately is like, no, 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 I, I, I cringe. It upsets me because uh, there's some things you just can't measure. And heart is one of those things, yeah. the instincts of the game. And when you're a playmaker and you do it dynamically your entire life, mm -hmm. don't talk to me about size. He's a gamer. The, the film doesn't lie. The eye in the sky never lies. And that's what you have when you have Bryce Young. Yeah, you say some things you can't measure. That's because you're still trying to tell me you're 6'1". Uh, let, <laughs> let me be a little contrarian to the size argument for man. a second. I know, mm -hmm. that's fair. Uh, Field, all I keep thinking about is, let's, let's be real. When he's playing quarterback at Alabama, he's getting hit by the very Georgia defenders that you were talking about that are all in the NFL. And he lived to tell the tale. Like, it's not like he broke in half when sure. future NFL players were hitting him. So, it should size be that big a concern? So, first of all, I'm going to correct one thing. We talked about this actually before the show. It's like there's a difference between being contrarian and being nuanced, right? Like two things can simultaneously have value in the course of a conversation. Bryce Young, we all think, is the best quarterback in this year's draft class. But if you just stacked Bryce Young in a line next to Will Levis and Anthony Richardson in particular, you would be like, that is, that is stark. That is quite mm -hmm, a contrast. Mm -hmm. And if you're imagining – which of those three quarterbacks is going to have the hardest time absorbing hits from Aaron Donald and one of the Bosa brothers? The answer is clearly Bryce Young. So while I would, if I were Scott Fitter or the Panthers GM, unquestionably take Bryce Young number one overall, 
I also do think it's fair to note that like his body armor is more of a risk than Anthony Richardson, who if you told me if you had never if I'd never seen Anthony Richardson before and he told me he was a defensive end, I'd be like, I buy it because he's that freaky of a human. So it's a part of the evaluation. If it wasn't, then this pick would have been made two months ago by the Carolina Panthers, and we'd already have the Texans on the clock. I, I will admit, too, because we're friends, Field, like I kind of owe you an apology. The number of phone interviews I've done with radio stations this like last month, and I've been like, I don't want my quarterback to be Field Yates size. I, like, no, it's not. Oh, no, well, I mean, he's, he's, he's done uh, it a lot, Field. On, trust I, me. I have said wow. that. <laughs> when, I mean, when I, when I, I mean, when I met Bryce Young at the, at the Super Bowl this year, I, my, I'm like, I mean, we have absolutely nothing in common, obviously, uh, other than the fact that, like, we both probably, like, soaking wet weigh, like, 180 pounds. Now, he ended up at 204 somehow at the combine, and he certainly bulked up. And it's you, you can do that, by the way. You can change your body composition a little bit. But um, it was him and Will Levis were at the same event that I was at. And I felt like, I mean, it was it was striking to see two different quarterbacks in two very different statues. Speaking of striking, mm -hmm. uh, it has come to my attention that you have built for us the perfect quarterback. Uh, I have. I, I, I have. In, in honor of Bryce Young's size, please, sir, would you like to elaborate? Here is what. I hope he's 5'10". Yeah, well, he is not 5'10", <laughs> okay. okay? He is he is towering. I want my quarterback to be like 6'3", 6'4". I want Dan Marino's mind because on the field, perfectly empty. Makes a bad throw, forgets it. I want the arm of Josh Allen. I want the legs of Mike Vick. I want the style <laughs> of Joe Namath. you got to have a fur. Aaron Rodgers, a lot of things you can say about Aaron Rodgers. Beaming smile. You want that positivity coming out of the huddle. And forget everything he said when he wasn't in the huddle. And lastly, I need you to be real twitchy like Peyton Manning. I need you to be annoying to the defense, right? Point at stuff. Fake, right? Yell at your guys, right? If you if your running back misses a block, chew him out. Don't, who cares if you're mic'd up? Get into a fight on the sideline with your best friend and offensive lineman. I, I love that. Okay, that to me, that's, that's the perfect quarterback. It's basically Mahomes. Yeah. You just built yeah. Mahomes now, with a bunch of different people. That yeah. would have been quite funny if you would have just put up Patrick Mahomes. I could, <laughs> that's all you I had could to have, do. but yeah. then we wouldn't <laughs> have had it. That's all you had to do. all this work. <laughs> right. Yeah. They worked really hard to build that. Uh, Lyle's, what, what's creepier, the thought of having a tiny quarterback or that uh, smile that was just put on? The, the smile, <laughs> honestly, that was, that was a little <laughs> chilling. I think, I think it's the smile for yeah. sure. Uh, so where are you on the number one pick overall? I don't know. Honestly, like, to me, there's reasons to like each one of these quarterbacks. I love Bryce Young because he's got the most pro-ready tape. He's got the biggest bag. He's got the most skills ready to go. I'm sorry, Hawk. I, it's the, the size. Again, it, it is a concern. Now, you can help a lot of that with guys around him, obviously. The line. Protect this guy. I can't help in HD. I will never forget this call, man, because we watched C.J. Stroud get tore up against Michigan, right? And I, we had that call. It's like, dude, if he just let loose, if he just let loose, play the game, play with instincts, he's the best quarterback. And he showed that against Georgia. Mm. And there's no other team that you, if you're trying to put something on tape, right, and be like, I can play NFL football, he did it right there. And so I can't help but have that game in the back of my mind. So C.J. Stroud from Georgia, that game, I like that. I also like everything that Anthony Richardson is. Uh, so that's tough. Will Levis, 2021 Will Levis, great. This past season, tough. Not a lot of help around him. They had a coordinator change. That matters. A lot of people don't talk about that. But with the number one pick, if I was Carolina, I think I would probably go C.J. Stroud. By the way, in the YouTube chat, Bryce Young got 66% of the vote for the who they should select. Uh, C.J. Stroud second with 20% of the vote. The pick is in. Thank God. Uh, yeah. A little TV dramatics here, Field, right? Of course, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, we can all joke about it every year, but it's kind of gotten old. Yes, of course, the team who has the first <laughs> pick is told, let's make sure we take at least nine minutes of those first ten. <laughs> we have an event that is going to draw hundreds of millions of viewers across the globe, so it is worth building up a bit more suspense. Uh, by the way, is someone in the chat, Champ Star 9669 sent, Said they want Mina Kimes or they riot. Uh, we don't want anybody to riot. Uh, no, we, no. We, right. we would yeah, appreciate no. it if you didn't riot. Uh, but We're actually <laughs> saving Mina for the sixth and seventh round. She right. feels like she can yeah. provide the most value on those picks, so she doesn't want to actually talk about the players that most people actually know. I, I thought she was just waiting to be the seventh overall pick directly to the Raiders. Well, you never know where the surprise <laughs> is going to come. Mina's going to be the starting quarterback for the Raiders. 45 minutes, we'll know. Maybe an hour. Okay. Uh, oh. Roger Goodell is going to the podium now. The pick is in for the first <coughs> selection of the 2023 NFL draft. You heard the chimes. You will hear every single pick. We will get you every single pick throughout the course, not just today, but of the next couple of days as well. The pick is in, and it is there we go. Bryce Young. Hey. There we go. Congratulations to Bryce Young, and congratulations. You know, it's funny. This has been a debate over the course of the last several months because it takes several months leading up. But 
Other than the size, does anyone have a single concern about Bryce Young being elite? Let me use that. I'm going to use the word elite. No. No. Uh, no talk no. about <laughs> the intangibles that he brings to the game. He's able to operate from the pocket. He can get out on the edge. I love the fact that when he improvises, right, he's improvising to still look and keep his eyes downfield to throw the football, not to run. That's his last resort. Mm -hmm. But you look at, you know, understanding what coverages are coming. I see the game against Texas when they brought that corner cat blitz. The, the corner came on a blitz. And the instincts to get out of it and make a play. Also, if you need a touchdown and you're down six points out of all these quarterbacks in the draft, I want Bryce Young. What I seen him do against the Auburn Tigers two years ago, what I see him do against Georgia's number one defense in the SEC championship game two years ago, what I seen him do this season without the high-class wide receivers of the tight ends was phenomenal in my eyes. He showed me that he's a guy that's ready for this number one overall draft pick, but also he's going to a place in Carolina where the infrastructure mm. is on point. From the head coach to the quarterback coach, to the assistant head coach, to the offensive coordinator. That matters. And I think of all the quarterbacks who least needed that, mm -hmm. Bryce Young actually does have that. So I think he's going to be that much better in this rookie season. I mean, you talk about Bryce Young, everything he brings. And I understand he is undersized for a quarterback. He's undersized, honestly, for most positions on an NFL field. But, like, when I was coming out, and I understand that I'm a 5'7 wide receiver, I needed to make sure all of my strengths – where the long part of my weakness just said size, right? That is what Bryce Young is, right? Like, what is the point of him going to Alabama, playing against the top competition, doing everything right like you talked about when he scrambles, two hands on the ball, eyes down the field when he has pressure, the dude doesn't blink, delivers ball placement better than we've seen in a very long time if we're still going to psych ourselves out and say, oh, but what about this? Is, but is there any thought to the fact that, you know, we, we think about Frank Reich and the types of quarterbacks that he's worked with in the past. Like, this is not the type of quarterback, like, that's part of why some of the mocks when they first came out didn't seem to have Bryce Young, right? Like, it feels like this is a little different for for him, isn't it? Well, the one thing that I keep coming back to when people say, isn't this unlike most quarterbacks that, that Frank Reich has worked with in the past, is like the overwhelming majority of quarterbacks in the NFL, like 90% of them are probably like 6'2 or 6'3 and 220 pounds and above, yeah. right? Like prototypical mm -hmm. quarterbacks are probably closer to that range. How many quarterbacks are under six feet in the NFL? You've got, the, you know, maybe Russell Wilson is a shade under six feet, but like mm -hmm. If you saw Russ, I mean, the guy's like a fire hydrant, right? He's thick. He's well-built. He's same thing, same thing with Kyler, two guys who had that yep. baseball background. Like, if you saw them compared to Bryce, it's a different body structure for sure. All right. The pick number two is already in. Oh, Five minutes oh. left on the clock. Mm. The most controversial pick of this entire draft so far. Okay. Only two picks in. But we've spent where it weeks <laughs> speculating about what the Texans right are going to do. The pick is in. Lyles, any thought? I mean, it's got to be quarterback, right? Has to be. I, I don't know, y'all. Um, like, well, have they been able to keep that secret? You know, I would go Will Anderson here. D'Amico Ryan's defensive coach. Alabama connection. Dial it up. Spencer, you've got a, you've got a grin on your face. Uh-huh, because, uh, you know, <laughs> Harry Lyles likes mess, but he's not alone in that. I like mess, too. And I kind of think this pick's going to be a mess. Uh, the one That's thing I would guess. say, though, like, if you think about defense – and you think about where uh, D'Amico came from. He came from San Francisco. San Francisco resisted the temptation to draft a quarterback for several years mm -hmm. to the point that when they finally did, they traded up, they moved up, they got somebody. The rest of their roster was so solid, they were able to have a bust, at least for now, in the first round wow. of the draft. Yeah. And oh, they're, they're fine, right? Like, yeah. so if D'Amico comes from that school, like, maybe there's some logic that best player on the board? Like, you're sitting at number two. Best <sighs> so let, let's just take a big step back okay. and – <laughs> Divorce ourselves from the idea that it's the Houston Texans and just acknowledge all right, it's a roster without a long-term answer at quarterback. And this goes mm -hmm. back to what I was talking about at the open of the show, right? So you've got a quarterback needy team and a quarterback strong draft with defensive players that are good, but we're not talking about a guarantee that you have a Vaughn Miller. Like just from an asset management play, doesn't it make the most sense to take a quarterback? Like you just almost have to. Like you're almost bound to take a quarterback with that pick because of the potential value of a quarterback vis-a-vis -vis an edge rusher or even a defensive tackle. So we'll see. Um, I think, though, that, like, if it's not a quarterback, I think it's an asset misplay by the See, I, the only reason why I will push back is that at number two, you can take a defensive player that you want, and at number 12, Hendon Hooker's probably still going to be on that board. 
you can take a quarterback there. But, and also, like, you could take the number two pick with Zach Wilson. Like, and we all saw how that worked. Like, this comes back to my opening thesis, if you will. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know, Hawk. Like, I, I kind of look at this quarterback thing and say, if you're not in love with one, you need to get a high-level, you know, constant in, in year in, year out, all pro out but, of this number two pick. But the Texans have played that game before. They played that game with Mario Williams. They played that game with Jadavian Clowney, right. right? Like, these are the no. best you go get. You need a quarterback. You're starting your third season in a row with a new head coach. How you stop that trend is go get a quarterback that plays well. That's what you are missing. So I'm all for going to get a quarterback at number two, C.J. Stroud specifically. Uh, Spencer, any thoughts on the uh, – I know chaos is what you want. Mm-hmm. But, okay. That's all. <laughs> yeah. No, but, but, but I will say this. The antithesis to chaos to me is picking someone steady like C.J. Stroud because Stroud to me, great processor, probably not going to embarrass you, right? He's yep. going to learn. I, to me, played in a system where he's asked to do a lot of these like yep, sort of yep. pro-level things. And when pressured, got better. How many quarterbacks in this draft can you say that when they got pressured, they got better? Yeah. The yeah. pick is in. By the way, 72% of the people polled so far thought the Panthers made the right pick at number one in the YouTube chat. Keep voting in there. We'll keep uh, updating on the polls. The pick is in with the second overall pick in the mm. NFL draft. The Houston Texans have selected C.J. Stroud. Yes. There you go. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, there that's you a good go. pick. C.J. Stroud goes, and, and look, we were standing there. We were on the sidelines of that Georgia-Ohio State game, and you said it as we were getting ready to do radio after the game. You said, man, this kid just made himself a lot of money yeah. because that what everybody questioned was, would he use his athleticism? I thought he addressed it at the Combine too, Harry, but in that game, he addressed the hell out of it. Well, I think when you look at a guy like C.J. Stroud, and we was at the first game of the year, me and Harry Lyles against Notre Dame. You talk about processing information, understanding when they needed a touchdown versus cover zero. Yep. When you didn't have safety help defensive-wise mm-hmm. through a touchdown pass, the ball placement to wide receivers. When you have a cornerback on the outside who's cheating and jumping routes, you place that ball on the outside, show it to the wide receiver, now he can just catch that ball, go upfield, and potentially score. The ball placement of C.J. Stroud, but also the arm strength and the way he operates from the pocket is phenomenal in my eyes. So they're telling me we've got a, a site here at C.J. Stroud's watch party. This is how it went down when he was selected. We want you to see it. Oh, I, I didn't know if there was more to it. They said, keep going. I don't know. It's just a bunch of people cheering there, Cologne. <laughs> All right, everybody's happy. For Never seen that no. I'm going to ask a uh, I'm gonna ask a question because it's already come up in the chat about Alabama, number one, and now about Ohio State, number two. We've already seen this in the YouTube chat several times. The answer is, well, nobody from Ohio State that plays quarterback ever comes in and is successful, right? Like, we hear that all the time. No Alabama quarterback's ever been successful. They always talk about that. How much should we care about what former players have done in the same Or just system? tell them to shut up. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm a voice of the shut people. Up. I'm a voice of the people here. I'm not him. That's okay. what you need to say. I'm right. not them. Also, I want you to go and look at the total crapshoot of schools, the random assortment of yeah. universities and programs that generate top-level QB talent. Texas Tech, the greatest quarterback alive, went to Texas Tech on a team that couldn't defend a stiff breeze. And he's the best alive. Don't tell me that pedigree matters here. Just evaluate the talent. Lyles is just looking at me like I'm an but, absolute I mean, idiot. No, I mean, I'm going to the people. But, I, but I, if I was sitting there and I hear that, I'd just be like, bro, what that got to do with me? Yeah, no. What's up? You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's almost even like when we're just talking about games, period, right? And it's like, oh, historically, like, they haven't done this. And it's like, bro, we're taking data back to, like, 1960. What's up? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that just does not matter. C.J. Stroud is the first C.J. Stroud, and that's all that matters. The only thing he's got in common with anybody else that's ever played quarterback at Ohio State is the fact that they played quarterback at Ohio State. He could become Kirk Herbstreit if he wants to. Right, but it's probably not likely he's going to be C.J. Stroud. You know, so I just I don't buy that. You know, who we would have said this about a couple of years ago. Alabama, mm. right? Yes. The program that has now delivered multiple first-round picks, yes. first-round draft picks at quarterback. Uh, by the way, it's chronic. I love your YouTube name. Came in and said, "I love Stroud, though. Thank God, no more Davis Mills." I don't want to meh on Davis Mills, but Field, you mentioned it well, earlier. He has a problem with low necks. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with that man? I just that is, appreciated that is. his username. Uh, Field, what do you think of the fit here? Like, you're doing a full organizational rebuild. So, what, what's all that mean for a quarterback coming into it? Thank God. Thank God. Seriously, like, again, I, I don't want to over like, – I really like Will Anderson and, and, and Jalen Carter, as we discussed at the beginning of the show. But, again, again, you have the opportunity to draft a quarterback. I'm not saying I'm banking on the Texans making a dramatic leap next year. But if they're picking ninth next year – in a quarterback draft class that is not currently viewed as as deep as this one is, 
you may have like you're going to be stuck with like Case Keenum purgatory for the next X number of years. So yeah. my big feeling is that you find you did the right thing from an asset management standpoint. And as far as like what it looks like, it's a first time offensive coordinator, Bobby Slowick, who comes from the Kyle Shanahan uh, coaching staff in, in San Francisco. So you figure there'll be a lot of elements that will look like what the 49ers have done and what a lot of teams are doing right now. Hawk and Harry have played in this offense before. But C.J. Stroud, I know we've talked about a lot of the traits during the pre-draft process, but his throwing workout at the Combine sort of rubber stamp what we believed about him for a long time. Well, which here's is the that thing, he's the most pure passer in this class. Yep. Here's the thing about the Houston Texans that I do love. Within this draft, the first 73 picks, they have five, right? So they really have an opportunity within this draft to really get some meaningful players within those top five picks uh, within the first 73. So that's what I do love about this situation. When it comes to the Houston Texans, they have been the laughing stock the last few years of the National Football League. They have an opportunity right now with a new head coach in D'Amico Ryans to try to right those wrongs that they have done. And a lot of people question a lot of things that they do as an organization. But right now, when you have those picks, you're, you're looking to get guys that can contribute right now within those top five. And this is the quarterback where if he's comfortable and you allow him to play with instinct, that's you don't do better than that. Like, truly, especially given his size and everything else like that. But he throws the best ball. If he's playing with instinct and you surround him with those other players, then you're in business. He's the best probably or he's a very good runner as well. Can be. We didn't see a ton of it during his college career. And. Mm -hmm. Who knows what the Texans will do with them as far as that utilization is concerned. But you have to keep in mind, in college, so many of these guys, and I understand this, by the way, are protecting themselves for the pros. Yep. Right? So if you're C.J. Stroud, you wouldn't be running the ball 125 times a season at Ohio State when you can win and win big. They almost beat the national champ yep. by just putting it on a dime to Marvin Harrison Jr. every other play. All right. Wait. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Oh! After weeks of speculation, we know we have a trade. We will get to the details Houston is on the clock. Look Houston is on the clock. The Arizona Cardinals have traded the third overall pick to Houston. I will say, by the way, one thing I love about Houston in what? this situation, six-year deal for D'Amico Ryans. I know the Texans have their history of getting uh -uh. rid of coaches quickly, mm -hmm. but if you want stability, at least having some of that contract there uh, could hopefully create that. The Cardinals and Texans. Now, Field's going to be our, our trade uh, general, so when we get the details on the trade field, Chime in, but in the meantime, just because I want to do it one more time. Whoa, 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 whoa. Give me a little bit right more spot, base. Too. Well, we got to figure out. More yeah, I thought you've been working out an orange theory. you got to hit that thing with some power. There we go. Thank you. There we go. Out. Uh, so you just mentioned they had the 12th pick. They now have back-to-back -back picks, which is interesting because why? if they're picking at three, well, they're yeah, just trying to get ahead of four, yeah. yep. which means they're trying to get ahead of the Colts. But why? Because we all thought, thought the Colts were going to take a quarterback, and you just took one. Good smokescreen, huh? <sighs> Willie Anderson, I would imagine, yeah. right? Yeah. You talked mm -hmm. about the Alabama connection. You talked about D'Amico Ryans. Now he can go get his Bosa-like player on the defense, mm -hmm. right? They felt like, hey, we need a quarterback because C.J. Stroud is there. He's the best pure thrower we've talked about. And also, there's a really solid, obviously safe defensive player that comes from Alabama that yep. everyone is clamoring over. Mm -hmm. We have the capital. Let's go get both of them. Uh, we have a really important uh, post here, by the way, uh, in YouTube. 50% uh, of the desk has the same barber looking good. I don't know which 50% it is, but thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate it. <laughs> it's, it's right here. Uh, Fade I mean, University, just, baby. Yeah, yeah. What, I, what, am I in? I, I don't know. We all got, like, so, no? Taper squad? No. Okay, that's fine. I love it. The trade, that's by fine. the way, you love it. Like, some audacity by the Texans. Go back for to it. Back picks mm -hmm. in Go the for top it. three. But having it's that amazing. draft capital that's allows you to do things like this. And the pick is in, obviously, the details on the pick. Arizona, third and fourth round pick, number 105. They get Houston 12, 33, the, and then they get the 2024 number one and a 2024 third round pick. That's so, awesome. paid a ton to move back up. But yeah, again. Well, something Arizona actually needs, too. So, Arizona yeah. gets, yeah. yeah. Yep. Go ahead, Field. If you've got, they're, they're bringing the pick in. If you've got a, a more concise way to explain that, we're just sort of piecing it out here. Uh, so the, the Texans are on the clock. Back-to-back -back picks, if you just tuned in, the Texans have traded with the Cardinals who've been trying to trade this pick for quite a while, and they are now on the clock with back-to-back -back picks. They made the second overall pick, C.J. Stroud. Now they are taking the third okay, overall pick, a chance for them to truly rebuild, Anderson. and they have taken Will Layout. Anderson, Jr., linebacker out of Alabama, in the eyes of many, the best player in this draft, in the eyes of many, the best defensive player in this draft, and somebody that absolutely put on tape how dominating he can be. Spencer, what do you think? 
Oh, this is superb. I can't believe I'm saying this. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this about two franchises. One, respect to the Cardinals for being like, no, we need to go get some groceries. We're in rehab. We need to rebuild. Mm. Second of all, this is an amazing pick because you went and you got the best prospect on the other side, arguably. We've talked about Jalen Carter, but I think there's the case to be made for Will Anderson as well to be the most disruptive presence at the most disruptive position on the defense. This is 1A, 1B. It's superb. Yep. I mean, like, with the Texans just did two cool things in a row. Pop the champagne. Man, yeah, that's, that's, that's tough for them to do, too, because they don't do a whole lot right. And, yeah. And you just got the quarterback that you need. There's two things right that you need in the NFL yeah. in today's game. You need a quarterback, and you need somebody that can go get the quarterback. That guy is going to go get the quarterback. I'm going to tell you what else I love about it. You look at this team's secondary and what they did last year in the draft, getting Derek Stingley Jr., also Jalen Petrie. You bring over Jimmy Ward, who was with D'Amico Ryans from San Francisco. Now you try to share up that front line. Mm -hmm. So now those guys, we know, go hand-to-hand. -hand. The pass rush goes with the, with the guys that defend the, the pass catchers. Yep. Right? So now you can, you know, get that defensive line better. Phil, what do you got for us on the trade? You had it already. Uh, so the Texans have traded pick 12, pick 33. So the second pick of the second round. A 2024 first-round pick and a 2024 third-round pick. Talk about a massive freight. I mean, that is a ton of draft capital. Haven't figured out yet whether that's Cleveland's 2024 first-round pick or Houston's 2024 first-round pick. If it's Cleveland, you would project it to be a little bit weaker, as in, like, more give up a bull, if that is a term. Uh, mm -hmm. But this is a massive price for Houston to pay. But it suggests that this is an organization that has not only been in the bottom for the past few seasons, but gonna... become, they've become the most irrelevant franchise in the NFL, maybe alongside the Arizona Cardinals. And all of a sudden, this team has a real identity to it. It's got some cachet all of a sudden. And it's not just the coach. It, you have a quarterback. You have arguably the best defensive player in the draft. This right here is what it's all about. We have a graphic up here for you. Traded up for a top four pick. Mitchell Trubisky in 17. Sammy Watkins in 14. Deion Jordan in 13. Top four pick, sorry. And Trent Richardson in 2012. Okay. So none is, of that is good. So this is a disaster. Like, none <laughs> okay. of that is good. So, right. But, again, yeah. to the point that you guys made earlier, that has nothing to do with Will Anderson. Nope. Like, my only question is if we all believe, as everybody seemed to, that the Colts were going to be taking a quarterback – did you need to pay that much? And we don't know. We're not in the room, right? Mm -hmm. But did you need to pay that much to move ahead of the Colts? Like, was there a real presumption? I mean, it's just, Hawk, that's what, what it's, yeah. it's just interesting. Yeah, I mean, you just wanted to be sure, right? Because we all know that there is questions around C.J. Stroud, right? And we understand where those come from. So you go get him, but what you get in Willie Anderson is you really raise your chances of having a good draft. Because like Phil talked about, there aren't many negatives, if any, yep. around Will Anderson. Even when you talk about him versus Tyree Wilson, it's kind of like the Trevon Walker versus Aiden Hutchinson conversation from a year ago. Like one is mm -hmm. like a specimen. The other one we know is a bona fide star. Yep. And you see the Detroit Lions won last year because they ended up getting Hutchinson. They're the early winners of that scenario. Well, I think it's also a crime that in 2021 that he wasn't invited to the Heisman Trophy ceremony mm -hmm. when you lead the country in sacks and yeah. tackles for loss mm -hmm. and you was on a bona fide football team. So I just w had to throw that one out there. I agree. Well, the, Col the Colts are now on the clock, and the pick is already in. Uh, the Colts wasted no time. You've oh, really? been a big believer, Harry, that Shane Steichen, the new head coach of the Colts, Likes the type of quarterback we've all seen with Jalen Hurts. That means yep. you think this this could be? Well, either only two. Will Levis and Anthony Richardson, a dual-threat mm -hmm. quarterback. Because when you look at what Jalen Hurts was able to do last year within this offensive system, he was able to be comfortable. They got him the weapons. But the QB run game was so valuable. I called the Colts in the Eagles game last year, and the offense stalled. You want to know what Shane Steichen, what he did? He put everything on Jalen Hurts' back, and he led them to a victory in a game in which the offense struggled. Mm. I mean, in today's NFL, that's what you are looking for. Mm. But I will say there's been a lot of talk around Will Levis and him being the Colts, specifically even around the Manning brothers, yeah. yep. saying that they've endorsed him in the, in the Colts organization. Uh, Spencer, Have we ever had a team make two of the first three picks in the NFL draft? I, They've already won the draft, and we're three picks in. Yeah. Right? That's crazy. <laughs> I mean, there may be something non-quantifiable about – wanting to make a statement and taking two players you absolutely want to indicate sure. that you care you're not mm -hmm. phoning it in yep. and that this franchise is here to exist successfully they yeah. are the third team in the common draft era to make two picks in the top three overall thank you the There's 1992 colts and the 2000 washington football team 
So uh, Washington Commanders at this point. So uh, it is a rarity. We will say it is a rarity mm-hmm. to have two picks. Uh, well, that's right. That was LeVar Arrington and Courtney. Was that Courtney, Courtney Brown? Brown. Is that, man, that was a yeah. crazy well, can draft. I, can I say this about the Colts, though? Because when you look at their head coach in Shane Steichen and their offensive coordinator, Jim Bob Cooter, who was with Trevor Favorite Lawrence name. last year. That's amazing. You talk about two guys who work with Justin Herbert, Jalen Hurts, and mm-hmm. Trevor Lawrence. I feel comfortable with any one of these guys, whether it's Anthony Richardson or Will Levis, going into that system with those two guys. And that's big for them because those are two guys that, at least at this point, we feel you are going to have to be able to yep. develop in the right spot. And think about it. All three of those quarterbacks I just men- mentioned, all three of them are different. And, and yeah. part of the reason I think they have to take a quarterback is Jim Irsay, the owner of the team, made it very clear that they would solve is. the quarterback Woo. issue this offseason. Well, so see. Let's see how. this is a way to do it. Roger Goodell walking to the podium right now to give us the pick. Pick is in in Kansas City. Mm. Okay. All right. Anthony Richardson. Okay. In the right. pick. Richard, <laughs> Anthony Richardson. Oh, oh my right. gosh. <laughs> Anthony Richardson. Oh my gosh. Uh-oh. About to get real fun. Oh huh? my goodness. In that system, in that system, I'm telling you, the QB run game is going to be on point. Mm. I think they still need to get another tight end or whatnot. Um, you have a few receivers there, but him in the backfield with Jonathan Taylor. It's going to be dangerous. Mm-hmm. It's going to be dangerous. Oh, this is this is such an adventure. Let's put it that way. This is going to be such an adventure because Anthony Richardson's floor can be very low, Uh-oh. as we saw in this past season. The ceiling does not exist for what he is capable of physically. And, and in terms of, like, is he a quarterback? Like, is he a pro quarterback? His desire to stay in the pocket, he left so much on the table in terms of potential production yeah. by staying in the pocket. He was not a run-first guy. I know that might be a misconception among those who just turned up to scout him for the draft. Not at all. A pass-first dude despite all of the gifts that he has. And HD, you pointed out the staff that is in place there in Indianapolis. When I spoke with Florida's offensive coordinator, Rob Sale, he literally told me, hey, the best spot for AR is going to, a, going to be a place where he could develop in a similar way to a Jalen Hurts. So as long as he gets that, he's going to be in business, and clearly this is the right spot for him. There, there's this portion of, of his body of work that I think we just have to acknowledge, 13 games. That's what we have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah. for everybody that says he needs to, to sit to develop, I understand that logic, but also you need reps when you have 13 games, right? Like he's just going to have to get on the field, and there, there's going to take some patience. We're going to talk about Josh Allen comps a lot, I think, over the course of today, but can we acknowledge that part of the reason Josh Allen was is Josh Allen is because the Bills were patient. They didn't listen to the outside noise. They gave him time to develop. They took the time that he needed. They put the right coaching around him. Like all of those variables, I think, are, are substantial. In that and I mean, yeah. more than anything, they put the talent around him, right? Mm-hmm. It's what, what you need with Anthony Richardson. But on the other side, what he's able to do, just like Harry talked about, was he's going to give you instant offense. You want a player that can put it on his back and say, hey, when things break down, I can go make a play with my feet. And he does that in a very big way. And the fact that he doesn't have a big body of work, I think is actually a good thing because he's, a, he's an ascending player who is obviously, again, he's a specimen, absolutely. And he's just a blank canvas for a lot of these NFL coaches that understand what he brings to the table. So I'd say a couple things is that, like, it's real that he needs to, um, like, he, he, needs to, he needs to take some time to do it. 13 career starts. There are very few quarterbacks that have been drafted in the first round that have 13 career starts to their name. I'm telling you, don't look at the list. It's Mr. Trubisky is the most recent one, right? Like, it is not exactly ideal. I think the Colts are an interesting landing spot for a lot of reasons. I mean, anywhere Anthony Richardson goes is an interesting landing spot. But what I was fearing for Anthony Richardson was the concept of him going to a team that I think felt the pressure to play him immediately and also be successful immediately. I'm not saying Indianapolis wants to roll over and go 3-14 and 14 next year. They don't want that, of course. But I also think this is a team that understands, even if their division stinks, which it does besides the Jaguars right mm-hmm. now, they're not competing for the AFC Championship next year. In that conference, and lead, lead the show, of course, was about how you need to have a mega freak at quarterback to be any good in that conference. And as far as the four quarterbacks in this year's draft class, despite the fact that we all felt really good about Bryce Young being first overall for a reason, Anthony Richardson's ceiling is limitless. The guy has almost unmatched physical skills, and it's going to take some time here. But if you get the very best version of Anthony Richardson, we're talking about a guy that has invoked shades of Cam Newton, which – Cam Newton in his prime was the most unstoppable force in the league. I think it's very imperative that Shane Steichen and Jim Bob Cooter have a kumbaya meeting with that offensive line 
because the run game is going to be Anthony Richardson's best friend right now. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, that was their staple. Last year, I don't know what that offensive line went yep. through, but even mm -hmm. their, their all-pro guard, Quentin Nelson, mm -hmm. wasn't like on point. Nelson. So it's imperative from starting from Jump Street yep. that they understand that this offensive line and this run game is going to have to be very, very – Vital for Anthony Richardson. An interesting twist in the YouTube chat right now, and you guys can all chime in. A lot of comments. AR is a physical freak, run of reach. Richardson's a fourth round talent. Good luck paying millions to someone who throws the ball at the ground. Hooker will make you all regret it. But then the poll results say 73%. Love it. So, and this just shows you fans. Media, uh, analysts, everybody. Uh, Spencer, there's just this confusion around what to make of Anthony Richardson. Yeah, and I, I don't blame anyone for experiencing that when you look at Anthony Richardson because the highs are real high, the lows are real low, the mm -hmm. risks are very real, and the potential is astronomical. But I will say this. If you want to make a choice, go big. That's it. Yep. Go big. Like, And if you have this choice between him and Will Levis, I'd rather miss big. I really would because mm -hmm. the potential yep. is just sky high there. Yep. And, as, and as Hawk pointed out, we can teach him new bad habits. There you go. Okay? <laughs> we don't have to undo bad habits no. because he doesn't have many habits – Period. Uh, let me also put this. We may be in a new kind of paradigm when it comes to evaluating talent, not just because of roster fluctuations in college, where there's just turnover like you've never had before, mm -hmm. people moving, transferring, greater player mobility. Can I just point out, he's got less mileage on the tires. He has fewer yes. hits. Mm -hmm. thing. Okay? Which yep. is a very, very real thing. Yep. So, like, we can cite lack of experience. Let's also say lack of damage, lack of tread mm -hmm. on that tire, okay? It's something where, as Phil pointed out, we don't have to worry about those Bryce Young concerns, okay? Because he ain't 5'9". He's yeah. way bigger. I get a little puckered up every time I see the clock coming down to the end. The Seahawks are on the clock. Yeah, it's up like they're, used, they're taking their sweet time, which suggests a trade is possible, right? right. Anytime that, you go all they need yeah. to think about Jalen Carter. Uh, so oh. there's a, a minute. They pointed out my ears. The TV broadcast is also on commercial. Way to ruin my conspiracy. I was wondering no, why the TV went We don't have those. Uh, <laughs> so there's what about a commercial? minute 15 <laughs> left on the Seahawks clock right now. Uh, obviously, we've seen one huge trade. If you're just tuning in, by the way, Field Yates, Harry Douglas, Spencer Hall, uh, Andrew Hawkins, Harry Lyles, I'm Jason Fitz. There's a ton of us. I almost used a bad word there. Uh, <laughs> getting you every single pick that you need throughout the course of the draft. We're not going anywhere. There will be no commercials here, and we're going to react to everything. And the big news so far is a mega trade where the Texans not only selected C.J. Stroud second overall, but they moved up to make the third overall pick as well. They managed to get their quarterback in C.J. Stroud. They also managed to get Will Anderson. The other big news, obviously, we just had Anthony Richardson selected uh, fourth overall by the Colts. The Seahawks pick is in. So, guys, I, gotta, I mean, the Seahawks have a glaring weakness when it came last year to stopping the run, and we started this show by talking about Jalen Carter's power. Uh, it's just... It feels like there's a very good player on the board that fills a need. Am I underthinking this? No, oh, not, not at all, no, especially when yeah. you look at what they did free agency-wise. Um, they brought back Jaron Reed. They went and got Draymond Jones yep. from the Denver Broncos, who had six and a half sacks, on top of having Daryl Taylor and, and Wusu, who both had nine and a half. Right? You get Jalen Carter and add him to those guys with the back end and Jamal Adams coming back, Tariq Woolen, what he was able to bring in his rookie season on the back end. I think you have a you have a Seattle Seahawks front line that's going to start looking like it did of late. I'm not going to say they are that group, mm. but when they started winning, going yeah. to those Super Bowls, you, you can start talking about them in, the, in, in that case. He matches that same type of energy, that imposing defensive player where it's like, hey, whoever comes in, you're going to feel this player. He is going to be a problem for you. He fits that bill that they haven't had for a while. We will have the pick for you in less than 60 seconds. Field yeah, I think this is the perfect sweet spot, though, for Jalen Carter. Everything you guys have said is worth noting. I also think that uh, in order to take Jalen Carter, uh, given some of the pre-draft concerns surrounding off-the-field issues, you have to have a coach and a GM who have some legit cachet, who have – the rope, so to speak, that if this does not go how you plan it to, it's not going to harm them, right? If you're a first-time GM or if you're a GM on the hot seat, like the best version of Jalen Carter could extend your life as that GM. However, if things go bad in a hurry, you're going to be the one held responsible for it. So a locker room that has been unafraid to take on big personalities in the past could do so again here if Seattle were to go down the Jalen Carter route. And frankly, as we discussed at the beginning, as far as talent is concerned, he would be the best player in this draft if you were just to give them a grade 1 to 100 on some arbitrary scale. Uh, positions in need listed edge inside, uh, edge corner wide receiver uh, linebacker. Uh, so they've got some positions of need. The pick is in. I don't know if they tried to trade it, but we know that Goodell is moving up to the podium as we speak. 
and we'll see how this pick goes. The Seattle Seahawks making their selection right now. Roger Goodell letting the world know it's Ooh. Devin Witherspoon. Oh, oh okay. my goodness. So Seattle goes Excuse with. Excuse me? Oh my goodness. Wow. Awesome. Tell, tell us what you think, Phil. Devin Witherspoon's pound for pound toughest player in the draft, feistiest player in the draft, my favorite player to study during the pre-draft process. You'll see it right here. It's actually the perfect highlight. <laughs> How many cornerbacks on the very first play of the game, this is the first offensive play of the game for Indiana, <laughs> set the tone for the rest of the game? This guy is a heat-seeking missile as a tackler. How many cornerbacks do we describe their tackling as the first trait that comes to mind? Devin Witherspoon is one of the exceptions to the rule. This guy is an absolute stud. He is going to come in and set a tone for this secondary that will bring back. We were just talking about some Legion of Boom memories. This is Legion of Boom type toughness added to that Seattle secondary. I only have one comment, and it's this. The worst thing I've seen in any scouting report about this dude is too aggressive. Oh, <laughs> There's no such thing when it comes to the defensive side of the ball. It's too violent. I mean, you, you look at Seattle and you talk about it, HD, about Pete Carroll wanting to reset what he might have had with defense a while ago. You remember Richard Sherman. You remember the Legion of Boom. Witherspoon has that kind of an mm -hmm. edge. This is a guy who was a no-star prospect coming out of school. He got a scholarship in August after his senior year and went to Illinois. He was the only freshman to start that season. This is the dude who is built for this. He wants it. If there's a bad time to be had, he's coming to the party. And I love that he can play man coverage. He can play zone coverage. He has a high IQ. He tracks the football. But now in that secondary, you have Jamal Adams, Quadre Diggs, mm -hmm. Tariq Woolen, <laughs> and now Devon Witherspoon. Yep. Unbelievable. Dang, he, he has, like, the feistiness reminds me of Cortland Sutton back in the day. Who, yes, yep. I know Cortland Sutton. There are some moments that if you go on YouTube, you're like, what is that? But, like, that dude would – Cortland Sutton would take on your left tackle if he could. He is completely fearless. Like, that yeah. – I did not see that one coming from a million miles away. I love it. I got to be honest. He was the guy I was hoping the Raiders would draft. Go ahead. If Witherspoon, <laughs> if, if Witherspoon weighed Reef. 340 pounds, they wouldn't let him play. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It would not be legal. <laughs> this but, is, you, but you also got to note, they're not done yet. They have the yep. 20th overall yes. pick as well. So yeah. it can get really, really dynamic in this draft for the Seattle yeah. Seahawks. This is also part – we have to remember, too, this is part of – they have this pick because of Russell Wilson. So, you know, Russell Wilson being moved to the, the Broncos gives them the situation where the Broncos season went wildly off the rails. And now – Seattle is able to pick up another piece. It, a year ago, people were asking what the plan was for Seattle. Uh, now, the plan seems to be pretty well in place. And the, yeah, the reason why this draft, why this event rules is because of what happened with Seattle last year. They went from a team that people thought was going to just kind of hover, like not be bad enough to be in the mix for a top quarterback, mm -hmm. but not be good enough to make the playoffs or really be relevant in the post-Russell Wilson era. Instead, the Broncos were so bad, it put the Seahawks in place with the top five pick. And the Seahawks absolutely crushed the draft. They basically aced their entire draft. It wasn't just Ken Walker the third. It wasn't just Abe Lucas and Charles Cross, their two offensive tackles. Tariq Wool and the defense, or close to defensive rookie of the year. Like, that changed everything for Seattle. If you're a team that's stuck in purgatory right now, look no further than what happened with Seattle last year. Which speaks to how we open this whole show. Like, the, yep. this is the season of hope. Every fan base believes that they can do what Seattle did, or even to a different degree, we'll talk hope. about the Jaguars. We don't live by the hope theory. We wish it would. <laughs> <laughs> if I could manifest anything in the draft, the Raiders wouldn't have put me through this level of heartbreak break over the last, I don't know, How do you decade. feel about this? I mean, things are shaping up okay for your Raiders right now? Yes, no, maybe? I want a Witherspoon. So now, you know, I don't okay, know what's I mean, going to happen. I'm going to embrace whoever well, I think that it's, person I think it's going to be pretty Lions obvious the who the Lions are going to take now. You think the Lions are all, I mean... Could this be a Jalen Carter spot? This I think so. Be. Wow. Could any be, yeah. spot is a Jalen Carter no, spot. Honestly, any team, yeah. any scheme, any coach, you yeah. pair him up with that defensive line and what. Uh, oh, oh, goodness. Uh oh, Lord. Oh, trade. Field, get the details. We <laughs> got a trade. He I don't have the details the yet. Arizona so. is on the <laughs> clock. <laughs> the Cardinals, who moved down. Remember, if you're just tuning well, in, the Cardinals had the third pick. They uh -huh. gave that to the Texans and got a haul in return for it. Now the Cardinals are back on the go. clock. So the 12 Cardinals and 34 for pick six. 12 and Ooh. 34 for pick six. Yep. Okay. This smells right. Tyree Wilson. So 12 mm -hmm. and 34 for pick six. So you're talking about yep. uh, six so picks from now. Yep. And, the, the, and a they get an extra. The they get second. a top. Exactly right. So the Cardinals trade picks 12 and 34. Remember, they just got 33 from Houston as yep. well. Mm -hmm. They get uh, pick six in return from the Lions, who 
uh, now have two picks, 12 and 18, in a six-pick span a little bit further down the board. I don't know anything about anything, but the pick is already in. Yep. The Cardinals on the clock. You're moving – again, I'm always doing the math of who you're moving ahead of. Everybody knows in every mock that it's been Witherspoon and Gonzalez that have been the two people that, that every Raiders fan This has is seen really mock. interesting that so, Arizona would do this, though. Like, I don't know where – I have no uh, idea where they're going. I, I can uh, see the Tyree yeah. Wilson thing, right? Tyree Wilson. Yeah. If, if they're at three and they're like, hey, if you don't trade for this, Houston – we are drafting Anderson, right? So if you want Anderson, you come here to get him. Mm. Well, he gives it up. Well, now the next best player yep. in that position, Tyree Wilson. I'm sure the Lions were shopping that as well. If somebody wanted an edge, they're like, hey, we got to go get to that spot. Well, the pick is in. We'll get the pick for you uh, relatively quickly here. The pick is in, obviously, uh, and we'll find out where the Cardinals go with this. But this is, ag- this is aggressive. We are seeing two bad franchises. Like, l- let's not mince words here. <laughs> no, the yeah, Texans yeah, yeah. suck, and so do the Cardinals. Like, and my Raiders suck. Raiders Why not just admit that? You got the Raiders like, fan throwing shots. I, I'm just, no, I'm just like, you can just admit when you live in the Your time is suck. coming. I know. <laughs> I look, I'm already on edge about it. But here's the thing. Like, you're seeing two teams that are bad be aggressive in trying to fix that. Like, Arizona picked up a haul, and frankly, they didn't give up that much to move back up. So, mm-hmm. I, this yeah. makes a lot of sense. You, you know what? They about actually that updated that. the trade. Okay. Good one. Uh, so, it's been updated. So, Lions trade picks 6 and 81, Cardinals 12, 34, and 168. Mm. So, it ended up being a little more uh, involved than the original terms. Yep. Um, but, yeah, the, the, the main tenants remain, right? But you the, used the, the phrase asset management earlier. This feels like strong asset management for the Cardinals to move down, pick up an extra first-rounder for next year, yeah, which could help they, them they, when they try and get one of the quarterbacks right. out of next year. Mm-hmm. And a lot then of, they move back up. A lot of buzz that they wanted one of those pass rushers, and if you still end up with the pass rusher of your choice yep. from, six, from three to six, then all of a sudden you picked up those two extra picks. And I have yet to confirm whether it is the Texans or the Browns 2024 first-round picks going to Arizona. But, man, that would be uh, – that's a big what-if that we are still trying to fill out uh, in the draft process. And you mentioned assets with the Cardinals. This is something that they've needed to do because they haven't really done anything this offseason. Right, like this is still a team that they need to build around Kyler Murray and, and put pieces around him, whether that's offense or defense, because this is a bad football team. So I think this is a good move. At least we'll see what the pick is. Spencer, I thought you were going to say something. You took this big contemplative <laughs> deep breath. I did. I thought you were because I, I don't. I don't know. Like this is putting a lot of faith in the Cardinals. Well, I, I, I might I, be doing too much. I want. I want to see might what the pick is, and yeah. who they pick is going to be justifiable. F- in my eyes, depends yeah. on who they pick. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, but they have a lot of needs. I could see them going uh, they tackle. Have every need. Every right? need. Like, yes. you got to protect Kyler Murray. He's coming off an injury. Go get him. Yep. Well, you know, you, parents you from Ohio like, State. They know the spot they're in. Like, they weren't aggressive this offseason because what's the point of being aggressive? Like, it's going to take a long mm-hmm. time to re- restock the cover. Mm, so, I'm not faulting them. Let's see. The pick is in I'm off skeptical. of this big trade. <laughs> Roger Goodell at the podium letting the world know who Arizona is selecting. Oh, Paris. Oh, my man is yes. ready. Oh, no, that yes. Makes sense. Right. That Paris, is, right. Johnson. Paris Johnson, uh, the, the offensive lineman out of Ohio State, Paris Johnson Jr. Uh, I will just say quickly, you guys do all the breakdowns. My favorite nugget on Paris Johnson is that, you know, we all say Peter Scrumpty came from the smart school. Let's remember, Paris Johnson graduated with a 4.0 in high mm. school, graduated from Ohio State in three years, picked up a side hustle just breaking down offensive line film to help his teammates. That is and correct. And learned Mandarin Chinese on the fly just because he wanted the Thank challenge. You. Clearly, clearly all you need to know about Paris Johnson, I mean, y'all saw the glamour shots. He had his chest out. That is a yeah. confident big man. Okay, he's he's going to be able to protect Kyler Murray. I don't know anything well, else I'm about offensive line play. Big but. guys need loving, too. Like, we, we, <laughs> we like the shiny <laughs> Ferrari toys and all yeah, this, but hey. let's not forget about the monster truck right. that make everything go. But when it comes to Paris Johnson Jr., quick feet, lateral movement, mm-hmm. stones people in the pass rush game, in, uh, in, the, in the pass set game, sustains blocks in the run game. Really looking forward to him uh, being in Arizona. I love getting the groceries. Let's get the groceries, right? Need some beef, need some bread. Let's put it on the line, Paris Johnson. And by the way, super smart on top of that, what you want from your anchor in the offensive line. Yep. Like, big guys deserve love. They deserve love for the intellect as well, okay? Yeah, as well as being big as a house. Yep, big dude. You talk about being smart. He's versatile. He played guard early yeah. on at Ohio State. Yep. Uh, some of the, you know, negatives, they say he gets a little heavy on his outside foot in his pass set, which in the NFL could be disaster for your another 5'9 quarterback. But like you said, Kyler Murray's coming off an injury. This is your guy. You're committed to him. You need to protect him now more than ever. You do that by going to get Well, Paris. let me throw a little I, I, something uh, out there. Yeah. Go ahead. 
because if the Arizona Cardinals end up with the first or second overall draft pick in 2024, they now have a decision to make. Do they want to keep Kyler Murray or do they want to reset things with a quarterback mm. being drafted, in which it will be Caleb, Caleb Williams, Williams or Drake May? Yeah, I mean, uh, this this is a foundational piece for them, no matter who they have a quarterback that makes sense. And, yeah. uh, you know, I got a, uh, we'll, we'll call him the anonymous insider big guy breakdown. Uh, big boy told me the Paris Johnson, and this is the notes, incredibly gifted athlete, motor mm-hmm. finishes there. Uh, the OSU guy, techniques raw, but does so what naturally does so many things well. Body angles, change of direction are special. special. Said, let's too many guys get into his chest. That's the only feedback uh, that was negative on it. So they let him yeah. in the chest. So yeah, I'd say, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to be like, uh, you don't want to like spoil people's excitement when they take a player sixth overall. But you know, the good is everything you guys have outlined. I mean, Paris Johnson mm-hmm. came into Ohio State with a ton of expectation and accolades, and he basically delivered, played at a high level for most of his college career. Big question marks during the pre-draft process was the two brightest spots of his career, or the two biggest moments of his career. Michigan this year, Georgia this year, didn't look like a guy that was going to be a dominant tackle in the NFL. Mm. Small sample size, of course, you can turn that around. Has a ton of traits. But that's the question he's going to have to answer in Arizona. And this team needed everything. If you look at their offensive linemen that are under contract beyond next season, it might be the six of us playing offensive line for them. In <laughs> well, hold on, Al. And he's, I, I, and he's still, yeah, yeah, he's still yeah, yeah. raw, No, no, no. I'm, I, he has some room out. to grow. He's, he's a raw player. Yeah. He still this, has room to grow. This trait, though, becomes totally logical to me because the other position that a lot of people know the Raiders have been looking at is offensive exactly. line. Yep. Most people think it was between Johnson or Peter Skaronsky as that pick for them if they choose to go that direction. Mm-hmm. Moving up in front of the Raiders now makes a ton of sense taking you know somebody that – uh, the Raiders have had a hard time adjust, uh, addressing their offensive line issues. So this is a really smart uh, moment. For but them. let me tell you why it surprised me. It surprised me because they lost J.J. Watt, who was their leading sacker. They mm-hmm. lost Zach Allen to the Denver Broncos. Their leading sacker now is their linebacker, Isaiah Simmons. So they're lacking that pass rush ability. That's why I thought that was a prime spot for a Tyree Wilson. I don't disagree with that. No. I'm not saying it's a bad. I'm, it's not a bad no, pick no. from Arizona. I'm just saying like they're lacking pass rush ability. The as only well. thing, and you're right about pass rushers. You always need them. But what have we seen the last two off seasons? We've seen okay offensive linemen get huge dollars because there's just not enough offensive yeah. linemen that yeah. they can actually field rosters. So you've got massive money going out to mediocre talent in some situations. That's a harsh way to say it, but I think you know what I mean. At some point, you've got to start running after offensive linemen in the draft because they're just not readily available in the NFL offseason. I think we also have to say this. We are officially, now that we're six picks in, no matter where Jalen Carter goes, it becomes like the the value of the draft. Yeah. Like we've reached, you've, you've moved far enough down the peg, you know, down the order that it's like the risk has now is now officially outside by the For reward. reasons we will, we will go into if he is the pick, it's a complicated <clears throat> pick for the Raiders right here. We will get yeah. into that when he's picked. I think it's a complicated oh, is pick. That, I don't is that your team? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got my jacket underneath. Okay. I'm just waiting until I actually see the Raiders make a point. And uh, quarterbacks that we still have on the board, Will Levis is still out there? Yep. Mm-hmm. yep. Will Levis is still out there. Mm-hmm. Why are you doing that to me? <laughs> because the Raiders could, put, could, could potentially yeah. take Will Levis. Oh, I just got Gucci oh, oh, oh. I, mean, I, I pledged. All right, America. I just I want you to get ready. I yeah. have made a pledge. Every year I sit on this damn show, and I got to sit there with the camera in my <laughs> face, and I just got to get through it. Every year I got to get through it. The pick is in, by the way. This year, I'm not going to get through it. I'm going to embrace it. Whoever the Raiders pick is going to be my favorite player in the history right. of the Raiders. I am going to go all in. I don't care if Field is the pick. I am going to root for that person oh. with all of my, my being. I, he's getting a jersey. I got two, I got two points, by the way. Yeah, Optimism yeah, don't, don't. on Paris Johnson is this. One, uh, he's going to be marketable to the largest population in the world. So congratulations for him on the marketing deal he's going to get out of somebody <laughs> in Shanghai or Beijing for his skills in speaking Mandarin. Yeah. Second of all, yep. winning the big man fashion contest to this point, I don't yeah. know if you saw, yeah. Will Anderson had some really nice pinstripes, but the mm. all-white, a bold but well-coordinated choice. Yes. Uh, uh, I mean, the, I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I'm just standing at this point. I've uh-huh. got a little energy for this sure. pick. We're just going to see what happens happens uh are we really going to give the 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 award to i mean paris showed the midsection like he went full it's bold it, yeah it's it bold. A bold strategy it's I bold like it. yeah no, confidence is golden who do you yeah. want so we'll yeah. just say yeah. who's more attractive the, whatever the pickers christian say who do you gonzalez. want christian gonzalez okay Chris, number two is um peter skronsky I, I want a boring i want a boring okay uh, tyree wilson will let us where do they rank uh I, I would say Tyree Wilson. I would take. Uh, so is he third? Is, is there somebody third. else? He's okay. Third. I think any, any chance that you can get Max Crosby help? Jalen the defense, Carter. The defense side. Uh, 
Jalen Carter, the film, I would, I, if, if you could tell me, uh, if you'd have told me three months ago I could have any player in this year's draft, I told Harry when we first yep. started Fitz and Harry, I wanted Jalen Carter. You put Jalen Carter next to Max Crosby, that is unbelievable, and you need disruptors in the AFC. You've either got to fix your secondary or fix your pass rush, right? The, You've got to do one of the two. Does the off-field stuff for Carter scare you as a Raiders fan? I think the off-field stuff for Carter combined with what the Raiders are still dealing with in the city of Las Vegas for Henry Ruggs makes it an impossibly difficult pick. Yeah, I hear that, you. Which we will yeah. break. If, if it happens, I want to get everything accurate on that. I don't, you know, I don't want to misspeak or put any of it into the universe. I'm just waiting to see what the pick is going to be. Like, literally, I'm going to go out tonight after we're done with this show at midnight, and I'm going to order the jersey for whoever's picked. Oh, it, we I, believe you. It is mm-hmm. going to be there. I will show you the receipts, Harry. He's know? looking at me because, see, we have – Three hours of radio tomorrow, <laughs> and this pick is going to be can, is going to determine how the show goes. I have said several times on radio that I don't, I don't really particularly. No offense. The anarchy pick is Will Levis, Levis, right? I just don't want Will Levis. I mean, at this stage, are you? uh, Could you really say that Will Levis is the better option over Jimmy Garoppolo? I say. Is there enough upside there to say say that you need nine starters on the defensive side of the ball? Fix your defense. That's my my. I'll talk through why I would be. We'll see what the pick is, and I'll give Will Levis thoughts. And with the seventh pick <laughs> in the 2023, Stetson let me Bennett. do this once. Just let me. Oh, it's you yes. sons of biscuits. <laughs> the pick is in. Tyree, Tyree Wilson. Wilson. I will oh. take. I like, I like this pick. Hey. Tyree Wilson all day. The best player in the draft, take, right? Uh, Tyree Wilson is the best player in the history of the <laughs> NFL draft. Not only that, Tyree Wilson came on our show. Yeah. I told yes. Tyree that he should, uh, he should, you know, become a Raider. It's your boy. He didn't like the fact that I didn't have him rated number one in the draft. But Tyree Wilson. Well, I, I love this pick for the Raiders because they're getting a guy that I think is still raw. Six, about 6'5", 6'6", 275 pounds to play a three technique, five technique, nine technique. Whatever technique you want to put him in, he can be in a three-point stance, two-point stance, four-point stance. I just think mm-hmm. one of few players that has played outside linebacker, defensive end, and defensive tackle. He's going to be a monster. I think the coaching, whoever coaches him up, uh, they have tremendous upside, and he can be a game wrecker. Octopus. He can be a game wrecker. Octopus. Also- Absolute octopus of a player. Just arms for days. Yeah, and this is an interesting story. First of all, Texas Tech having a defensive player oh. going in the top seven, although it does beg the question. Is he a Texas Tech guy or is he a Texas A&M guy? He started his career at Texas A&M, yep. finishes up at yep. Texas Tech. Tyler Wilson, though, if we were to just do a lineup of every player in this year's draft – Anthony Richardson would be the offensive Zeus, and this would be the defensive Zeus. This dude is body beautiful. He's a freak. He's everything you're looking for when you walk off the bus with the guy. Big question surrounding Tyree Wilson is his foot. There's a reason why we didn't see him during the pre-draft process that much and didn't run at the combine. We don't have a whole lot of measurables for him. So the question is, how is that foot injury going to impact his availability, both in the short and long term, if he checks out? The Raiders got themselves a defensive building block. Yeah, I, I think you, you know, I'll be put my Raiders fan hat on here, but you get two opportunities. One, you're going to learn from Max Crosby, who's turned into an absolute leader on that team. You mentioned the long wingspan, something Max is already uh, also known for. Yeah. You also learn from Chandler Jones, who did not have a particularly good season last year in productivity, but is a particularly good leader in that locker room. You talked earlier about veterans that know how to teach you how to play the game. That is something that, you know, I've even talked to Max about in the past with Chandler Jones is a great influence on how to develop your pass rush. So you've got coaches on the field that can help you. And the easiest way to help this secondary right now, if you don't love one of those guys in the secondary for any reason, is to help your pass rush. I thought that's what they thought Chandler Jones was going to do. But let's remember that Yannick Ngakwe put up a bunch of sacks opposite of Max Crosby. Chandler Jones still had games opposite against Max Crosby. So I think Tyree Wilson has a real opportunity to develop into something special. And I was texting with a Big 12 coordinator today, and I was just like, hey, brief thoughts on Tyree Wilson. And it's just like, hey, he's going to be able to do whatever's asked of him. Period. Just because of his own physical gifts, you are going to be able to get him to do what you need to do on that field. And like you said, putting him across with Max Crosby, like, I mean, come on. Like, were, like, those two guys can keep you in almost any ball game. There are so many little plays, if you watch his tape, where it looks like he's out of the play, and then you just see a tap. You just see a yep. little bit. He's one of those guys who, even if he's out of the play, can affect the quarterback, can affect the running back coming out of the backfield. A menace. I think the one negative that I will have for Tyree is that he's going to have to understand he's going to have to play with pad level, especially at, 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 in the National Football League. Mm-hmm. There are times on this film where you see him rushing a little bit too high, yep. but those are things that he can work on. And also, I, I hate this word. You guys are smarter than me when Whoa. it comes to this word, but multiple. <laughs> like, the Raiders' defense, though, is attempting to be multiple. Okay. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> 
<laughs> what did you think I was going to go with? <laughs> that could have went left I mean, really quick. Uh, by the way, uh, right now, uh, <laughs> should Fitz be happy the Raiders selected Tyree Wilson was actually put in the poll by Joey G? Uh, 63% said yes. I love you, America. You know what? Just share in my joy for a night. No, but seriously, Patrick Graham wants to be multiple on the defense. It's one of the things that they want to have a very patient approach to teaching what they want schematically on the defensive side of the ball. Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of why he's still there as a defensive coordinator. Oh, he's very, so, very confident, Tyree Wilson. Remember, oh we had him on our radio show, uh -huh. and I was like, man, I used to hate chipping guys like you and Will Anderson Jr. because we had Will Anderson on the day before. He was like, well, you're going to feel me a lot more than Will Anderson Jr. I was like. <laughs> right out of the gates. <laughs> Leave me alone. Which is when I, I want no parts of it. Which is when I said to him, hey, man, you know, if you join the Raiders, like, we should become besties. And he was like, maybe if you put me ahead of Will on your mock draft. So, you know, I'm just saying. He's got a chip Straight on shooter. his shoulder for not being yeah. the top yeah. overall guy. I mean, the thing about him, you talked about him being a little high when he plays. But it, when you look at his production and how he played, he was getting better every single season. And he is a player that is still ascending, which is what excites you. There is a percentage of NFL players. And, yes, every single person who plays in the NFL is a specimen in some respects. But, honestly, the last 20% you could probably swap out with XFL players, CFL players. You wouldn't know the difference. Mm -hmm. That kind of middle 70 are like the professionals that, you know, have some things that are, you know, uh, you, you have really good, good traits and things you excel at. And then some that are, you know, weaknesses that you have to overcome in other ways. Mm -hmm. And then there's like the top 10 percent, like the Tyree Wilson. So when they step on mm -hmm. a field, even amongst the professionals, they are men amongst what seems like boys. He is well, Captain yeah. America. What a lot of us pray for. Yeah, exactly. He, he, he steps out of bed <laughs> with it, right? Yeah. And that alone is why you go reach, for, not even reach, but why you go get a guy like him in the top ten. The best compliment I can give him is this. Made a lot of mistakes on film. They didn't matter. They didn't yes. matter. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect way. The pick is already in for the next selection, the Atlanta Falcons. Now, if you don't know, Harry, you want to give everybody the, 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 uh, the, the sound? What's the Falcon Hawk sound? <laughs> Also we asked him today on, hawk, on radio hawk. if that was a falcon and a hawk. Was it a? Was it a? Oh, oh, we combined oh, oh. them together, baby. Because I can't do the other way. I can't like a scream. It's more of a scream. Yeah, like a scream. Yeah. 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 Like one of those kind of. Everybody's a critic pitch. around here with the hawk noises. Oh. You want to get on on the hawk noises? Uh, no, I don't. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna pass. Sounds uh, <laughs> good. All right. So what are you looking for as as, uh, as the guy that knows this organization yeah. better than anybody? What are you looking for from Atlanta? I think right now. The two deficiencies that they've had the last three or four years oh, wow. has been pass rush and also defending the pass. So a corner mm -hmm. here or Jalen Carter? Who do you want? Jalen Carter. Yeah. Boy, okay. that just Lyles, you're, you're big sense. on Atlanta. What do what, what, you agree with this take? Jalen Carter would, would be phenomenal. And I think that they would use the, hey, he's a hometown kid piece of it to at least try to say, hey, here's why we took him despite – all of these issues that, mind you, did not happen very far from the city that he would be playing in. Ton, I mean, so I, much pre-draft buzz about Bijan Robinson to Atlanta. That too, and you know, just because. Ooh, here we go. A, that's a good one too. I got to see Bijan Robinson. I mean, here's the thing: like, I can't decide whether being close to home is good or bad for everybody. Like, that's different yeah, for everybody different in life, right? And yep. so, who depends on your friends? <laughs> fair, yeah, uh, that that is uh, well said. So it depends on a lot of different issues. The the Falcons are making. The pick. It has been a wild. I mean, we expected it to be unexpected, and it has lived up to every ounce of the hype. Roger Goodell up uh, now at the podium to make the pick. This would be the eighth pick in the NFL draft, uh, the 2023 NFL draft in Kansas City. Everybody having a good time. Sun's starting to set in Kansas City, but the night just getting started across the league. <clears throat> Got Goodell going to give us the pick here. We're about 15 seconds out. We'll see where it goes. I still think Bijan. I don't know why I think Bijan. Yeah, me too. I mean, Bijan, Bijan is still a, 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 mm -hmm. an amazing pick, though. Mm -hmm. yeah, boy, if you really yeah. believe that, hey, we're going to give this Desmond Ritter thing a shot, yes. there are worse players to pick than Bijan Robinson. Yeah, yep. I, I, yep. That's part of why I love it. Like, when you've got a young quarterback, you give them options. There you go. All right, they are letting well, the guests make the pick as we speak right now. It's got to be nerve-wracking to stand up mm -hmm. in front of that huge crowd. Not that bad. I mean, especially if it's a pronunciation you're not good with. Atatomo Adabare. I've been working on that all month. Wow! They did it. Wow, they did it! They did it. Wow. Yes. Bijan Robinson out of Texas is the pick. And we I just said it. You got a young guy? Yep. Maybe you put weapons around him. Field, you're excited. All right, so let me start this. There's a time and a place for the conversation about drafting a running back eighth overall in today's NFL. 
I'm not ready for that time right now. No. Because the Atlanta Falcons just got the player that Spencer made the case as being the best player in this entire draft. Mm-hmm. Bijan Robinson is unquestionably the best running back prospect since Saquon Barkley. He might be better than that for as gifted as he is as a runner. He's equally capable as a pass catcher. You're going to see it right now. He's the best player on their offense right away. This is the ideal landing spot for him. It's probably the thinnest backfield in the NFL. I know they had Tyler Algier for 1,000 yards last year. Mm -hmm. Algier is three and a half, four yards in a cloud of dust. This is a total game changer for this offense, even if it's a, in some ways, non-justifiable pick. Before you go in, oh boy, I can tell you all about it. Oh my goodness. Which speaks to the fact that maybe the Eagles want to be John and he's not there. He yep. was your favorite player in the draft. Yeah, by, by far. And he fits into what Atlanta does. And I am in the curious position of saying that Harry and HD and every other Atlanta Falcons fan has a legitimate reason for hope. It feels weird coming out of my mouth. Mm. But y'all can be happy about this because he makes everyone better on offense. Everyone better. And I think the one thing that I like about B. John Robinson, I think the biggest criticism of his game is that he gets bounce happy in the backfield. And to me, the only reason he's like that is because he can actually make plays, because he does get bounce happy, because he has that playmaking ability. I mean, he really is a full package. He yeah. has vision, yeah. he has elusiveness, he has power, he can do it in the run game, in the pass game. You have Arthur Smith, who got this head coaching job by building an offense around a running back where it didn't matter what the quarterback position was doing, it took pressure off of them. Falcons have the same thing. Before we continue this Falcons conversation field, we got trade details on what's been happening now. Bears go from pick number 9 to 10, so one slot, and they add a 2024 fourth-round pick for Philadelphia in the process as well. All right, so there's the trade details. I know you guys both, you wanted to track yeah. it on North. And by the way, the Eagles took about 10 seconds to make their pick. So whoever they moved up for, mm. they were mm. very convicted on. So when you look at this offense for the Falcons now, you have a Cal Pitts who's coming back off an of injury, a Drake yep. London, mm-hmm. now a B. John Robinson. That offensive line really showed some growth within the run game. Mm-hmm. Now you have all this to build around your young quarterback in Desmond Ritter. So yep. you're building that foundation mm-hmm. for him to be successful. I think the self-awareness from Arthur Smith and also from Terry Fontenot, their general manager, is ideal in this situation, and B. John Robinson is going to make all of us happy in Atlanta. Yeah, make things easy at 215, size to last and to take a pounding mm-hmm. down the stretch if he's asked to carry the team. I will also point this out uh, in terms of character issues. He had a Lamborghini as an undergraduate <laughs> at the University of Texas and did not crash it. Show me risk management. Show, show me the ability to evaluate both your sponsorship opportunities and manage them sensibly. Nothing but kudos to this young man. One of the highest earners in NIL, and mm-hmm. we had him on Fitz and Harry, and we asked him if that was a consideration to stay in school because of his profitability, and he said no. But the biggest thing that he did learn through the process of NIL was how to handle endorsements, how to handle money, and how to know, like to know how to handle his business when he gets to it. Mm-hmm. B. John Robinson, of all of the prospects we talked to, I don't know that there was a more impressive young man on an interview mm-hmm. than we out. dealt with with him. Like he I'll gave see him soon. Goosebumps. I'll see him soon. Oh, you'll see him soon. Yeah. <laughs> I'll see him soon. Oh, man. That, is that a baby, B. John. I mean, Welcome to Atlanta, baby. Yes, sir. Okay. Hey, to you. So, uh, the, the big trade, the Eagles pick is in. We do not know what it is yet, uh, obviously, but the, the Eagles trade to move up. So, uh, that, which is only funny to me because we weren't sure what the Eagles were going to do in this year's draft. Obviously, they are in love with somebody. Uh, they have moved up in Chicago's pick. Any, uh, any thoughts, Field? You got any ideas what they're looking for here? Well, Philly would unquestionably be a team that feels like Jalen Carter is right in the mix for them, right? I mean, there's been plenty of smoke surrounding them. Some of the most plugged-in reporters have been saying the floor for Jalen Carter was pick 10, who owned number 10 originally, Philadelphia Eagles. A reunion, if this happens, between he and... And, of course, Jordan Davis last year. That is about 650 pounds of mm. man a lot. <laughs> in Philadelphia. A lot. Well, we yeah. talk about infrastructure, right, and having those veterans on that defensive line that can mentor Jalen Carter. Well, who's better than Brandon Graham, Fletcher Cox, Josh Sweat, Hassan Riddick? All of those guys are there to be able to help guide him if that's the direction the Eagles want to go. I have bad news for you, Harry. According to the, the YouTube poll, does Harry Douglas' Falcon noise actually sound like a Falcon? 41% say no. 32%, Let's hear yours, per- Chad. 32% say yes, and 27% say it doesn't sound like a bird at all. Well, you know what I say about that? If God is on my side, who can be against me? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Waiting for comment from God. <laughs> <laughs> also, did the Falcons just select the steal of the draft in Bijan Robinson at number eight? Yes. 56% yeah. say yes. 
43 percent say right. no. So you like Chad again? Uh, everybody loves us. But any other draft, like B. John Robinson, is probably like in the past. He's probably going what top three, top yeah. four. Yeah, going a different. Mm-hmm. In a different way. I mean, yeah. you have this yeah. conversation about yeah. running back, and you talk about like at what point do you grab him? Like I said, for Arthur Smith. This is his comfort zone. Give me and e- do everything back, yep. and I can duplicate what I did in Tennessee. Especially, like, let's also acknowledge that the NFC South is not exactly a juggernaut. Like, the Falcons really? have put right. themselves in a situation. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. uh, the Falcons have Breaking put themselves news. in a very good situation mm-hmm. in yep. that division, even as Desmond Ritter develops. And again, if Desmond Ritter turns out to be trash, they can uh, try. They can. If you're going to have to use collateral to move up anyway to get the guy, if he why decides not waste to be no what. Year? To be trash. Watch your mouth, Will. Okay, well, I mean, what you talking about? <laughs> look, you're, you're right. It, Hold it, up. It, it's only a, it's a, it's a chance. That's Nolan all. Smith, mm-hmm. too. Right. You're going to look out for him for this Eagles pick, too. Ooh, Ooh would be all good. Right. Yeah. Another good one. Hassan Riddick. Kyle. So, uh, we, are waiting, uh, we are waiting for the pick. Roger Goodell coming up to the podium. The Eagles have moved up to make this selection. And we will tell you what it is as soon as he announces it to the crowd. As Roger Goodell is addressing Kansas City right now with the Eagles pick. In, and this is the ninth pick because of their trade with the Chicago Bears. There it is. Cameras are on, everybody. With the ninth pick, the Philadelphia Eagles have selected Jalen Carter. Now, before we say anything, I want people to understand why Jalen Carter has fallen in the draft. Jalen Carter was sentenced to 12 months probation after pleading no contest to misdemeanor charges of reckless driving and racing. Additionally, Carter was fined $1,000, must perform 80 hours of community service, as well as attend a state-approved driving course. The charges stem from a January 15th single-car accident that killed Georgia recruiting staffer Chandler LaCroix and offensive lineman Devin Willett. Police alleged that Carter was driving at speeds of 104 miles per hour while racing LaCroix, who crashed into two power poles and several trees. LaCroix was intoxicated at the time of the crash, but police said Carter showed no signs that he had been drinking. So that is the the off-the-field portion of this that we have addressed several times in the show in regards to why Jalen Carter was not selected higher in this year's draft. Gentlemen, you pair that with the less important in many ways, but the other issue of his pro day was not what many people expected. He came in a little overweight. Some said he did not look to be in the best shape of his life. It feels like things went off the rails after the football season ended. I think now he's in a situation where he's going to be able to have people around him to help guide him. And let's be honest, we all were 21. Yep. Not saying that we all made the same mistakes, but we've all, you know, haven't haven't made the right decisions in our life. And we've had those people to help us along the way as well get on the right path. I think him going to the to the Eagles and number one, the rich got richer. But you you see a guy in Fletcher Cox who's who who's not only had success on the football field, but he does a lot of things in the community. And he's he's had that success off of the football field. Fletcher Cox is on a one year deal now. I think he has an opportunity to to grab a young man and take him under his wings and really show him the way of life off of the field, but also on the field. Mm-hmm. I think people are justified to have questions when these kind of things arise, mm-hmm. right? Like yep. To your point, we've all been young. We ha- maybe not have been in this specific situation, but even all the aftermath and things that have followed, this is something very traumatic that you would imagine to deal with, right? As you're also trying to get ready to get go to the NFL, whether that's through Pro Day, the Combine, you're dealing with turning yourself in, this obvious traumatic and um, incredible tragedy where you lose two people in an act of stupidity at night or whatever it is, right? So to your point about having an infrastructure in place with the Philadelphia Eagles where people can bring him in and mentor him and hopefully let him maximize his ability, it is a good spot and it's a great pick by the Eagles from a talent standpoint. But I also want to say this, though. Yeah. Um, we don't know if he will ever get over that, knowing what happened to two people involved in the UGA program. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So Two people he was close with. Exactly. Yep. Yep. So yep. we don't know what he's dealing with inside or if he will ever get over that. Yeah, well, also, too, we have to, in trying to decide if we see a fault in Jalen Carter, we have to invent one. The only thing standing in Jalen Carter's way, due to the lack of any apparent weakness in his football game, 
is himself. Mm -hmm. And he gave a little bit of evidence that he might not be handling everything as well as he could, right? No Circumstances question. intervened, admittedly, but there were other things like preparation, lack of preparation right, for the workout. The, yeah. yeah, so like the only, I mean, that's the thing with him. He's such a unique and special talent that really the only thing standing in way of him getting everything he wants and becoming the player he is, it's him. His own decision making. Right. I yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned like there is sort of a compartmentalization that's needed. Like the right. incidents that tragically ended with two people dead is one thing. And obviously it's incredibly sad and he's going to have to pay the price of 12 months probation that Fitz already alluded to. There's also just like the stuff that, that preceded that. There was, hey, the pro day came out after all this, but what kind of effort are you getting on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. Is this the kind of guy that's going to be the first in, last out? You don't know. Now, <clears throat> when you're that naturally gifted that you can toss around defenders at the highest level of college football like it might be easier for you to not take it easy but maybe not push full throttle you're not an underachiever physically you are not a guy who earned his way onto the roster because you were a walk-on initially you have been bigger and better than everybody for your entire life now you're going to meet your match in the NFL. And I'm glad Harry mentioned at the very beginning of this analysis that, like, from a Philly standpoint, you've got built-in mentorship. If you can't learn from Fletcher Cox and your own teammate Jordan Davis, then this ain't going to last long. Yep. Yeah, I think the thing that you just really want to see out of him in this situation, you know, we're talking about a lot of players tonight, right? And, and we think some are going to succeed, some might not, whatever the case may be. The beauty of life is that this is still a young man. He mm -hmm. made a mistake. I'm certain he knows it was bad. I think what you just want to see out of him if you are the Eagles and, and all of us really in general, right, is that he just looks inward. Why did this happen? What went wrong? And how do I become better from this? And if he's able to at least take those steps, and HD, you mentioned a lot of the people that are going to be able to mentor him through this, hopefully he does get this on the right path and he does succeed because ultimately I, I do think that's what everybody wants to see. You just have to hope that he does have that good approach, that healthy approach to like this incident. It also speaks to the importance of the player visits in the top 30 visits, we all know this. He took visits with all the teams that were yeah. in the top 10. I think we have to know that whatever organization decided to draft him, and ultimately it was Philadelphia, whatever organization decided to pass on him, they were going to have to look within and ask themselves, based on that visit, mm -hmm. what they learned about the young man. Because I, I think that's such an imperative part. As much as we talk about the tape and as much as we talk about, you know, the pro days and all of these things, this, because they're personal decisions that put him in the situation he's in, was all going to be about how comfortable an organization was realizing that this would be their first draft. And look, it's, it be, let's be honest. Any, it couldn't be any organization that drafted Jalen Carter. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah, it, really. ha it had to be the right organization, and I think Philadelphia is the right organization. The next pick is in. The Chicago Bears take Darnell Wright, the tackle out of Tennessee, the fast rising. Somebody that a couple of months ago may not have been at the top of the list, but over the course of the last couple of months has just absolutely ascended up the draft charts. How many times have we all heard it, gentlemen? Yeah. He shut down. Gonna say, you yeah. got to get I mean, that out of the way, right? You're yeah. contractually yeah. obligated to mention that he just crushed him. Yeah, I mean, that, that Tennessee-Alabama game, there's so many players from that game, obviously, that we're going to see get called on tonight. But he was absolutely the anchor. And mind you, that is the biggest game in Tennessee football history the past 15 years. That one right there. No like, the, like, this has been a program that has been down, and there is absolutely no way that they have the season that they have last year. Hendon Hooker becomes a player that everybody knows nationally. Jalen Hyatt, a receiver that everybody knows nationally without that man. Yeah, you want the quiet secret as to why Tennessee was able to score at will and at any point in any game last season. This dude's easily half of it. And just it, it, powerful just immovable, knew his assignments in and out, came on late, right? Which, you know, there are people of varying minds as to whether you want to draft somebody who, you know, had really one year of outstanding production. He's got a ton of experience. He obviously got better. Also, I'm always going to draft a dude named Darnell out of Tennessee. If he's, you know, like a top 25 dude, his name's Darnell and he's huge, I'll take him. Give him to me. Yeah, I, 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 look, I, this is a great pick. I think when you talk about the term controlled violence, that's mm -hmm. what Darnell Wright is, right? And, and you know, he, he's a, a nasty player. And when he can, he picks his spots brilliantly, which is what you want out of a tackle. Things get physical, have a technique. But when you can, you inflict pain, and that's what he does. Bears offensive line is starting to take shape now. There you sudden. go. So Darnell Wright plays likely opposite of Braxton Jones. Fifth-round pick out of Southern Utah last year. Played really well for Chicago in a – you know, obviously, besides Justin Fields, not a whole lot went right last year along the offensive line. Their general manager, Ryan Poles, was a five-star recruit coming out of high school, played at BC, was on the same team as Matt Ryan, popped his Achilles during his final game against Notre Dame, ends up going undrafted, decides to go the scouting route rather than continue with his playing career. 
-hmm. He's going to build an offensive line. They've added Nate Davis in, the, in, in free agency. They obviously already have Braxton Jones. Now they have Darnell Wright. Like, this offensive line sort of takes some real shape here in Chicago, and Justin Fields is an unbelievable runner. Yep. I also think there's a chance that the Bears are probably saying to themselves, we can't have him running as much as we did last year because sometimes he was running for his life. Yes. Yeah. I mean, as some of us have made a little money on the rushing over every week, I'd like for that to keep <laughs> happening. Uh, Darnell Wright, by the way, I'll go to our super anonymous big boy mm -hmm. breakdown. A uh, well-developed pass pro plan versus the rusher. Extremely powerful lower half. I've never said mm. that about another man. Varied set and hand <laughs> use. On his best day as a run blocker, he's a people mover. When his base is good, he's an animal. Pace of offense got him on his toes a bit too much at times. Moves really well in space. You, uh, you I wanted to, to do this. We always talk about people, like the disadvantages, and we, we do critiques based on systems, okay? Mm -hmm. Let's do the reverse. Let's do a compliment based on systems. Okay. Sometimes, par sometimes Darnell did not get set at the point because they're snapping the ball at 15 seconds yeah. on the clock. They're mm -hmm. going, okay? Mm -hmm. So sometimes he didn't really have a base to make these run plays when they go, okay, we need to get to the line right now. Slow that down a little mm -hmm. bit. You're going to see even more consistent performance out of him. The bear, like that's just like a not, not a bad little piece of business right there. The bear, they move down one slot. Yeah, and they get the player. They, if they if they if they weren't going, they clearly weren't going to take Jalen Carter, right? And yep. that's every team had a different sort of litmus test on how a different mm -hmm. level of tolerance, right? So they weren't going to take Jalen Carter. So instead, they take a player that clearly they would have been comfortable taking at number nine because it was just one slot later. Pick up an extra fourth along the way. A little business right there. Also, the Bears have quietly done, I think, really sneaky good business through this whole offseason. They had a ton <laughs> yeah. of cap money to spend. Yep. Uh, they realized that this was their opportunity to try and, I don't want to say Philadelphia it, but they needed to put more talent around DJ Moore. Justin Fields, right? So DJ Moore. They got DJ Moore. Um, they traded for Chase Claypool last year during the offseason as well. Got to remember, they did draft uh, Villas Jones from Tennessee, a, t yeah. a teammate right. of, uh, of Darnell uh, Wright. So, Everything's starting to come together more so for Justin Fields now. I'm, I'm, I want to see what the Bears are going to do the rest of the draft, but, you know, you got an offensive lineman, and you know you needed an offensive lineman. Yeah, and I think there's just this element for the Chicago of being intentional. Well, you can have a lot of money, and you can have the first pick in the draft, but you still have to have a long-term business plan on what you're trying to build, right? Trading out of that first overall pick in the draft uh, gave them the wide receiver they wanted. They didn't need a quarterback. They picked up equity that they can continue to build with. They spent their money wisely, and now they get a solid draft pick that everybody's really high. Like, mm -hmm. I just this feels like one of those off seasons where everything's been really simple and easy for Chicago in all the right ways. The Titans, by the way, pick is in. Titans, another team you know well. You played there. Uh, you and I both have a lot of experience around Nashville. You played for the Titans? Uh, uh, I did, yeah. No, oh, I, I played know. for the Titans, yeah. <laughs> really uh, cool. No, I usually just talked a lot of trash. <laughs> I need a water every now and then. With Titans <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, although, I right. still love you. <laughs> uh, you know what? You're 6 1. All right, so uh, <laughs> best available, Will Levis. Will Levis going to be the new quarterback well, for the Tennessee Titans? Well, there's, there's three ways they can go here. They can go <laughs> Will Levis, they can go offensive mm -hmm. lineman. And the reason why I say offensive line is because they they lost Ben Jones, their starting center, also Taylor Lewan yeah. is, uh, yeah. is going to retire from football. Mm -hmm. Offensive line, they can go there. Wide receiver, the deficiency there was huge, especially after they traded away A.J. Brown. But they also can go corner. That's four spots I just mentioned. Yeah. Christian yeah, Gonzalez is still on the board. This is a team that, I mean, what are the Titans right now? They've got Ryan Tannehill still. So if that's their quarterback for next year, I don't think you have Ryan Tannehill as your starter if you intend on being bad, right? I mean, he's not elite elite, but he's certainly been serviceable. Two years ago, they were the number one seed in the in the AFC. Now what are they? Like, I can't figure it out. They had to cut and release, they had to cut several veterans this offseason. Not just Terry Luan, Bud Dupree, amongst others. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I can't decide if they're trying to do the Seattle thing last year, which is like, we're not going to be really bad, but we're going to hope that we nail the draft will be pretty good. But that's like a little bit of a fleeting exercise. See, see. I, think, I think one of the things that hurt this team, though, the last few years, and it kind of got the best of John Robinson, is that you, he drafted so many guys in the secondary – and those guys haven't panned out yeah. Yeah. up until this point. Yep. And also, aren't they still in their learning curve field? I mean, Rand Carthon comes over to be the GM from San Francisco, right? He's still figuring out that whole identity. As much as you can have a book on it, you're in the building, you're yeah. cutting a lot of people, you're still trying to get feel for things. What do you do if you don't know what to do? Get a lineman. Get a tackle. Get a tackle, baby. Because yeah, you can't. Buy a truck. They I don't need. know what car to get. Get a truck. <laughs> get a truck. That's what you I do. mean, Skaronsky right now, I think we just saw him on the a best available. Truck at that. A, you know, Skaronsky is somebody that uh, obviously is still on most of the boards. Mm -hmm. Got some offensive line talent still on the board. The pick is in for the Tennessee Titans. So, uh, no trade here. Some people thought in the mocks that the Titans might try and dra trade up to draft a quarterback. But as they sit right now, Will Levis is still available for them should they want one. So Roger Goodell saunters up to the podium. 
not really a saunter. It's more. I like Skaronski because he can go guard, he can go tackle. First you know, one. Uh, yeah. Sh short arms is what they always say. Like like short gotta, arms. Yeah. Like what so do I got to say man. about that? Like, but there is the picks. There Peter Peter Skaronski, Northwestern. Uh, he is the pick and somebody that obviously again we've talked a lot about high on the boards. Can, can play in a lot of different positions. So it makes sense for the Titans roster. Yeah, I think this is a guy that can go center, can go guard, can go tackle. Mm -hmm. His grandfather, Bob Skaronski, played for Vince Lombardi and those Super Bowl teams back in the day for Green Bay. So it's in the bloodline, Fitz. You know how I feel about that. Hey, and With, anybody that ever has a, like, if your second brother's cousin's mother's uncle played, he's like, huh, family tree. I like hey, that. I'd like to say it doesn't matter, but it does. <laughs> it, it really does. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, we in on Skaronski? I'm in on Skaronski. Smart player, probably will end up in the interior, I think. It's, you know, probably a better spot for him, right? Definitely smart enough to, you know, be a center if he's got to be a center. Um, you know, does occasionally, it's like, he's a smart player. He takes great angles, right, but he can't get edged out. Um, but other than that, like, we're nitpicking. This is, yeah. a, this is a fantastic pick. Yeah. yeah. It feels like there's four, off, like, linemen that you can play week one. Like, he's yeah. one of them. If you're going to make this pick... Like, he's, he's got to be that guy, and I, I think most people would agree that. I, I just thought the Titans last year, Ben Jones was the leader of that offensive line. He was banged up last season, so I think they need that that new guy to be the le the leader and actually anchor that offensive line. I think Skaronski could be that. Well, look at their productivity once Lewan got hurt last year. Yep. I mean, everything went to hell for him. Skaronski, by the way, our super anonymous big boy breakdown. I'm just coining that as the term. Uh, good mix of sets, smart approach to engaging defenders. Arm length issues do show up on tape, whatever the hell that means. T -Rex Above arms. average well. but not elite change of direction. Gets edged at times. Strong well, 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 I'll give you an example. You look at a, a, a lineman like Paris Johnson. I think yeah. Skaronski's arm is, his arms are probably four or five inches shorter mm -hmm. than Paris Johnson Jr.'s. That, that's a, that, that comes up huge yeah. when, when you talk about playing tackle on the outside. Yeah. 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 yeah, and preventing players from getting in your chest. Let, exactly. Yeah, let's, yep. let, let's translate this. Yeah. This is not as good as this yeah. when you're talking about keeping a monster defensive end away from your quarterback. It's that simple. I understand all of the core tenets. I just feel yeah. weird at, you know, 5'9", 165, sitting there being like, I don't know, man, it's got short arms. Like, yeah. <laughs> but you're not blocking Tyree Wilson. No, no, no. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. You uh, want to try? Field, field you like, yeah. Well, we'll just once. Field you like to pick? Skaronski? Yeah, yeah. I think this is a high floor player as well. I don't know where he's going to fit in in this offensive line, but this is one of those spots where, based off who they already have in place, it doesn't matter. Like, if he goes to, as an example, like if he had gone to Chicago, he has to be a guard. I don't, I don't think you're, you're supplanting – uh, Braxton Jones at the left yeah. tackle spot. Tennessee can figure that out later. Mm -hmm. I'm always going to be in favor of a team that doesn't exactly know where it is, padding the offensive line. And it was a major need, as you guys have all discussed. Yes. I will still note, Will Levis is still on the board. And, and, and mm -hmm. I mean, you look, even if that was a consideration for the Tennessee Titans, and knowing Mike Rabel, he's going to go with the safe pick in that situation because Ooh. we don't know what Tannehill is doing. We have a here. shocker of a pick. <laughs> wow. Oh, the oh, Titans! Just selected Jameer Gibbs out of Alabama. And, and guys, I, I'm stunned just because this isn't something I didn't see many mocks that had Jameer Gibbs running back out of Alabama going this high. I, uh, all right, so. What do you okay, got? okay. All right, so first of all, a little bit of the, the expository here, right? For, you, for those of you who don't know, Jameer Gibbs, you're seeing Georgia Tech highlights because he was at Georgia Tech for multiple years before he finished off his past year at Alabama. It was a huge transfer for Nick Saban and the Crimson Tide to, lead, to land. He was at Georgia Tech, though, and absolutely balled out. They don't exactly play uh, the same level of offense that Alabama often does, but this is a satellite player. I hate to make comparisons to guys that are at their ceiling, but if you're doing the ceiling comparison for Jameer Gibbs, it's Alvin Kamara, mm -hmm. best receiving back in this year's yeah. draft, mm -hmm. unbelievable in space. Has enough power, like not going to bowl you over like Derrick Henry will, but this guy is super fun. You're seeing him right now as a route runner. Woo! If you put 81 as opposed to 1 on his jersey, mm -hmm. you could be convinced that it's a That's young fun. Andrew Hawkins I right here. Him. Now, the Go Lions on, have now yeah. invested David Montgomery, three years, 18 million bucks. DeAndre Swift sure feels like the kind of player whose time is coming to an end in Detroit. And they also, they lost Jamal Williams, who's now with the New Orleans Saints, but I actually know a guy that coached Jameer Gibbs and also B. John Robinson, Tashard Choice. He's the running back coach at Texas, was the running back coach at Georgia Tech. And he said, B. John's here, but Jameer Gibbs is right underneath here, right behind him. Yeah. Two phenomenal running backs, but Jameer Gibbs can do it on returns, whether it's kick returns, punt returns, can be a pass catcher, can run the football, dynamic playmaker, runs routes like a, 
I won't say a poor man wide receiver, but he, he can he can run some routes. He, he, he can get right. Like a slot. I, I, I would definitely say that. I mean, the way he changes direction, his footwork. I mean, what he's able to do in the pass game. You talked about it. He's one of those players that I think actually fits better on the pro level because he's such a matchup nightmare. And when you get him in that, you see the choice route they put on there, like a linebacker's not going to be able to defend that kind of change in direction. He led mm-hmm. the team in rushing, and he catches and run routes like a, like a slot receiver. Jerk route king. Jerk route yep. king. Okay, yeah. he's going to make you look like a jerk when you put him one-on-one with a linebacker. <laughs> yep. Problem solver. Uh, Alabama, in case you didn't know, had a ton of issues on offense in terms of finding production every time they needed it. Who did they go to? They yep. went to Jameer Gibbs. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, it is interesting. Let's at least acknowledge they had the sixth pick in the draft. They traded down to the 12th pick in the draft. So if you're a Lions fan, you came in thinking, man, we were on the cusp of the playoffs last year. Uh, we have the sixth pick in the draft. Was this the, the – like, are, are they playing chess at this point? Because it seems like trading down and then taking a running back means that they felt really secure about the entirety of what they were trying to accomplish, right? Like, it's just, it feels a little weird for a trade down and then a running back. Um – does running backs are back man two they running are. backs and no wide receivers taken so far in the first 12 picks who would have guessed ridiculous. that in today's nfl right it's ridiculous um, haters huh yeah, yeah. she does i will say he, <laughs> replace I, the, the biggest criticism i think i've seen of jameer gibbs is people feel like his growth potential is not what you would like for it to be especially i mean if, where he just got picked mm-hmm. but i think the the positive thing with him and the reason he draws those camara you know comparisons is because he has such a good feel for the game and you really need to have that, especially with his play style. He's got a lean lower half. He doesn't, he's not bulky or anything like that. But because he's good at setting up his own blocks, he's good at finding gaps, I see the potential there. It does seem kind of high, though. I just I wouldn't run him in between the tackles no. frequently. Mm-hmm. No. The, uh, the YouTube chat seems to be shocked. Uh, the question was, are you shocked the Lions selected Jameer Gibbs at number 12? 76%. With the immediate reaction to the yes. Also, we can just hear it in our ears. Our, our, shout out to our great producer, Chris Cologne, uh, Lions fan. Chris does not seem pleased. It's like, a tough I, life. I, I get, <laughs> like, Chris now, when he gets in our ears to say something, he's like, Chris, like, Chris, Chris is angry about this. I'm, I'm just saying, uh, a little bit of a surprise to Mir Gibbs going 12. Uh, also, surprised. I think if you, we all do this, but when you think about the draft going into it, as a fan, you're like, oh, we're going to get this guy, this guy, this guy. It feels a little out of left field to think, oh, we had the sixth overall pick. Instead, we got some other picks and a running back. But, hey, the Lions at this point are in a division. We just talked about the Bears, but they're in a pretty wide open division. So, right now, it gives them a great opportunity to maybe take a step forward. So, you can see the recent selections there. Bijan Robinson, Jalen Carter, Darnell Wright, Peter Skaronsky, Jameer Gibbs. So, a lot of talent still going off the board, gentlemen. It, it feels like Things are just sort of for oh, Yeah, plenty of talent, of course. It's the beauty of the draft, man. As we've gotten through 13, 12 picks, what? we got plenty of guys here. We're good. It just felt wild in the first few picks. Now it feels like everything's just sort of settled settle down a little bit. Yeah. 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 Uh, Green Bay on the clock at 13. Green, Green Bay is on the clock. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> <gonna turn right laughs> now. Yeah. now. Turn the knife a little bit. Uh, can, <laughs> yeah. Why not? Right now, baby. <laughs> Let's go, Green Bay. I'm asking Joey G behind the scenes. If they select a, a wide receiver at 13, can we just put it on the poll in the YouTube chat? Mm-hmm. Like, is this the most up yours pick in the history of all time? Because if they <laughs> finally draft a, a draft, I don't know why I said it that way, a wide receiver. Get away from after, the zoo. Get away from the zoo. After Aaron <laughs> Rodgers, I still got Miles Davis on the mind. Uh, like, or my, <laughs> Davis Mills. I want Miles Davis. I don't know. Uh, if they draft a wide receiver now, that just feels like they are absolutely trolling Aaron Rodgers. Well, you want to get your young quarterback as much help as possible. So, I, Dude. if I'm Green Bay, I don't give a damn about Aaron Rodgers right now. It's about what I can put around my young quarterback yep. so he can be productive moving forward. Yep. Listen, now that we finally have a quarterback in Green Bay. <laughs> <laughs> After years of struggle. After years one, of struggle, it's yeah. finally time to it's, get him oh, some help. It's finally here. But you said it, HD. That is, yes, will it? Be ironic. Will it be a little bit of a ha-ha to Aaron Rodgers they go wide receiver? Absolutely. But at the same time, when you have Aaron Rodgers and you're paying what you're paying for Aaron Rodgers and that ability, you expect him to be able to win without maybe a top wide receiver. Maybe you don't feel that way about Jordan Love, and you have to go get him mm-hmm. weapons to make sure he's successful because you don't want to drop off after having two Hall of Fame quarterbacks for nearly Now, I do years. believe they're going to go tight end here. Tight end. That also okay. Dalton yeah, Kincaid yeah, yeah, yeah. Mayor could Dalton make a lot Kincaid of sense. Or right Both of them will be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. There's a real oh, split in the tight end community on whether it's Mayor or Kincaid is number one, so we'll find out. Yeah, that's a, that's like a matter of what you What do you like? Duality of a man. Of mayor. <laughs> no, of a man, oh, too, yeah. Well, <laughs> the pick is in, 
and huh. it is oh. Lucas Van Ness. Everybody's Let's go. Wow. Van Ness. Ooh. Okay. Right out of Iowa. So, uh, you know, Spencer? We were all wrong. Yeah. Uh, on this one? But this is this is a pick where you go, I see the potential, mm -hmm. and the track record isn't exactly there. This is somebody who, I, it wasn't exactly a full-time player at Iowa. You know, a situational player. He didn't rusher. even start. He did he not never start. Heard of the game. Yeah. He did not start. No. Just, now some of that's because Iowa plays old dudes. It's just, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just the way Iowa does things, and they really couldn't keep him off the field. But, but to me, if you're talking about edge rushers in this draft, this is the one where I go, oh, y'all speculating. Like you, you're, you're going, you're going out there on yeah. that branch. So I talked to Kirk Ferentz earlier this week, and I asked him. I was like, hey, like the biggest criticism it seems like everybody's got with Lucas is he didn't start. And he didn't, but I think a lot of people don't recognize how talented that Iowa defense actually was. Like, they still have guys on the roster right now where they're like, yo, they would have get, gotten picked tonight if they, were, if they were able to be in the draft. Deontay Craig, really great player. They felt at the beginning of the year, especially with the way the portal's working now, he, he told me he showed up early and was in the weight room and told their strength coach, we might lose this kid to the SEC. Mm. Someone so, like if he was not going to play one more year, or if he was going to play one more year of college football, they felt that someone was going to be able to take him. And because he went to the NFL, it doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. they love that growth potential with him. So we were talking about Anthony Richardson earlier being like this incredibly raw offensive player. It's not quite that limited in terms of sample size for Lucas Van Ness, but there's some elements that are similar. Never started the game in Iowa, just to expand upon the point. They've always got a bunch of veterans that Kirk Ferentz sort of pays deference to because they've been you know, such an important part of the uh, program. we got a trade here. Let's see. The Patriots. Have Wait, you have a trade? trade, 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 trade. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay. You're gone. That was extra. You want to get a little more like? Yeah, no, no, no. I don't like that. I was going backhanded. Here, we're gonna we're gonna try this one. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we didn't win, rogues. Right, Not a baby. You do it. That's how you do I it. Must be a big trade. Go big yeah. or go home. Yeah. 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 Van Ness feels like a Packers player, doesn't he? Though. Yeah. Isn't he like? <laughs> that's for later. There's Clay Matthews. Matthews type yeah. Guy. Like he looks like it seems like it's a fit with with Green Bay. Uh, do you know the details on the trade yet, Field? 14 for 17 and 120. 14 for 17 and 120? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I was marveling over the fact that there was a random banana on the set that I didn't know was over. Not random. <laughs> so, not random. Okay. No, I mean, no, not a random banana. Like mm -hmm. a, a very, very worthwhile. So I wouldn't be surprised. So the Steelers are picking here, right? Mm -hmm. Steelers are on the clock. So I wouldn't Pick be surprised 14. if they go corner. Or offensive line. They got to be going offensive line because they're moving ahead of the Jets, right? And the Jets are that sitting would make sense. That's yeah. a good point right That's there. Point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the Jets are sitting at 15 because of a pick swap, essentially, that was part of the Aaron Rodgers trade. So they moved down from 13 to 15. Now we know that the Jets presumably are in the market for an offensive lineman. The problem is for anyone that's just tuning in, Paris Johnson went very early, and then we saw Darnell Wright go, and then we saw Peter Skaronsky go. So we are seeing a run on these linemen. So if you want one, you got to get ahead of the Jets if you think the Jets are going to go there. So Broderick Jones here. Broderick maybe. Jones, yep. Yeah, Broderick, Broderick Jones. Jones. Yeah, this would make a lot of sense, yeah. yeah. 14, Steelers probably need that, right? Like, yeah. get ahead of the Jets. You, that would be, hmm. And they, they brought over Isaac uh, Samello from the Philadelphia they Eagles in right. free, uh, yep. free agency. So, they got mm -hmm. one there. They need more, though, because that has been a Achilles heel for Pittsburgh the last few years. You said it was 14 in exchange for 17 and 120, 120, right? yes. That doesn't feel like a ton of equity back to move down three spots in the first round, is it? I think at this point of the draft, that's about, I mean, you know, the, 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 the Eagles moved up one spot from 10 to 9 for a fourth next year. So a fourth okay. to move yeah, a few spots. I'd say it's... Probably it just feels like a bigger drop than I'm, I'm giving. Oh, it falls off in a, in a hurry, though, right? Yeah. Like, moving up from 5 to 4 is going to cost you a fortune. 17 to 14 is a fairly modest price. So the Steelers have moved up. We're going to presume it's for an offensive lineman. That's just me putting dots together that, you know, makes sense in my mind. Feels like Broderick is the last of the... I think it's it's got to be Broderick Jones, and this is, so let's just say it is an offensive tackle. Mm -hmm. This is where the Jets Aaron Rodgers trade, as much as a trade that includes a four-time MVP coming to your franchise and giving you stability at quarterback for the first time in like 30 years, can actually be a negative. This is the cost of that trade, right? Is that they were fearful of a team, and, and again, the Steelers could have moved ahead of them at 12 mm -hmm. too, but the price becomes more prohibitive when you're bouncing from 17 to 12 as opposed to 17 to 14. So. The, uh, the Jets here are either going to be pinched and not grab an offensive tackle, or they're going to have to examine an option that may not have quite the upside of somebody like Broderick Jones.
All right, so we'll see where this pick goes so far. Uh, you know, we've seen a run there, and this is – offensive line is supposed to be one of the deeper positions. Uh, we'll see – how that's valued as we get through not just tonight. If you're just tuning in, Field Yates, Harry Douglas, Spencer Hall, Andrew Hawkins, Harry Lyles, I'm Jason Fitz. Every single pick tonight, every single pick tomorrow, not a single commercial in the process. We got a oh. trade gong and we have bananas on set. So, you know, I'm just telling you that <laughs> things get weird. I, that, that's just the only thing we know. Haven't had to eat the banana yet. Well, that's it's still, might happen. It's still plenty. Yeah. <laughs> Will you eat it sensually for America to watch? Hold might on have now. a specific, <laughs> might have a specific Hold technique up. in mind. Match with a uh, <laughs> match with a certain draft pick who hey, has um. not been chosen yet. <laughs> All right, Roger <laughs> Goodell. Thank God was up to make fall. the pick, uh, and we will see how it goes here with the selection. There we go. There it is. Ooh. Roger mm -hmm. Jones. The Jets are not happy about that one. Yeah, yeah. they aren't, but uh, obviously the Steelers are. So, yes, uh, are. what are they getting in this? Lyles, yeah. I mean, listen, man, <laughs> easy rule of thumb for the draft. If you are coming in here not knowing a damn thing, you can't go wrong with picking somebody from Georgia. Am I right, Spencer? <laughs> well, no, and you, you can't go wrong with him because if I had to define this, and I say this, among his peer group, Broderick Jones, power belly, what, what strong hands, yeah. shirts. gigantic dude who is mean, mean, mean yep. at the point of impact, gets you out of the neighborhood with a quickness. Goodness. Yeah, I mean, just everything you want in an offensive lineman. Field, I, it, tell me, I don't think we could have made too many bad choices in, like, the first five or six offensive linemen here, but, like, no. Broderick, to me, has a particular nastiness. He, I mean, you just saw it on a couple of those plays right there. He is the most athletic of the offensive linemen in this year's draft. He is a freak. He's also the most limited in terms of experience. You guys, and Georgia is such a hard team to say, like, he wasn't even a starter for much of 2021. Yeah. Yep, yep. But he didn't start. It was a Jamari <laughs> Salyer who ended up being the Chargers left tackle for much of this past year because of the Rashawn Slater injury, but the guy basically didn't play as a redshirt freshman a year ago, takes over that starting job this year, but has less than 1,000 college snaps to his name. So there's some raw development here for Broderick Jones, but the upside is crazy. I mean, you saw him moving around there, pushing guys around like they were small children. Uh, he's got a real chance to be a longtime fixture for the Steelers. So they haven't, like, they've been doing sort of half measures along the offensive line in recent years, paying the offensive mm -hmm. line like 8 or $10 million in free agents, not the $15 million per year guy, not the first-round pick in the off offensive line. See, I like when you don't have to – tell a player or teach nastiness. Mm. Yeah. They just go out there and it's a point of emphasis for their game. That's Dude. Broderick Jones. That's how offensive linemen are supposed to be built. Yes. Nasty at the point of attack. Nasty when he's pulling. You see a little mm -hmm. corner out there, we call him piss hands. You take advantage of that little piss hands. <laughs> uh, the super anonymous big boy breakdown on Jones. Smooth mover, incredible in space, strong mitts. Great upper body torque. Get them uh, paws bear paws, you need to pause on you. Mm. So, I mean, a little high, but generally, uh, but great relative position in pass protection. Combos need work solid anchor versus pull rush. It's very rare to get players with that kind of athleticism and have that nastiness that HD is talking about. When you talk about Georgia players who haven't had a lot of starts, I equate it to like Kentucky basketball players who only played one year. It's like that's the program mm -hmm, that yeah. they're in. I mean, He's a little on the shorter end for a tackle. He's around 6'5". But to your point, with his athleticism, the, the power in his, you know, his, his grip in his hands as well as the fact that he's a nasty player makes it exciting. A lot of people had him as the second best tackle in the draft. Here's the most really underrated thing. When you're going against the defensive players that are going into the draft year in and year out and you got to practice against them every single day, yep. you're getting more meaningful reps yeah. than somebody playing in the game at another school. And HD, that's actually something that Kirby Smart talked about after their spring game. With their quarterback competition, they're like, well, these guys have more reps than others, but it's like, yo, even their second and third string guys are getting so many reps because sometimes they have a fourth unit available to them. So he's like, not only are we playing against the best mm -hmm. players, we have the most reps of anybody in the country. Um, reps, though, I mean, as Field pointed out earlier, he has the fewest number of college snaps among FBS offensive tackles in the entire draft class. This is one of those, and we, this sort of leans back to what we talked about at the beginning. More and more, you have to be able to draft for traits. Like, you're going to have to look at less film in some instances yep. and decide, do you have enough film to make it worth the risk? So, obviously, uh, this seems to play into that. And also, what is the Georgia rep worth? 
How many? How many? Yeah. You know, That's a great how many Toledo point. reps is one Georgia rep worth? Right. Five. Like, or, five the Syracuse. How much is a Syracuse rep versus the Georgia? That might rep? be one of the smartest things we've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so like, like you just market. keep repeating that the whole night because that's, <laughs> that's true. That's brilliant. It's true. Yeah. But you're right. Like, and and it speaks to what they've built, and that's why certain schools just build juggernauts, right? Like, I mean, Georgia's just. They have so many talented players. It's a really fair and valid. Oh, it's not point. stopping. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not stopping. No, I no, did no. their high school recruiting show this year in Georgia. Yeah, they're shipping them out and shipping Bring them in. in. Yeah. Uh, they, we have asked the YouTube poll what the best selection so far in the draft has been. All right, twenty nine percent said Anthony Richardson. That's good. Okay. Twenty six percent said Bijan Robinson. Yeah, yeah. Only eleven percent said Tyree Wilson. Which, uh, by the way, I forced them to put That's in the poll. So yeah. screw all of you. But uh, the people have no so far, idea what they're saying. Yeah, then, I know they just don't know. I'm sorry you don't watch ball. Uh, Jalen Carter, <laughs> by the way, leading uh, with thirty five yeah. percent of the picks. So people Hard to go think, wrong. I mean, Philly. That's just that's what Philly does, man. They just find a way to always get the best players, right? It really is a perfect like fit because with someone like Jalen Carter, with uh, again some of the things that you question mm-hmm. about his off the field. To your point, he needs a system when he gets in there as a first round pick. It's easy, and I've seen this, where you get guys who, you know, maybe feel a little entitled, and it's just given to them. That team is so talented, that's not going to be the case. He's going to have to really push to still make an impact. And then on the other side, he doesn't have the pressure of having to perform and everything hinging upon how good he plays because you're a first-round pick. But I also love that they lost Javon Hargrave to the San Francisco 49ers. But then you have the luxury of drafting a Jalen Carter that's sitting there in a lot of people, people's eyes, is the best player in this draft. Mm, yeah. Now, the Jets are on the clock. A little over two minutes ago. Makes you think possibly trade, right? I mean, they're also, but it's also the point now where every pick you get away from one becomes more and more, like, less and less predictable, right? Mm-hmm. So it's, you got to take your whole and, and 10 tougher, minutes here, right? Tell me if I'm wrong, Field. Everybody chime in. But, like, the concept, and this is what we do every year, we're like, oh, well, you should trade down. I think the Jets probably may want to trade down. But it's not as simple as, like, I want to trade down. That means yeah. somebody else has got to love somebody so much they want to trade up. So, you know, you look at the, the Jets last year who absolutely – you mentioned teams across the draft. The, the Jets obviously Whew. had a substantial haul last year in the draft. And, you know, you think about the Jets' approach, they may want to trade down, but I'm just not sure – well, we're at the point now, too, with the quarterback still on the board, you got to start making fielding calls, right? Like, is Will Levis of interest to you? Are the Commanders 16, by the way? Could be a team that they say, all right, maybe the Commanders are prepared to take him at 16. Mm-hmm. Should we go ahead and try to get somebody to jump up ahead of Washington who might be willing to pay the price, whether it's Tampa or Minnesota or any of the teams that have been speculated to have done some research on the quarterbacks in this year's class? Oh, no. Yeah, oh, you took a, a, a side. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm overjoyed, again, that we can say New York Jets are on the clock and it is not a moment of terror. This is still <laughs> new to me. I understand <laughs> last year was a renaissance. It's just a pleasant surprise, okay? I'm making a little bit of fun of you, but at the same time, All right, the Jets I'm happy just, for y'all. They're, they're, I, we have a, a shot of the Jets draft room. They're, they're drafting up. So. Oh, oh, okay. okay. Well, listen, Spencer, you mentioned chaos at the top of the show. Yeah. There could not be better chaos right now than if the Jets did the very thing that pissed off Aaron Rodgers in Green Bay, and that's draft a quarterback. Take Will Levis right here. <laughs> <laughs> do it. How about if they take a first-round wide receiver? You know I was going to say. Yeah, Aaron would, might ooh, play for free if they do that, right? I would, I would so respect. Like, look, if the Jets could just do that, Harry and I could just have chat GPT do Fitz and Harry tomorrow. Like, we would <laughs> just be like, how mad is Aaron Rodgers? And then we'll program it and let it run the whole show. We won't I mean, even yeah. do radio tomorrow. My college wide receiver coach is a scout with the Jets. I just seen him on that celebration and it looked like he was excited to get a wide receiver. Okay. okay. The, thing, the thing about that is, is if you're taking wide receiver, what I love about it is you got a shot at whichever one you thought was best. None of them are off the board. So it's not like a limited group of yeah. – like you're not working with limited ingredients. This isn't chopped where you open up the yeah. basket and you got spam. You you have get your choice of anybody in this draft. So I, I, there's a lot of strength. Which is that. why they could be celebrating like that because I don't know if they celebrate like that if you if you you know get the next tackle, which is a little bit of a drop off mm-hmm. after Jones went off the board. So, but I would say this: if they do take a wide receiver, they're going to have to figure out what they're going to do with Corey Davis because he's still there. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. You you have Garrett Wilson. You brought over Alan Lazar. You also brought over Miko Hartman. That would only lead me to believe that Corey Davis wouldn't be there if you drafted a receiver there. Yeah, yeah he suddenly tackle. becomes trade, tradable yeah. on, on day yep. two. Day I don't know, man. He's got big, I'm not sure anybody's paying Corey Davis yeah, $10 million bucks for this year. So I actually feel bad. He's kind of actually in that, that interesting spot where, like, the Jets have deemed him valuable enough to hold on. He's got right. no guaranteed money this year. So it's like, we're going to hold on to you because if we change our mind at any point, 
we can cut you. And they're going to need cap space because they just acquired Aaron Rodgers. And, mm -hmm. well, Aaron Rodgers and the Packers and the Jets all agreed to restructure his contract in a way that got him in the door with the Jets. He ain't playing for $1.165 million this season. <laughs> I'm telling you that right now. So it could be that Aaron Rodgers, uh, his, you know, they're going to have to – make some decisions on the roster, whether it's pushing money into the future or cutting somebody like they Corey They could Davis. go tight end. They Indian. could go tight end. Tight end could I mean, just give him a weapon. How yeah. happy is Aaron Rodgers going to be if he's, he has that glorious kumbaya, I love New York press conference, Dal and then he gets a Dal what? Dalton Kincaid. Dalton Kincaid. Kincaid? Oh. oh, give me a security. Oh, blanket. my Lord. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> I, like. Spencer, you just made a face that was like you heard gospel and it touched your soul. Like, okay, don't... and I say that because if they do sneak to Kincaid here, that's a nasty pick for them. Yes, and I mean nasty yeah. in the good way because Kincaid just gets open. He's mm -hmm. just one of those dudes. Yep. yep. Some, again, there's Here some divide on whether it's May or Kincaid is the top tight end. But uh, either one of them, it's this cold. is a very deep tight end class. We'll start to see a run on them at some point. Roger Goodell at the podium getting ready to introduce the pick. Hype man hanging out with him. I was going to say, I believe Kyle Stickles will be actually introducing the pick or announcing the pick. Kyle Stickles, a, a young Jets fan who has an exuberance for the team that is unmistakable, looks tremendous in his Jets green right now with the That's matching awesome. pocket square. Is he is going to take our job one day. He is a make-a-wish kid, and uh, he's got a ton of courage and hope. That much is for sure. And uh, he is getting this crowd rolling right now. Let's it. go, Kyle. And he's also got a strong fade. Like hey, the sides of that. Yeah, it was, it was good. Yeah. Like he went to a proper barber. Yeah, you don't that. see it at that at that age usually, you know. Yeah. It's gotta have a little. <laughs> no, no it's it's strong. strong. Yeah, big a lot outside. It's like half the Jets fan for the draft. You just don't see it often. <laughs> oh, <laughs> throwing it out. <laughs> Here we go. All right, Kyle's putting Kyle. the pick in for us. He's thanking you, Kyle, because he's a consummate professional. That's right. Well played. You were lying on that fade, too. He's got yeah, it's yeah, like it's good. Cut. Yeah. Here we go. Well done. Well done. Well done. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. McDonald the fourth, by the way. The fourth. The fourth. Yeah. Harry the fourth. The fourth. Well, anybody who has a Roman a Roman uh, numeral behind their name, Something. they yeah. have to be. Uh, oh, is it a Roman numeral? Yeah, Roman numeral. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. You killed me with the suffix, but you are right too. <laughs> yeah. I was trying to. No, they have to be very that. special, yeah. but. It's not a surprise that they went defense here either, though, because of the mindset of their head coach. I was going to yep. say, this is helping Robert Sala feel good about this. So back-to-back -back pass rushers for the Jets in first round. Uh, last year it was out of – so they obviously went two first-round picks, but they finished up with Jermaine Johnson the seconds, who yep. started at Georgia, finishes at Florida State. I thought he was okay this past year. Nothing that necessarily screams super-duper star yet. But when we're down on the fourth, there are a couple of Big 12 pass rushers who blew up over the past, past couple of years. McDonald's, one of them. Felix, Felix, uh, who else? Anyudeki Uzoma from Kansas State, also the other one. But Adam McDonald, one of the best. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get better as the night goes on. Uh, one of the best players at the, at the Senior Bowl this year. Had good production over the past two seasons at Iowa State. A team that obviously has played incredibly gritty defense under Matt Campbell these past handful of years. So it makes sense to me. Maybe a little richer than some people thought in terms of where he would go overall. But I like this pick for the Jets. Again, okay I'll this. say this when you say little richer. Uh, there, At this point, just, though, who knows? Yeah, who, like, who knows? At this point, I, I'm not, like, Will McDonald was going to go in the first round somewhere. So I don't think going 16th. I mean, Mel Kuyper had him at the eighth pick at one point in his mock draft, all the way to the Falcons at pick number eight overall. So it's a, uh, you know, it's kind of where it is. And again, like, it's just it's not as simple as, well, I'll move down for him either. They found somebody that they liked. I think they were looking offensive line by all indications. And if, if the – you got to look at your board, though, at some point, right? Like, if, yep. if you just don't see value anymore with what's left on the board at offensive line, but you do see value at getting somebody that, you know, maybe even in their rookie year can be a situational pass rusher for you, come in, give you some snaps. Like, you have a chance to develop them, too. So Listen, feels th th this tells me that the mindset of Robert Sala, the New York Jets, they have Aaron Rodgers as their quarterback, but they also know the other quarterbacks that they have to go against in the AFC. Mm -hmm. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna attack those quarterbacks. We're gonna we're gonna minimize them with this pass rush, elite pass rush that they have. So they added another guy. We gotta remember they still have Jermaine Johnson as well that they drafted last season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like he's gonna be going into his second year, a top five defense that I think is only gonna get better as yep. those young players grow. A guy who 
I, I trust that staff to put him in the right position, mm-hmm. but like not a dude who I think of as being disrupted by himself just due to his size. He's not, you know, he's, he's what, 236? He's around there. They'll put him in the right spot, but yep. like if you had any reservations about him, it might be like, hey, man, hit the biscuits, you know? Yeah, but the attention <laughs> yeah. that, that Quentin Williams is going to garner, <laughs> right. it's going to free, leave right. him one-on-one, and give him the opportunity to yeah. be able to, you know, Get buckets. A pr- Use the basketball term. A producer. A guy who was prolific and was always a problem wherever you put him on the I'll field. tell you, so I, th- I think the internet's probably reacting more viciously towards the Jets on this pick than we are. It seems like a lot of people are sort of saying to themselves, you really couldn't have taken a, you know, an offensive tackle here you to don't protect want to take Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, take anybody I mean, of yeah, so we'll see. I mean, the Jets did have a very, very good defense last year. So maybe the concept is just basically, hey, they're that good on defense. We really need to go that side of the ball. But... One thing I will say, and I do wonder if this is a dynamic or not. Joe Douglas did something this offseason that I'm sure he's on board with trading for Aaron Rodgers, but that was like the owner basically made it clear we're getting Aaron Rodgers, do whatever it takes, right? Joe, Joe Douglas, their GM, is a draft and develop guy. Like the idea of trading, making huge trades and free agency feels to me second and, ter- and third behind the draft. This is just a Joe Douglas, what's your board tell you? And if your board tells you Will McDonald's the best player here, Let's take the best player on your board. He's also earned a little bit of respect in this whole process. You know, some guys get benefit of the doubt. He's earned it. We just showed you, and we'll reference it again, the Washington Commanders pick is in. The Commanders have two quarterbacks on their roster, Jacoby Brissett, Sam Howell. Man. At this point, Will Levis is still on the board. Hendon Hooker is still on the board. If you're the Washington Commanders, you are in a division where you are going to be taking on Jalen Hurts for the next 16 years, Mm. right? Like, you are going to have to have a better quarterback option than they have on the roster right now. You're the commanders. You're also, you've got a very talented roster. It's skill position. You have a very talented defense. There are pieces for the commanders that you can look around and say, this team should be really good. They don't have a quarterback. So, y'all, like, this this is one of those moments where I'm just looking at it saying, Mm. common sense tells me that Will Levis is better than Sam Howell. But you talked about it earlier. Is that do you reach for a quarterback because you're the only one in the division without one? Is Will Levis that guy? When you add Will Levis and you look at Jacoby Brissett, are you like, oh, Will Levis gives us a better chance to win than Jacoby or Sam? Mm. I don't know. Well, see, that's the thing for me. When you look at the Washington Commanders, you are the only team. Yeah. In that division, yes. with a without a bona fide quarterback. So how long do you want to be behind the eight ball? Because I think if they do get a quarterback, that they feel like with, with Eric Bieniemy coming over, mm-hmm. um, and and bringing Andrew Wiley over there as a as an offensive lineman, you look at the skill position players. You look at the uh, the tight end. They have the pieces. Now you look at them defensively. Yeah. Chase Young needs to step up and live up to the hype of being drafted where he was drafted. But yep. they have major pieces. I just think the quarterback position is holding them back right now. This would be the coziest and safest spot for Levis to land. It really would. Just I, And I say that just because of Eric yep. enemy and because yep. of the low expectations, right? He's going to get good instruction yeah. in a place with really, really, really low bars to clear. The and tricky well, of course, that's going to keep it real with them, too. Right. But also, oh, yeah. if you're a new ownership <laughs> group and you want somebody that you can put up on billboards to get fans excited, quarterbacks do that. Like, yeah. love them or hate the pick tonight. If they select a quarterback tomorrow on the side of the stadium, they'll be able to put Big Will Levis signs or Hendon Hooker. Like, you've got a couple of quarterbacks that are still sitting here. So, yep. you know, it is at least interesting that we're starting to hit a few teams that could be looking like if you're Tampa Bay sitting at 19. Oh, you, you, you're sitting good right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yep. you're sitting really good. Yep. You talk yep. about quarterbacks. I can see them going corner here, too. Gonzalez. I, Gonzalez is, is, is shocking to me also, by the way. What is he doing on the board still? Are yeah. we, uh, did I Manual watch Forbes. the wrong tape or something? The inability oh, to Oh, okay, I can get on board with this one. There you go. Okay, Emmanuel Forbes is the, the pick out of Mississippi State. Uh, a corner I know you love. Oh, not the biggest of corners. The small. But when you talk about mm-hmm. six interceptions, mm-hmm. return for touchdowns, I played with a guy named Asante Samuel. Yeah. And he said one way to make money – it's not only pick it off, but take it back for it. touchdowns. Yep. A guy that's going to reroute combinations. He's going to take chances. You talk about another corner in the NFL right now that takes chances, Trayvon Diggs. I can live with my corner getting beat every now and then because I know he's going to get the ball back to my offense frequently. Yep. I mean, when you have a corner with that kind of ball skills, yeah, right, 14. you're always a threat. 14 picks yep. 14 in his picks career. In I think in high school he also took seven interceptions back. So this guy is a ball hawk, obviously natural ball skills. 
He does weigh 166 pounds. Was, and it seems like he didn't gain a single pound no. through his whole college career. <laughs> that is something to think about and, and have a conversation about. Can I also throw in a, on the, above me on the interception numbers? 16 passes defended last year. 35 in his career. Just mm -hmm. somebody that is always around. And we talked about this today on, on the radio show. Like, sometimes they say, well, he's super aggressive. To me, that just means, like, hey, you got good instincts. B, you watch enough that you know what's coming. C, you're in the right place at the right time. That's not accidental. Like, Give that's me not somebody that who's going to take chances yeah. versus somebody who's going to sit back and be scared to take those chances. It would be one thing if he was aggressive and he didn't have 14 picks in the last right. three yeah. years. Yeah. Right. 166 yeah. pounds. That's the big thing on Emmanuel Forbes is he is – thinner than I am, which is not necessarily a good thing. But he is as confident a cornerback as there is in this year's mm -hmm. draft. Uh, he is sticky in man coverage. The guy is fearless. Got to see if he can hold up in the NFL. The Patriots pick is in, but I will quickly remind you that means Forbes is the second corner off the board. Yeah. Again, I, I don't Christian know what I'm missing Gonzalez. on Christian Gonzalez, no. but I can see that. wherever Christian Gonzalez goes, now becomes the value play. We were talking about Jalen yep. Carter a minute yep. ago. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. New bar, Christian Gonzalez becomes the value. Also, we're playing mad and we're running power sweep against him, right? Like, that's first. We're, we're, we're <laughs> the game I mean, he's 166, but he brings all 166. Mm, I mean, let's put 315 on him. On a, you know. eh, I'm not oh. scared. Oh, you know. <laughs> and wow. Speaking of Christian Gonzalez, he now goes off the board. The Patriots run to the podium to yep. take the corner out of Oregon that many thought was the best corner in this draft. Some thought was the second best corner behind Devin Witherspoon. Christian Gonzalez out of Oregon becomes the, the third corner off the board, and the Patriots get what feels like a steal. My mic might have been off there for a second. My apologies. Uh, purest cover corner in the draft. Unbelievable athlete. This guy is smooth as butter. Began his college career at Colorado. Transfers prior to last season. And the big knock on Christian Gonzalez was didn't have any interceptions. Goes to Oregon, and what does he do? Just intercepts passes left and right. And we're talking about Emmanuel Forbes and his return skills. This guy, you can see it. When he has the ball in his hands, he's thinking touchdown as well. He's got incredible bloodlines in his family. He comes from a family of sprinters. He's not quite as fast as his sister, who is the wife of quarterback David Blau of the Arizona Cardinals. But you guys may remember a few years ago when Blau was with the Lions, he was cheering on his wife mm -hmm. as a sprinter. This is the family that, he, that Christian Gonzalez comes from. I'm, I don't know how he's at 17, but geez. What, what I like about this pick for the Patriots is you look at their history from the cornerback position all the way back from Ta uh, Ty Law, Aqib Tlaib, J.C. Jackson, Darrell Revis. Bill Belichick is going to have a guy that he feels like can shut down one half of the man, field. Man. Yep. And then you had a guy in Marcus Jones last year who really showed up and played a, a, a great brand of football along with the rest of that secondary. So a, a very valuable pick for the New England Patriots and also a Bill Belichick that loves his secondary players. This feels like one of those picks where by like week six, seven, eight of next season, we're going to be like, why did oh, all these teams let them do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Like oh. this feels like that type of player. I, it I feels really... like in previous years too, the Patriots, they'd always get like players who are like, damn, how did they end up at that spot yeah. for the Patriots? Yep. But this is the rare one where it's like, that's their biggest need too. Yep. Yep. The biggest thing they didn't have in their roster right now is size at cornerback. You guys talked about like the tiny guys, right? Marcus Jones is 5'9", and Jack Jones they drafted last year is 5'10". Dude, 6'1", 6'2", almost. Like, you have a division with Stephon Diggs and Garrett Wilson and Tyreek Hill. Hello. Here's what showed up I'm on film, though. He is not a willing tackler. And I don't know how that's going to suit over well with Bill Belichick. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you, if you don't like to do it, you might better learn how to do it. Mm, that right. might be a coaching point. But one thing we talked about, you know, even before the show started, where, you know, I asked Field the difference between Witherspoon and Gonzalez, feeling like, you know, that might be the Raiders pick. Field pointed out, you know, you want somebody, you take it on speed, you want somebody like Gonzalez. Like, he, he I had them interchangeable, that. sort of like grades are concerned. These are like pretty similar, and they go, what, 12 spots apart? So, yeah. good. I mean, I love, I have no issue with Witherspoon and five. That's a good value there for the Patriots who need to get a, need to nail a draft, that's for sure. By the way, the Lions are back on the clock. So, the Lions, who we weren't sure what they were going to do. At the beginning of the draft at six, traded down instead to 12, where they take running back Jameer Gibbs. And what has so far been maybe the, the surprise, I would say, for many of us of the first round of the draft. And now they are back on the clock at 18. Will Levis available, Nolan Smith available, Zay Flowers, Jackson Smith, and Jigby. You have to wonder after Jamison Williams being suspended 
uh, the, for six games this year as part of several players suspended for gambling while on team premises. You have to wonder what they're looking at there. And I know the shine of Jackson Smith and Jigba kind of wore off this season because he was hurt and we did not see him. But I would remind you that that dude was an absolute problem, especially after that Rose Bowl, we saw them play against Utah, how dominant he was, and he's still that player. All right, so we're going to have Harry Douglas and Field Yates talk to Kimberly A. Martin extraordinaire. Guys, what's going on? Uh, first of all, great to have Kimberly A. Martin joining us. And, Kimberly, I'll let the record show that of the two of us that are going to be interviewing you, one of us is wearing Jordans, and it's not that guy who's got more drip in his pinky than I do in my entire body. Woo! Well, let's talk about the Colts, that you, the team that you are covering right now, Kimberly, the queen of Jordans. Uh, Kimberly, the Colts, I don't know about surprise because Anthony Richardson was projected to go pretty high in this draft, but there was so much steam during the pre-draft yeah. process connecting Will Levis to the Colts. Based off what you've heard so far, why is Anthony Richardson the pick for Indianapolis number four overall? Well, I think ultimately, Field, it really is the fact that his traits are so rare. Yes, he's young. Yes, he's inexperienced. Yes, he only has 13 collegiate starts, right? But when you watch him on film, when you watch him in the pocket, that's what impressed the Colts. They said that guy is specially big, athletic. But they also talked about his poise. When he's pressured, he showed poise. He was still able to make those electric throws that are so dynamic. And that's what this team needs. Now, it's funny. They looked at a lot of quarterbacks, including Will Levis, obviously CJ and Bryce. But they decided to stay pat, stand pat at four because they thought they could still get a talented guy. But their interest in Richardson dated back to August. At a Florida practice, senior exec Marie, Morocco Brown was actually there and texted Chris Ballard, their GM, and said, you will not believe the show I'm watching right now. So as much as they were watching a lot of these other quarterbacks, Richardson piqued their interest very early on. So, Kmar, I got to ask you about the mood around that building because you can't help but think about what Jalen Hurts mm -hmm. was able to do in Shane Steichen's system last year with Philadelphia Eagles. Also, you look at Justin Herbert and what he was able to do when he was in mm -hmm. uh, L.A. coaching him. Jim Bob Cooter was with Trevor Lawrence. Yep. What's the entire mood around Indy at this moment right now about Anthony Richardson? Okay. Well, I can tell you. I literally, can hear they had the VIP draft party behind me. And when that name was announced, Anthony Richardson, huge cheers. Everybody here in this building, and I'm sure in their draft room, screaming because they know that they have a bona fide star on their hands who is raw. But when you think about the ceiling, they could end up with a guy who has the, one of the highest ceilings of this entire class. So everybody in this building, very high on Anthony Richardson. All right, Kimberly, so let's talk about the Colts' uh, outlook going forward here because Anthony Richardson is a player that some in the draft community felt like maybe needs a year of seasoning. Gardner Minshew signed to a contract this offseason, just a one-year deal, though. Initial instinct that you got from the Colts' brass, was it that, like, the plan is to play him right away, or has, has there been any suggestion that maybe this is going to be a wait-and-see with Anthony Richardson? Okay, so I know we have, I'm not a draft expert. I know it leaves yes, that to are. Todd McShay and Mel Kuyper. You're, you're but when I sat Carmel. down with Chris Ballard this week, he said, when I'm looking at a guy in this draft class, what I want is somebody who's going to work. He does not have to be Superman. And something about him saying Superman made me think, I wonder if Anthony Richardson could actually be the guy. Now, he is raw. Chris Ballard did say he is big, athletic, needs some time. So they have – got to give him room to grow. But here's what's great about Shane Steichen. He's worked with different types of quarterbacks. The Colts were not married to one style. So the, the, the plan is to move him along, help him develop, so that who knows – Maybe he could be their week one starter, but it all depends on how things go. But even if he's not, we will be seeing Anthony Richardson on the field sooner than later. Kimberly, great stuff as always. Enjoy the rest of the draft. I know uh, we're going to see you all over the country covering OTAs and I'm sure around Florham Park to cover the Aaron Rodgers Jets. Plenty. Kimberly Martin, the greatest. Back to you, Fitz. All right, guys. Uh, beautiful job by you as always. The Lions pick is in, uh, and Lions fans are rejoicing. Okay. I was hoping you guys would take like another minute and a half there because I'm trying to, to go out in there. And uh, I was trying to buy myself a jersey, but, you know, didn't have enough time yet. That's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'll wait till 
Tyree picks this. You handle your personal no. business on your personal well, time. I, mean, I had a second there. I like, but you know, I was, I was just don't blame me for you know, figuring it. ship's free right now. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> the Lions pick is in. We'll see. Remember, Jameer Gibbs was their first pick in this draft, and uh, Chris Cologne, our Lions fan producer, uh, was a little dumbfounded. We'll see how he feels about this one based on the way he communicates in our ears for the rest of the show. The next pick. <laughs> okay. Jack Campbell Dang. out of Iowa. You Dang just Campbell's said, okay. Uh, all right. Yep. This is the most Lions pick of all time. Yep. 100%. <laughs> Throw away where, where it took place and, like, yep. the, the positional value in the first round, number 18 overall. Jack Campbell, who – no relation to Dan Campbell – is such a Lions player. I mean, like, this team embodies their coaching staff, right? Dan Campbell, who's built of grit. Aaron Glenn, their defensive coordinator, one of my favorite coaches in the entire NFL, like, would legit give them 25 snaps this year if they asked him to. They want players who will beat the crap out of you on defense. And Jack Campbell is going to beat the crap out of you on defense. Linebacker was a need for the Lions. He was the buckets winner, as you saw just a moment ago, that's given away to the best linebacker in the country. The first ever Iowa linebacker to win that very prestigious award. And this dude is all out all the time, Harry. He is, and I talked to Kirk Ferentz about him as well. And when he was just trying to describe the way that he approaches the game, he kind of paused for a second and he goes, you know, Harry, he takes the game as about as serious as a heart attack. Like, it, it means that that much to him. That You mentioned it, the Campbell Trophy, the academic Heisman. And I sort of asked him, I was like, hey, among the players that you've coached over the years, because he's been there forever, obviously, I'm like, where does he sort of rank for you? And he said, hey, he's, this dude's at the top. Like, you cannot question his love for the game, his work ethic, the way that he plays. This is absolutely a guy, to your point, Phil, when you said this is a guy that Dan Campbell is going to love, this is the prototypical type of player that he would draft. You literally could not draw a better one up. So that's two players now from Iowa that have gone in the first round defensively. Mm -hmm. Watching Iowa, because we all watch a lot of college football, one of the things I think they never lacked was defense. Mm -hmm. It was more so their offense. And then when mm -hmm. you look at them on the offensive side of the ball, they're going to always produce offensive linemen and tight ends in the National Football League. But defensively, and they also have another corner over there. They have a corner in, in Riley, Riley Moss, Moss. Yep. who's going to get drafted at some point. So – Defensively, Iowa has been where it's at uh, the last few years. Jack Campbell, by the way, from ESPN.com. Matt Miller's NFL comp, Leighton Van Der Esch, just to give people a little bit of insight there. And also, we put up a poll in uh, the YouTube chat asking people to grade the Lions draft thus far. I bet they're not happy right now. Chris Cologne decided what the grades would be. He did not even give them the option of an A. He <laughs> gave them a B, C, D, or WTF. I'm in okay. a, uh, I played... 44% on the WTF. I'm in 40... a fantasy football league of made up of people from the state of Michigan and then me. Um, so I don't have as m nearly as much skin in the game here. This is nine unhappy gentlemen right now. They are lighting <laughs> up this group chat with um, things that don't necessarily um, align with an A grade. So I get why Chris made the decision to go B, C, D. Yeah. But uh, it was a need, though. Linebacker was a need well, for the Detroit Lions. Also, too, uh, I'd say he, he got a ton of production yep. and, a, and a ton of disruption from a scheme that is and, – and, and this is no insult, pretty simple – they, they, not a lot of bells and whistles, yep. not a lot of scheming to put him in a position to go ahead and get – nope, just good play recognition, great fundamentals. I don't want to put him in – get ball. I don't want to put him in the grit – and I don't want to put him in the grit corner, grit. right? I don't want to be like, <laughs> this is a guy who brings grit. No, this is a good athlete. Like, no, he's a great yeah. athlete. Yeah. Great athlete with superb football recognition. Yeah. Like, it's just a solid ad. I know you all aren't going to be happy. I know it's not spectacular. But it's real good. I mean, this is the point where, as a fan, all you can do is trust your team's board. I keep saying it. I don't think – like, some years you can trade down. I don't think that was an option this year. The Buccaneers the way, are on the clock now. The Buccaneers pick uh -oh. is in. Let's remember that the Buccaneers basically have – do they Will even Levis? have a quarterback? Like Will Levis? It's got to be Will, Will Levis. Levis. Yeah. It's free falling, right? Like Kyle Trask. Or Hendon Hooker. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Kyle Trask. The Kyle Trask era is – Ready to begin uh, in Tampa Bay, and I managed to say that without laughing. Don't, so, te don't tease me. <laughs> and Kaliza Kansi. That's wow, not Kaliza Kansi. Okay. Okay. Well, 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 head coach. Okay, I, like this is, I know uh, the Kaliza Kansi. Uh, a lot of people are really hot on this one. What'd you just say, Hawk? I like it. All right, like it. I like it. I like it a lot. I think this is like the. You know, Aaron Aaron Donald. I mean, obviously he gets a lot of comparisons mm -hmm. to him for a lot of reasons, but he really does have that going. And when you look at the knock of his size, it's the same weaknesses that people listed from Aaron Donald. And, Lyles, I know you've been hot on this one. Yeah, and I spoke with Pat Narduzzi earlier today, and he was like, hey, like, this guy has a chip on his shoulder, and he plays like you mentioned the size in comparison to Aaron mm -hmm. Donald. He went to Miami Northwestern, did not get an offer from any of the three Florida schools. 
this guy plays like he has something to prove. And that pit defensive line was really good. Deslin Alexander is a name you'll probably end up hearing on day three. That's also going to get called. But this guy right here is an absolute problem, and he made it known on every Saturday. No doubt about it. Here are my notes. Explosive, has a series of pass rush moves, very, very high motor, first unanimous All-American since Aaron Donald. Other than I would his love to be height, in that category. he didn't mm -hmm. do one thing wrong in the pre-draft process, and that includes his college career. Not yep. a single mm -hmm. thing wrong other than being 6'1". Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he was 6'3", and 200, 315 pounds, and had the same skill set and production, he would have been gone, I don't know, 15 picks earlier. Yep. That's how incredible he was at Pitt. I mean, he was a game wrecker for a team that, I'm sure Harry can tell you, like, two years ago they could play offense. Last year they were tired from offense. Yep. So, right? Mm -hmm. Kenny Pickett obviously went to the NFL, but, like, this team had to win games by field goals and defense last year, and Kalaja Kanchi actually helped them stay fairly competitive for chunks of last season. He's a game wrecker on most of the interior, and the Bucks had a lot of needs. They're interesting, or they're in this unique phase, has some shades of what I was discussing earlier with Tampa, oh, Tennessee. You don't quite know. Are they rebuilding? Are they retooling? What are they doing? This one, to me, feels like a perfect value based off of his skill set. A guy whose use of his hands is just bewildering for an offensive yep. lineman, right? Like, a guy who is disruptive super quick like very tasmanian devilish at the point of attack yeah just just not anybody who it's fun to face look it, it, all of this stuff chasing down skill players in the backfield it is ridiculous what he is capable of yep mm -hmm. i like this young core that they're building for this defensive line you talk about vita vea um logan hall who they took from Second houston last, last year, year. Yep. Mm -hmm. also um joe tryon shalinka Yep. Mm -hmm. All, all Washington those guys, Washington. man, are going to be a force to be reckoned with in some years. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Kansi, he's not as strong as an Aaron Donald, mm -hmm. but he probably has more wiggle, right? And, yep. and, and on the, even on the low side, if he is a poor man's Aaron Donald, you still net out really, really good, well, right? Yeah. And Harry's pointed out a couple of times when we've <laughs> talked about him, like, well, sometimes we forget how hard it is to put up sack numbers from the interior defensive line, <laughs> yep. and yes. he's done that, right? Yep. Like, that just speaks to disruptiveness, right? That, that, mm -hmm. that's, and if you're Tampa Bay, again, how many times are going to echo this? Just because you need a quarterback doesn't mean you take one. If you're Tampa Bay and you don't know where you are right now as a franchise, what you need to get out of the first round is somebody that will make your team, as stupid as it sounds, like we focus, we being the media, we focus so much on quarterbacks with every team. I still look at a team like San Francisco and say, you know what they did really well? They said, we don't give a damn. We're going to build the best team possible. And then when they took a risk at the quarterback position and it turned out it didn't pay off, that's okay because they built a good roster. Like sometimes there's just – Patience is a virtue when it comes to, like, I'm going to build the whole pizza, not just the top. Mm -hmm. Well, here, here's the thing for me when it comes to Will Levis, because he's still I'm on the hungry. board. Hungry. <laughs> when, <laughs> when you look at the Colts who decided to go with Anthony Richardson, you look at the Seahawks who chose uh, Witherspoon, you also look at the Raiders who took Tyree Wilson, there are Tennessee who took Skaronsky, there are a lot of teams, Tampa who just took, you know, Kansas. There are a lot of teams who need a quarterback that are passing right now on Will Levis. Now, Seattle's on the clock now. They have an opportunity to do it now, mm -hmm. but they might go defense with yeah. this pick. Mm -hmm. I mean, Seattle is back on the clock, and you mentioned it. Seattle picked Devin Witherspoon, right? So, yeah. yep. Seattle went aggressively at the fifth overall pick mm -hmm. at the top corner in the draft, according to many. So, they, they the solidified way, what they're doing. So, someone needs to crack this code. We probably have another, I don't know, a couple hour and a half or so left in this broadcast. Pete Carroll does these draft clues every year on Twitter. Yeah. He does not tweet much between the drafts, but he does go heavy during the draft for these draft clues. If somebody can crack the code and make sense of how that draft clue set that he sent out earlier suggested Christian, uh, excuse me, Devin Witherspoon, please let me know because I haven't figured out <laughs> what at all they mean. Alfred, you, I mean, you like the Seahawks. That's your squad. He'll be able to figure it out. Nope. Sorry, one of our, our bosses is sitting over there, and he's a <laughs> Seahawks fan. I, so I, can, I can decode part of the Pete Carroll cipher, and it's this. Uh, who is the nastiest player? Who is the nastiest player currently on the board who's remotely right like a position of need for them? Nastiest the player. The nastiest. Who's the nastiest edge? Nastiest edge to LeMail. With a slight man. element of risk. Nolan Smith? Nolan Smith. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Then, is he nasty, nasty though? Yeah. He's just he's a he's nasty fast. athlete, right? I mean, yeah. when yeah. I'm looking at who Miles he, Murphy? Our, our best available, according to ESPN.com, Will Levis. Dalton Kincaid, Nolan Smith, Jackson Smith and Jigba, Michael Mayer, Zay Flowers, yeah. Joey Porter Jr., Miles Murphy. I'll give you one. Mozzie Smith, defensive tackle from Michigan. If they had, you know, he's he's uh, he's got some nasty. And then Steve Avila, the offensive lineman from TCU, to me would be a uh, would be a, a nasty offensive lineman for sure. 
Um, but every time I look up, that's what I see Pete Carroll drafting. Is he's just going to take uh, the most dog per square unit of human he can find. He literally has that dog mm -hmm. in him. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, they are on the clock with about a minute and 30. And I think this is likely, as we keep projecting, going to be a trend throughout the course of the last hour of the draft. Teams are looking to move around, so they're going to use as much of the time as possible. I feel for Will Levis mean, right now, the, the broadcast is showing him what. I was just talking about how uh, Pete does not tweet much between drafts. I got a very good friend, one of my best friends in the world, who tweets like 30, well, there are 32 picks typically in the first round. So he probably mm -hmm. tweets about 35 times over the total course of the year. 32 are dedicated to the yeah. NFL draft. He <laughs> tweets a breakdown of every pick of the first round. Chris Morris, I love you, man, if you're watching this right now. <laughs> He pours his heart and soul into it. And I love the fact that 90% of his tweets are dedicated to this night. One of them just came across my timeline, and I'm like, let's go. All right. He's into it. He's the Mel Kuyper of uh, the town that I grew up in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, the Seahawks got less than a minute to go on the clock. Uh, start to, you know, maybe they just uh, – Maybe they just wait, you know, just skip the pick. That's where we are. No, they're not going to skip the pick. Crazy for them to go quarterback? I mean, they, no, you know, no, no, I don't think no. so. The because they, they could have they the went they there can. at five. Yep. Yeah. They could have went there at five. So it wouldn't be a surprise. It wouldn't be a surprise to me if it was Hendon Hooker. Right. Ooh. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Hooker pick over Will Levis. We got to get a wide receiver off the board at some point. Yeah. You do. Yeah. I mean, that, but, but Seattle taking a wide receiver just seems. Like, that would be unfair, right? It would be unfair, but I don't think it would be unfair. A lot of life is unfair. The Seahawks got Jalen Carter earlier, and that wasn't fair. Baby. <laughs> the Chiefs probably grabbed, like, I don't know. They'll probably fall to the Chiefs what's going to happen. Jack Smith and Jim will go to the Chiefs. Receiver you know? off the board. Oh. One of these clues is 100% a quarterback. So. Okay. Oh, okay. The pick is in. Mm. And, and you, you feel like you've deciphered one of the clues? Do you know which one it is? Um, I do not know which one it is, but I'm pretty sure that one of these is a quarterback. Might be a red herring. Pete's Wiley. Okay. Pete, okay. Wiley Coyote, also known as Pete Carroll, uh, yes. as we get you through all of the draft. Field Yates, Harry Douglas, Spencer Hall, Andrew Hawkins, Harry Lyles. I'm Jason Fitz. Every single pick is going to be there. We have no commercials. We are just giving you all of the chaos as it goes down. And we will also here, be here for every pick tomorrow night, too. So. Uh, things will not stop I'm going to be here on, on Saturday for rounds four through seven. Are you guys joining me or no? Well, uh, just, think, just to hang out? Like, yeah, just like I'm live stream? Yeah, bring you know? my daughter. Bring my daughter to work. Okay, that's I good. Can it. I bring Annabelle? Like, you bring your daughter, I'll bring my dog? Yeah, totally. Why not? I mean, I don't see anybody stopping that, right? <laughs> if I can wear sweatpants, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> Baby Kinley, right? Kinley. 15 months old, man. She feels my got a sex. second one. Uh, Another to... one coming soon, too. Gives him thoughts. So me, me, and, me and Phil was doing uh, Sunday radio. Yeah. Yes, uh, primetime radio Sundays. Uh -huh. His daughter wasn't even born yet. So, like, time really, really flies, fly, Phil. It does, man. And that, the, the, I think the first thing I did in my return to ESPN after a little paternity leave was the radio show with her asleep on my chest. Yep. Which, oh, man. You forget about the fact that babies, when they're newborns, can sleep through anything, including their I, annoying mm -hmm. fathers on the radio. I could beat that. We did Operation Football on Sundays in 2017. You didn't have a wife or kids. That's then. a good point. And now yeah. <laughs> I come We're back. Not, what the heck? Oh, man. Yeah, watch that transition from man to zone, though. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> watch that. I'm already nervous. I'm not revealing what's in that, that ginger ale bottle there. <laughs> all right, Roger Goodell has gone to the podium. The Seahawks pick is in. They used all 10 minutes. Thanks, Seattle. And we're going to figure out what direction they're going. Another cool presentation Woo! moment. Yep. This is part of the experience of the NFL draft, and I say this to people all the time. If you have the chance to go see a draft in a city, go do it. It is one of the coolest experiences as a, as a fan that you can have. Uh, just the, the party atmosphere, the yep. fan, sort of the vibe from everybody, the displays and the things you can see and the things you can do, but even to draft night. They find a way when you're there to make draft night feel incredibly special. Kansas City obviously hyped tonight. Detroit will be hyped next year, I am sure. The Seahawks pick is in it is being announced as we speak and jackson is, smith and the jigba okay. Right. okay we have what? our first wide receiver off the board jackson smith and jigba let's go to one of our wide receivers uh, hawk harry what do you guys think i i i love them i love them um his three cone and i, and I mentioned this to, to hawk earlier really matches up with the way he separates from defenders in his route running reliable you talk about a guy in a rose bowl who went for over 300 yards 
He was in a group with other the two other guys who were drafted in the first round. One of those guys won NFL Rookie of the Year last year offensively. So that lets you know about his game. But I think I don't want people to get misconstrued because he only played in the slot. Because you look at Justin Jefferson, who was able to line up outside for the Minnesota Vikings this season. But I do want to see him in that role in the National Football League. Spencer, what do you think? It, to me, like, it, even if you took out the Rose Bowl, where he was going up against a running back, playing corner, Micah Bernard, bless his heart, <laughs> did his best. <laughs> to me, the thing that when I talk with people about him, it's the polish, the polish that you get out of his route running. Yes. Even if he isn't the kind of guy who is necessarily as physically dominant one-on-one, uh, it, to me, it's all of the complete element that you get with a professional you already have it with him. It will only become more polished in the NFL. Field, what do you think? Uh, first of all, Jackson Smith and Jigba going to 20 is crazy. The Seahawks wide receiver trio is absolutely insane. Five and 20. John Schneider, you are just flexing tonight with two incredible picks. Two of my favorite players in the draft with Devin Witherspoon and Jackson Smith and Jigba. And you know what's better than hearing my thoughts? Hearing thoughts of my good buddy, Jeff Darlington, who happens to be in Seattle right now. And, Jeff, a lot of us were thinking prior to this draft at five, maybe Jalen Carter, maybe a quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks. Instead, they take a cornerback. What has been your reaction? What has been the reaction, I should say, from what you've been able to gather in the past hour or so since the Seahawks made their first pick? Surprise for sure, Field. Uh, and a great show so far, by the way. I I'd say oh, a guy. At, 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 yeah, I mean, you know, that's what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, I, I'd say at that fifth overall spot, uh, I, I, what I'd be really curious if we get, got some truth serum in John Schneider, if he would have taken Anthony Richardson at five if he did not go uh, before him to the Colts. Uh, that, to me, is really – they had done a lot of homework on Richardson coming into this, but they also had done a lot of homework on Jalen Carter, and it really did feel like one of those two guys would go at that five spot. So I was somewhat surprised by – their pick, but as you said, I mean, top cornerback on the board. Um, and John Schneider is so good at being disciplined about value versus need. Not a guy who's going to say, yes, we obviously need someone up front like Jalen Carter. Uh, instead says, I'm going to take the best guy there. And cl very clearly, that's who Schneider uh, believed in. So, yeah, slight surprise, but I don't think with Snyder that we should ever be totally surprised. That's a good point, Jeff, and I did think that the last pick the Seahawks made struck me as sort of a value play with Jackson Smith and Jigba. Would you have assessed wide receiver as one of the team's yeah. bigger needs coming into tonight? No. I mean, I heard a few. We were talking about it a little bit ago, and I heard some people kind of throw the wide receiver spot out there as like – not as much as like a crazy need, but as something that they could see the depth there. But this is more than just depth at the wide receiver position. This is a true dynamic playmaker. But at the same time, you got to think that Schneider's sitting there saying, I mean, this position has become so expensive over the years. And now suddenly we can get, that's one thing Snyder loves about the quarterback spot. Like I thought that he would take quarterback potentially to sort of reset that pay scale and get the cheaper guy in there. In this scenario, you do that with the wide receiver spot. And we've seen, by the way, this music that's playing in the background yes. are is you absolutely in a, incredible. I mean, are you like in an elevator down, lounge yeah. right now and not the Seahawks that's practice not me. facility? That's not me. That's on you. That is on you. You just had your iPhone in, that, your, in, your, in your coat pocket and you decided to just get a roll. Was that, your, that was no, your that music. Was, was that was not? And it was really good. <laughs> that was your music. But this is the best part. <laughs> Yeah, so good. So Jeff and I do. I, I couldn't not address that. I, Jeff, but then I was like, am I just curious? This is the producer trolling you, Jeff. Jeff and I do fantasy football now on Sundays together during the NFL season. And Jeff is always doing his report. Like when the Bucks blow their, they like, you know, fire the cannon. Yeah. Or like the Cowboys cheerleaders are dancing behind you. Or like, you know, the Eagles PA guy is announcing Correct. all the players for their intros. Uh, so you are prepared for anything during a live shot. Uh, this one was, I mean, I felt like I was, I didn't know if he was being pushed off the stage, like in the, <laughs> the, the award show where they start to play the music. Yeah, Jeff, I was like, I thought I was getting some up. reasonable information here. Well, here's the beauty of our show. We have no yeah. commercials. We're on the air until the end mm -hmm. of the first round. That's what round. I was gonna so say, you know, commercials? Going yeah. Like, I'm not even getting pushed off by, you know, uh, like, uh, Greeny's not yeah. telling me I, I got a rap. I know, this is, oh, here's, I'm just gonna you, stand you, no time. You can, yeah, just keep going for the rest of your, for the rest of your night. <laughs> it's only, what, 7.30 out there? Last thing I'll say here, Jeff, unless I'll ask, I should say, is somewhat a demand, not a request, and somewhat of a question. Uh, we have been talking about Pete yeah. Carroll's draft clues, and I have literally, yeah. in the years of him doing it, never been able no to idea. decipher what the clues mean 
in respect to the picks they actually make. Can you try to gather some insight about that over the next, I don't know, a few what hours was, here? Today was like a Netflix trailer, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was like a Love is Blind season there, four. Like, Great show, by the way. Yeah. I have uh, no idea you, what it has to do with Devin Let me tell you, though, Pete Carroll uh, – is such an interesting guy. He was he, before the draft started a couple hours before. He was like shooting hoops, and then I saw him over here behind me on this practice field with a pitching wedge, <laughs> just chipping balls around, working on his short game. Did you get some, <laughs> a, get some swings in? You're a good golfer. You should go go line him up with him. I wanted to. Oh man, this Believe sounds me. like uh, I mean, man, that sounds yeah. way more fun than most. How gonna... most head coaches and GMs are probably spending their day on night one of the NFL draft. Jeff, you're 100%. the best. Music on the outro. We'll talk to you again soon, man. Enjoy the rest of the weekend out there. <laughs> Got it. Okay. That's really nice. Look, I got to tell you about the pick, but keep the music going because oh. while Field was being professional, we were all just doing this. The whole table was going like this. And Field was never swayed. That's right. The pick is in. And with the 22nd pick, 21st pick in the 2023 NFL Draft. Quentin Johnson. Oh. TC2. Wow. Mm. Another wide receiver goes okay. off the board. Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. we're, now we're getting, we're getting into him. Man, Quentin Johnson goes, uh, 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 he's a little different than you guys. He's actually big. Oh! Paul, oh, what do you think? <laughs> I think he is the same because he went to the NFL. But. Oh. Hey. Johnson. I love him because he's one of the bigger bodies that were like at the top of the rankings for receivers in this draft class. But the way he moves, he has quickness, he has suddenness, he's in and out of breaks. I think he's probably one of the most well-rounded receivers here because he does have that size, but he can do all the other things really, really well. And, you know, obviously you pair him up with Justin Herbert and fireworks are going to happen, right? you got to continue to give Herbert the weapons to really get the most out of him and the skill set that he has. Yeah, I think for a guy his size, he does a tremendous job at the top of route, sinking yes. his hips and getting in and out of his breaks. We've seen in the semifinals game against Michigan, he could take a five or six yard shallow route and take it a distance and run away from defenders. Mm -hmm. I think the one thing, if I had to say he needs to work on, being that size, being long, having those long arms, extend a little bit more and catch the ball away from your body. But that's something that I think just come natural uh, in practice. In the National Football League, you're gonna have to do that and actually stay away from defenders. But are we, I, I, I like are, are we concerned about the drops? Or is that just, or is that just a technique I think, thing? I think it's concentration, right? Yeah. Looking the ball in before yep. you run with it. You, you know, in college, you're trying to make every play. You're trying to be a hero for your team. So sometimes you're, you're not getting your eyes to every catch. I think just it's as simple as that. Because I like it. Yeah. Like, I, I love Quentin Johnson as a player. I love the impact he has on a defense. I think he's disruptive. I think this is one of my favorite draft strategies, which is keep it simple, stupid. Uh, we got a great quarterback. We need to stretch the field. Let's get us a big old target. You also, you mentioned you have a great quarterback. Let's acknowledge the fact that you have a great quarterback that's about to get wildly paid. So you need to start to continually yep. restock coffers with guys that are going to be a, essentially cheap labor. Yeah, like you're yeah. going to have to, to prioritize who you can resign, who you can't resign after he gets $50 million a year plus. They've also got a uh, big decision coming. Well, I think the decision's already been made on Keenan Allen. Yep. Uh, Keenan Allen, they kicked the Canada's contract, and he's got like a $40 million cap hit next year. Not 2023, but 2024, which – it's, it's unsustainable to have many players on a $40 million cap it that aren't quarterbacks, especially a wide receiver on the wrong side of 30. This looks like a succession, succession pick in some ways. And I know the other thing that you have to account for when you have the Chargers, uh, when you have the Chargers, is injuries, right? Keenan Allen's an amazing player, but yeah. he is often injured. Quinton Johnston, a player that can help offset that loss a little bit. I thought this was a little bit of a big receiver that ton, tended to play small sometimes. You guys mm. talking about the drops right there? Look at every reception that we show here. I bet every time the ball will fall right into his chest as opposed to him plucking and snatching. Maybe that play is a better example of what we're looking for. But um, I thought Zay Flowers was a small receiver that played big, and Quinton Johnson was a big receiver that played small sometimes. Doesn't mean he's not a really good player. He was awesome after the catch last season. That Kansas game was like, Talk about a draft oh, resume. Yes. Just go watch yep. that game in Lawrence, which mm -hmm. that was a huge yep. game. That was Kansas' first time ever hosting game day. Like yep. It was a massive stakes game, and he was the best player on the field in a really high-scoring game. I, there's, go ahead. I was going to say, his, like H, you mentioned it, his ball finishing skills could be better. His route running could be a little bit more crisp. But the benefit of his game and his body type, as you mentioned, is he was able to combat those, and it kind of didn't matter because he is such a big, physical, imposing wide receiver. But mm -hmm. the things that he needs to improve on are things that he, they can easily be fixed. And, and just go back to the college football playoff game. You mentioned it when we talked about him the first time. Like, Everybody knew he was getting the ball, yeah, and yeah. nobody could stop it. Like, I, I think as much as you can look at some of the things at TCU this year and say it was a really plucky, good story in college football, right? Like, to see them come out and do what they do. 
When it came time for the playoffs and everybody knew in the semifinal that he was going to get the ball, he was still able to be a substantial difference maker. That, that speaks when you're starting to look at guys and the way they separate and guys and, and, and what they contribute. I think one of the best games, not only him, but also corner Julius Brents from Kansas State, had was those two guys against each other in yep, the Big 12 championship yep, game. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, you got Julius Brents, who's a 6'3 corner, a bigger guy, being physical with them, but also Quentin Johnston getting the best of him at times, too. Mm-hmm. Just a great back and forth from two guys who love the game of football. Let's acknowledge the Ravens are on the clock. Now, I'm acknowledging that loudly because some of you may have missed the news earlier in the day. The Ravens are on the clock, and a day ago it was. What well, a day. What will, a day this is for the, for the Ravens. Will, will Lamar get traded was a question on <laughs> many TV shows a, a week ago. The answer was no. Instead, Lamar got a mega contract. So now the question becomes, knowing that Lamar, Lamar got that mega contract, you see here, uh, the question is, what are they going to do? The Ravens, wide receiver draft history. I mean, it would be a pretty epic move round. to go ahead and throw a receiver into the mix. That would just be a flex by by their, their GM and their scouting department. Eric DaCosta, right? Like, you sign OBJ. What was that? I was Easter Sunday, so two and a half weeks ago. You sign Lamar. It's like, you know what? Let the good times roll, right? Like, because if he takes a wide receiver here, Zay Flowers, and this kid's bust is out of the league in two years, no one's going to blame him. At least he took him, right? What, like, about, what about Jordan Addison, too? Jordan Addison, he's, route running feet. I would love it. Yeah. I would love it. I mean, yeah. they have other needs. Cornerback's a big one. They could stay local with Deontay Banks. Really Cornerback good. Is a huge one. Yeah, yeah a Deontay big, Banks, too. Really, really good player. Got some great speed, uh, great yeah. speed, great size to him. He, he talk about that dude now. He wanted the smoke last year. At Maryland, that was not, obviously, that team was solid, but they were. They, they were yep. Better because of their offense. Uh, I think that was probably ha- would help them stay competitive for the most part. Deontay Banks, not the case. But so similar situation to what we just talked about with the Chargers. You're getting your guy a weapon because you're going to pay him big money. They just paid Lamar big money. Get that man a better weapon than Odell Beckham. That is no disrespect to Odell Beckham. I it's think a he's a great, a great, a he's a great wide receiver. A little bit. He's a great wide receiver, but so Susan, third, no 30 year old Odell Beckham <laughs> off, off, coming off of a couple of not minor injuries by any means. That can't be your number one receiver yeah. for a quarterback that you just paid 185 guaranteed million. Well, I think I yep. think the Baltimore Ravens giving Lamar Jackson that contract to me is justified because I don't think there's anybody who's done more with less. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Look at all the young players from Joe Burrow to Justin Herbert to uh, Jalen Hurts to Josh Allen, all, Trevor Lawrence this season. All these guys had the premier people around them skill position wise. Lamar Jackson hasn't had that. Yeah, but, but they've yeah. tried. That's the hardest part on it. It's like, kind of like oh, if all you ever do is date crazy girls and someday you just realize that maybe it's you, like, they can keep trying. Like, they, well, they need to be better evaluating right. wide receivers. Right. But yeah. that, that's that, that's what hard. I would yeah. put on them. Right, but that's hard for me to, to look at it. It's like at some point you just got to look at it and say, man, maybe this isn't our strength. Like maybe we just start. I mean, like, is this the year to do that? That's the other thing, yeah, too. If yeah. you're an organization that's not great at that, you really want to go out on that limb because I thought, well, wow, it'd be funny if they just got him a big old lummox of a tight end like they always gave him, right? Mm-hmm. They've had worse ideas. They really have. But And they still have Isaiah Likely, who I think is going to yeah. have a bigger role on their team next year to go along with the other phenomenal tight end they have. But I just think, like, when you look at a team like the Pittsburgh Steelers, who can sleep and find wide receivers. Yeah. You got to evaluate, self-evaluate yeah. yourself and, and yeah. figure out what you're doing wrong from that skill position group. I actually really liked Johnston to go to the Ravens because of what he provided. I think uh, yeah. Jordan Addison being the deep threat. Like you have Odell, who's kind of a little bit of everything. You have Bateman, who's more of a possession guy. You need somebody over mm-hmm. top that can go deep for Lamar. It could be Zay Flowers. It could be Addison. And also Banks. Banks is a Baltimore native. I mean, that's, you know. Great story from there as well. The pick Mel Kuyper Jr. would lose his mind if that happens. Mel loved Deontay Banks. Mel is from Maryland, of course, has he an is. affinity for the Baltimore Ravens. Yep. Mm-hmm. He would lose his mind in the best way possible. Pick is in. All right, so the pick is in. Roger Goodell going to the podium. Let's see what it comes up here. The pick is in. It is Zay so, this is my favorite wide receiver of the uh-huh. draft. Um, a lot of people may say he's a little undersized. I think he is a smaller Ooh. Stephon Diggs, wow. and I've been saying that for the last two years. Route running ability, stop and start, can make you look silly. But like you mentioned earlier, Phil, plays bigger than his actual size can be too short, mm. intermediate, or deep. They had a play against the University of Louisville, my alma mater, where there was two people there to defend the pass. But Zay Flowers, the smallest guy on the football field, came up with that football. I love the fact that he has about 
I think seven or eight plus brothers and sisters, so you know he has to be tough yeah. because he got to stand up too. for yeah. himself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, this is also my favorite receiver. Undersized guy, but he plays big. When you talk about mentality, it makes you think of Steve Smith, right? Because uh -huh. he gets out there and he thinks he is the biggest man <laughs> on the football field. If I gave him a comp, I actually like him for Santana Moss mm. because Ooh, like he's a, a shorter guy, but he can play inside, he can play outside. He also had that edge. He's great off the line of scrimmage. And when you talk about changing direction, nobody does it as fast and as explosive as Zay Flowers. The most important thing I love about Zay Flowers, he had an opportunity to transfer to another school for NIL money. Yeah. He decided to stay at Boston College. Mm and fought it out, made plays, and still became a first-round draft pick. One of 14 children. Yes, that, that's what I was going to clarify. Okay. If, you, if you're, you're, you're the 11th of 14 children, <laughs> hey, you've already taken an NFL beating growing up. What? Right? Yes. You know what yes. I mean? What? Like, like, that guy is going to be one of the toughest players on every single field that he steps on. I've thought about all the ways you could describe him, and I've decided that I, I, I've been and been sitting on this one for a while. The best way I can describe is Zay Flowers. I'm married to a lovely Boston College graduate. Zay Flowers allowed me to watch every game for the past two seasons. Wow. Boston College was unwatchable besides Zay Flowers, especially on offense, yep. at least this year, right? I mean, Phil Yurkovich was just, I don't even know what happened there. But that guy, this kid, is he's dynamite. The, the biggest question mark for Zay Flowers besides the size is had a, some butterfingers this year. But uh, that tends to be one of the things that can be, uh, like, that can be concentration. I'm sorry, you, coach said, up a little bit. you said Steve Smith. This is a 5'9 and change wide receiver who just came out in the NFL draft after being productive at Boston College of all places and then strutted out in a leather suit, like hit him with the full <laughs> training day. <laughs> Hall of Famer. I'm just going to call it. Day one. If you are a corner, you better so, get out your back pedal because he going to eat your cushion up. Yeah. Mean. Very fast. Excited for what this means for Lamar as we talked about also. Yes. Should, yep. should acknowledge the Vikings now on the clock, five minutes to go on their time. It, Will Levis? Yep. I mean, that, that's right. I mean, at some point, yep. you got to look at this. Uh, Kirk Cousins has, what, one year left with a bunch of money on it, and after that, we'll see where things go. Uh, Minnesota seems to like Kirk Cousins a lot, but he's not young. Uh, he is expensive. You could reset the quarterback value. Like, this is where I, it gets really interesting. Well, yeah. here, here's my question. If you have a guy like – because you also got to take in, into consideration that you have a guy in Justin Jefferson who was the best receiver in football last year, mm -hmm. right? Is he going to be happy with a guy like Will Levis, or yeah. would he be more happy with a guy like Hendon Hooker, Hooker from yeah. Tennessee? Mm. I, a more natural passer. Yeah. Yeah. It, it also, we have to start looking at trade. Like, here's the reality of the free fall. I, I won't bog everybody down with all of it, but you have, after, after the Vikings, you have the Jags, the Giants, the Cowboys, the Bills, the Bengals, the Saints, the Eagles, the Chiefs. What do they have in common? None of them need a quarterback. Yep. So if you're Will Levis and you're not picked here at 23 at this point, there is a very real chance that you have the same fate as this banana. You're just done for the evening. Banana might go uneaten, y'all, because <laughs> if the Vikings pass him up, that's a drop. That's well, a it, steep drop. And I'll say this, and, and I don't <laughs> wish any of these young men to be in this spot because, Absolutely. oh yeah, you yep. know, you wait for this night your entire life when you're a kid to get drafted playing the National Football League and to mm -hmm. actually be there at the draft and your your name's not called. We see Aaron Rodgers go through that, mm -hmm. so I don't I don't wish that on anyone. Of course, mm -hmm. uh, it's the the most surprising part of this thing. Quarterbacks fall. We know quarterbacks fall. Yep. I think a lot of people, you, you heard so much over the course of the last week about the possibility that Will Levis could go number two overall. Will Levis could go number one. Vegas thinks it. So I think in, in a lot of our minds it was like, well, a fall still means 12 or 13. Mm. A fall outside of the first round entirely would be – that would be stunning, right? I mean, we I can all agree with that. Yeah, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a quarterback especially because of the value of that fifth-year option, right? Like just it, – it's been proven time and again, right? I mean – uh, the Ravens, even though Lamar was injured the past couple of years, got the best bargain in football with him being on that fifth-year option as opposed to being under a, you know, if they had not taken him 32nd, he would have been playing on the franchise tag or a long-term deal right away. So that is a uh, no question, like, these next 10 picks will define how the league feels about Will Levis. If he is not drafted by the Vikings, I have to wonder, and I just took a look Trade at the second round. Play, right? I have to look at the Rams, who are picking fifth in the second round. Mm -hmm. Liam Cohen was their offensive coordinator. 
He knows this. He knows yeah. Will Levis incredibly well. He was also Will Levis' offensive coordinator. It feels like if there's anybody in the league that could give somebody insight into what they have at the quarterback position, like I'm just if I'm the Rams sitting there saying, man, what's it going to take to move up to the bottom of the first round, get the quarterback that I have better information on than most teams, and get that fifth-year well, option. Well, here's the thing. The Rams, I don't think, have that much draft capital that's either, fair. though. So that's a yeah, that's that's another fair. part of it. Do they have the – you know, the, the insurance to, to move up and, and take that pick. Let's think about this a little optimistically for, for Will Levis here. If he happens to end up at Minnesota, it's a nice spot. That's a nice, cozy spot for a yeah. young quarterback, right? To, to learn. A little yep. cold. To mm-hmm. learn. The system, little, especially that cold. Shanahan system. <laughs> yep. Oh, Kevin you know O'Connell. this. Yep. The second year is yeah. really when that system for young players start to kick off. Right. Or even if you're learning a new system, the yep. second year is when it really starts to, to hit its stride. Is this one of those moments, though, y'all, where we're, like, presuming that Kirk Cousins is just done and in the meantime the Vikings are looking around and they're like, I don't know, like, there's no Aaron Rodgers in the division anymore. We, the Lions are usually the Lions. Like, I got a pretty good shot at the division the way things are laying out right now. You know what you have with him, right? You know what you got. Kirk Cousins. With Kirk? Yeah. 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 Kirk Cousins, right though, like, it, it's – this is a very interesting inflection point decision right now because if they don't take a quarterback, a quarterback here, they don't pick again until the third round. And if yep. you're taking a quarterback in the third round, you can't call it anything close to a guarantee that that guy becomes a starter at any point in his career. It just is, it's just how it works with quarterbacks. So mm-hmm. um, if they don't take one here, Kirk in the final year of his contract, who has always had leverage, like – He's always had leverage. leverage. Why he's a Hall of Fame quarterback as far as the contracts business side is going, right? Legend. Um, So this is a fascinating one right here because it could sort of show the hand of the Vikings. I I like what you said about, like, this division, right? There's no Aaron Rodgers. You know, the Lions, they're not really scared of them. Uh, The Bears are rebuilding as well. That makes a lot of sense. What you got to ask yourself is when you look at Will Levis or even a Hendon Hooker versus what quarterbacks are going to be available next year – it's like this might be your only opportunity because with Kirk Cousins, you know what you're going to get at worst, which is eight and eight or eight and nine or nine and eight, whatever it is. But Hold it's up. like oh, at worst. Okay, at worst. I thought you were saying best. Yeah, at worst. Like he's like, about to come at you after thirty. No, that's at worst because that's what you know. Kirk Cousins and his bat. It's going to be good with the bat, and it's like, is that going to be high enough for you in next year's draft? With all that but is, also guys. though, like you, you don't have to have. Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Aaron Rodgers. In You're in the yep. NFC over there. You're like, oh, yeah, Kirk Cousins might be the third best quarterback in the whole conference Max. this year. With all that being said, we cannot ignore how atrocious this defense was last season. And they do not have Patrick Peterson yep. over there at the quarterback position anymore. And we still have a corner on the board. Mm-hmm. We got a couple of corners on the board. I mean, Porter Jr. is still on the board, right? Yep. So, yep. Yes. you know, Banks that, is on the board still. You've yep. got a couple of guys that most people consider first-round talent still sitting on the board. Jordan yeah. Addison still on the board as well. Yep. There's a lot of speculation that Addison would make sense in Minnesota. They need a wide receiver mm-hmm. with, obviously, Adam Thielen now in Carolina. So, yep. All right, the Vikings pick is in. There was no trade. But Hendon Hooker still, you know, has some logic to it, at least in my estimation. We'll see. It's going to be interesting for Will Levis and Hendon Hooker for the next hour or so as we go through the last 10 picks in this draft. Like yep. that is, uh, it's certainly there's going to be uh, there's going to be trading. We have a Slack poll. Are you shocked? Sorry, not Slack, a YouTube poll. It's in Slack. Are you shocked? Kentucky quarterback Will Levis is still on the board through 22 picks. Yes. 48 percent said yes. 52 percent said no. 52 percent of the people are lying. Yeah. All right, I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm, like, I'm not shocked. Way. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, am, sh- I am not shocked. We talked about this pre-show. There's so many questions around, well, is he a, is he a uh, specimen? Yes, absolutely. But you said this. Specimen quarterbacks, how often do they really take off like that, right? Mm-hmm. And he couldn't beat out Sean Clifford at Penn State. I think he has all the tools. But he, in his decision-making, when you watch his film, it does leave a lot to be desired. Yeah, you know, I'm, I've questioned that decision-making. Jordan Boy, Addison is that? the pick for Four the Vikings. Straight wide receivers. That's Love a that. run. We didn't see any wide receivers go, and now we've seen a run of them. Yeah, huh. I like Jordan Addison. 2021 Belitnikoff Award winner. Just like Zay Flowers, he could be too short, yep. intermediate, or deep. Kind of reminds me, not as explosive, of a Calvin Ridley type guy. Mm. I don't think he gets in, in and out of his cuts like uh, or as sharp as Calvin Ridley, mm-hmm. but he has that makeup from his body control, but just a phenomenal pick, I think, for the, for the Minnesota Vikings to pair him up with Justin Jefferson. Yeah, he's great after the catch. He can go deep. He can play inside. He can play outside. What I really love about, besides his versatility, is like when you look at receivers and how they're drafting now, like back in my draft, our draft, H. 
PhD when it was like 2008. They were going for like 6'4", 6'5", guys. guys, right? And then the, the corners guys. started getting bigger. And now the prototypical corner is now 6'1", 6'2". So how do you beat a taller, longer corner? Quick guys who can move, change direction. That's what you're getting with Jordan Addison, and that's what you're getting with this run of receivers in Najigba, Zay Flowers, and it's probably going to continue as well. I also like the fact that, as we see his highlights across the board for him at USC and Pitt, let's remember, he had to learn two offenses over the course of his mm -hmm. career, thrived in both. Like, I think sometimes when we talk about system fit, like we always talk about guys' ability to move up, there's a uh, – hold on. Yeah, you better hit this. Mm. 24 and yeah. 25. Oh, they threw 160. We didn't even. We didn't well. even. Hold on, Fields. Give it oh. some proper. Oh, there it is. Oh, shoot. come on. Oh, it was a miss hit. Come on with that. With that there it is. Yeah, that was a good shooter. one. <laughs> We're used to Spence knocking it all the way to yeah. the back of the yeah, set. All right. Just, yeah, what do what okay. we got? Come What's on. the trade? What has happened? We have a trade. That's the trade gong in case you haven't figured that out yet. Yes, it is. So the Giants sent picks 25, 160, and 240 to the Jaguars for pick number 24. Okay. So this is what? Have we seen this, what, two, three times now? We had the yeah. Eagles going up from 10 to 9. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was the cost of that one was a 2024 fifth round, fourth round pick, excuse me. So the Giants picked, uh, sent out a fifth round pick this year to move up one slot. So we're seeing about that's, you know. It's about average. So the Giants have back-to-back -back picks now? No. The, no, the Giants have moved up one pick. Okay. So the, the Jaguars will now pick number uh, 25. So the Jags convinced the Giants that somebody else was going to trade ahead of them for something. Uh, yep. Yeah, could this be? I mean, this might be the wide receiver run, right? Yep. I mean, we've yep. seen four straights, so maybe the the Giants, who we've well, the Giants have been connected to two spots, cornerback and wide receiver, and right now the Pickens are getting slim. Mm -hmm. uh, at wide receiver, obviously, we just saw four go off the board, and I'm not sure who the fifth would be if you're going to take a wide receiver and here. Jalen Hyatt. I was going to say Jalen Hyatt. Hyatt. Yeah. You run like crazy. Um, yeah. And then if it's a cornerback, yeah. yeah. If it's a cornerback, uh, and we talked about Deontay Banks earlier, uh, certainly would fit the need here for the Giants who are continuing to look for perimeter corner help. Right. We also have uh, Joey Porter, or yeah, Porter would also be. Joey Porter Jr. would be a nice one as well. So we got a couple of different guys that could be there for us. We will see the Giants go on the clock. Yeah, we're going to have Ed Werder joining us here in a moment as well. The Cowboys just around the corner, but he is actually in Houston this weekend covering the Texans. So, Ed Werder, great to have you here on our draft show. And Ed in Houston for the evening. Uh, Ed, the Texans have spiced up the 2023 NFL draft. When you woke up this morning, did you have picking two and three on your bingo card for the Texans? No, I was kind of going back and forth as to whether they were going to take a quarterback or they were going to take Will Anderson. Uh, I did not conceive of them uh, moving up and taking the second and third picks and getting C.J. Stroud, the Ohio State quarterback, at two. And then, as Nick Casario, the general manager, was just describing to us, uh, you know, once Arizona went on the clock, they decided to engage them in conversations about trying to finalize a deal. They'd had exploratory conversations with the Cardinals and other teams throughout the day about moving up from 12 after they picked at two. The Cardinals were willing to do a deal with them. Uh, and, you know, Nick Casario said when you have a conviction about players like we did about C.J. Stroud and Will Anderson, then you don't worry about what the trade chart says. You just go and make the deal and get the players uh, that you value. And so that's what they did. In their minds, they got at least the second-best quarterback on the board, and they got their pick of defensive players uh, in, in Will Anderson, the edge rusher. Uh, an outstanding character player from Alabama who, you know, D'Amico Ryans knows yeah. a lot about Alabama players having having been a captain on that defensive football team himself. Yeah, it kind of feels like everybody wins tonight for the Texans, right? You make the defensive-minded head coach yeah. who went to Alabama happy. Then you have the offensive player at quarterback who gives the team some hope and direction going forward. You mentioned the price, though. That has been a talking point uh, since Houston made this full freight maneuver because it's a lot they spent to move up from 11 to 3. Nick Casario's uh, description that seemed like – he seems comfortable with the amount that they sent to Arizona, which includes, by the way, their own first-round pick in 2024. Well, I, I think two things, Field, that are, are worth you know considering here. One is this is a general manager in Nick Casario who is on his third head coach already, and he needed a quarterback. He did a great job, I think, you know, getting value out of Deshaun Watson in a situation where that was difficult to do. Uh, and he does now involve one of those picks in acquiring his replacement in C.J. Stroud. I think it also shows that ownership uh, is invested in, 
you know, Nick Casario and D'Amico Ryans, who has a six-year contract. I mean, they've had two one-and-done head coaches here the last two years. What have they won, three or four games uh, over the last three years? So this was an important draft for Nick Casario. I mean, even before it started, there were, was already speculation that he had to contradict that he was leaving the organization uh, after this draft was over, which makes no sense. And, and he's denied that that's an accurate uh, portrayal at all. But I think it was important for them to hire a head coach who's going to be here, you know, for multiple years. I mean, he got the same kind of six-year deal that the 49ers, you know, gave to Kyle Shanahan. Mm. And so they know who the head coach is going to be. And now they've got a pillar on the offensive side of the ball and a potential franchise quarterback. I mean, they finished last in the NFL in total QBR. And they're the seventh team since that metric was created in 2006 to finish last and then have a top two pick. And every team, all seven of them now with the Texans doing what they did, have chosen a quarterback with that first pick. And then, you know, on defense, I mean, they faced the most rushing attempts in the NFL. They allowed the most rushing yards. So Will Anderson is going to help them at a position where they've got two veteran defensive ends both on the last year of their contract. So... Uh, I, th I think they've really created an opportunity to b engage the, the full rebuilding process. Now, it's hard to do when you don't have a franchise quarterback. And, and whether they do or they don't, they have a reason to believe that maybe they do. Yeah, Ed, they have some hope in Houston right now, which has not been the case over the past couple of years. The great Ed Werder joining us here from Houston. Thanks so much for your insight. Enjoy the rest of the weekend, Ed. Things are just getting started for Houston. Thanks, Field. All right, boys, you want a stat? I'm going to give you a stat. Drop one on us. The first time in the common draft era that four consecutive picks in the first round were wide receivers. How do you like that? Four well, straight I wide mean, receivers for the first time. Listen, he might not come when you want him to come, but he's going to always <laughs> he, be on time. Always Him being time. the Lord. Oh, man. Won't he do it? <laughs> Won't he you he know what God just did? God just let the Giants make a pick. The pick is in for the Giants. <laughs> Deontay Banks. Of the New York football Giants now. Deontay Banks from Maryland corner is now the pick for the Giants. And, guys, uh, this speaks oh, to why they moved up one. Uh, yeah, they move no, up one sure. because they, they knew. I, I mean, Intel would say they running low on corners. We knew they were going to go secondary. They needed a guy. Yeah, a confrontational corner. Yes. A, a physical corner in the form of Deontay Banks. Uh, this is not uh, – this is the exact opposite of the polished, ready – corner not to say that he doesn't have polish but a dude who uh will bring it Lyles you like this one I love it I mean hey and look I hate doing this but we've had to do it for a couple picks Devin Witherspoon probably being the first hey man you know a dude is good if he's getting drafted in the first round out of Maryland all right like that's that's Ooh. that just is what it is it's, it's been tough sledding over there obviously uh for the past handful of years but he is seriously the type of player where if he would have had another year in college, he would have been in the portal because somebody else was going to take him. Yeah, I think when you look at their secondary, I think three sl uh, slots are, are solid. Adoree Jackson, I actually played with Adoree in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. But he, he's a guy that played both sides of the ball back then, got hurt doing punt returns last year. Uh, Coach Dable, please keep the man off of punt returns. But also <laughs> they signed Bobby McCain. They have Xavier McKinney. Now you add Deontay Banks to this mix, a guy mm -hmm. that can bring that, you know, that toughness, that aggressiveness, just that solidism that you need from mm -hmm. the secondary, and especially a corner. You want that type of guy um, when, when you I, – I just, just to be tough-minded. Yep. Like, yep. be tough-minded, and, you know, when somebody hit him for a big play, forget it. Yeah, go uh, to the next one. A press, uh, press guy, too. Like, he can do a lot of man coverage. He can also play a little. I think we – do we have a – all right. Look, look this solid is – No, no, no. You wind up. <laughs> I'm going to hold it for you. I think it is. <laughs> Thank you. We gotta get on. We gotta work on this pea shooter. Yeah, yeah it, it ain't no basic. We almost broke your hand. Wait, yeah, I'm you, you, want, you want to try? You, you want to hit? You want to hit? No, man. I'm, I, a real man never tells. <laughs> uh, shows his, his real capabilities. The Bills have traded pick 27 and 130 in exchange for pick 25. So the mm. Bills have moved up two spots. Oh, all right. That was fun. Uh, the Jags were on the clock at that point, but the Jags, remember, the Jags already traded down, uh, then they traded down again. The Jags are in this weird situation we're not used to saying with Jacksonville where like, they're in pretty good shape. Like, they, they didn't walk into this draft saying, oh, my God, we need this, right? So it gives them a little bit of opportunity. So the Bills are now on the clock. They must have felt 
the need to move up for someone. Again, I will say we are seeing a run on corners. And uh, wideouts. It, yeah. uh, we're, we're, we're running thin at, at all of these spots. So two areas of depth. Also, I am, I am stunned. Oh, Field, field, field tweeted. What, the where, Bills how traded. did Field <laughs> Phil, please trades from the back. Look, <laughs> Phil, no, he, Phil really did. he did. He did. Just be having an honest moment here for the, 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 the like. We got no commercial, so if you got a tinkle, you got a tinkle. Phil just sprinted off set, so I'm presuming he had to tinkle. He took his phone with him, he closed his laptop, and then he tweeted out the details. So the best, I had man. to give the trade oh, details, going. as it were, while he was uh, tweeting. I, I respect it. Oh, I just respect the fact that he tweeted it while he was doing it. Fields is going back on back. First round pick in my book. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank Can you. we also, though, quickly, like, this is supposed to be one of the, when we talk about positions of strength, everybody said, oh, my God, the tight ends. We all agree. Mm -hmm. We've been every four or five minutes, it feels like we're like, well, it could be one of these two tight ends. They're all still sitting there. So, yeah. big thing you know. I'm, sorry. Big thing I'd say, though, and I think I got into this a little bit before the draft. I think people conflated power and numbers with top end talent. There are a lot of good tight ends in this class. Mm -hmm. There's not one. I know Kyle Pitts obviously hasn't been tremendous. Uh, last year the injury really bothered him, but like, there's nobody who even can breathe the same air that Kyle Pitts breathes. Like, there's not a dominant tight end prospect in this year's class. There's like five or six guys that are all merit like picks 25 to 80, yep. but not one that I was like, yeah, I'm like, that guy looks like an immediate day one difference maker like Kyle Pitts can be. And but when if you've it, got Brock Bowers lingering next year, you're like, uh -huh. oh, well, maybe I could wait. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. <laughs> But that could happen soon. I mean, that is actually a really smart point when we talk about because we're talking about with quarterbacks too. Like, how many teams that need a quarterback are looking at him and saying, well, Caleb Williams and, uh, and Drake met, you know? So here's your best available. Will Levis, still on the board. Nolan Smith, still on the board. Dalton Kincaid, we just mentioned. Uh, Deontay Banks uh, was just drafted, so you can cross him off of that. Mm -hmm. And Joey Porter Jr. So if you need a corner, uh, but by most mocks, you are starting to run to the end of the list of first-round talent that will be there. Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. the Bills did not move up to take a quarterback. I am not that stupid. So, uh, if you'd have told us <laughs> 10 minutes ago that we were having a trade up, I would have thought, oh, somebody getting in range for Will Levis or, uh, or for Hendon Hooker, but apparently not. And I said, I'm not that stupid. And you gave me that, I don't know, Lord. <laughs> Prove it. I'm thinking about it. Okay. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> you know, that's probably fair. You know, I got two words for you. Not, well, I got really one word for you. I'm just going to name it one word. Just Tyree. You can't kill my joy tonight, right? Like, for once, I'm happy. Uh, you know, but a professional will try. No, well, yeah. that's probably fair. Uh, which wide receiver will be the most – which wide receiver has the most potential? We asked YouTube in the poll, uh, and we gave them the option of the four selected. In a landslide, last place – go, I'll go 4 3 two, one, like any good countdown. Last place, Jordan Addison. Second to last place, Quentin Johnson. Uh, second place, Zay Flowers, the runaway winner with 45% of the vote, Jackson Smith in Jigba. So, uh, by the way, uh, just a, an acknowledging that the, the Seahawks have gone through this whole thing, made their weapons better, and they're in a really glorious situation with the contract for Geno, who now gets another weapon to throw to. Well, like, if I'm Geno Smith. I, I wouldn't just sleep on Jordan Addison. Like, we know that offensive system very well. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we know a lot of people are going to key on Justin Jefferson. So I wouldn't just say Jordan mm -hmm. Addison yeah. is not going to eat. I yeah. would say he's going to get a lot of targets because of what's on the opposite side of him. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, even if you zoom out a little bit, I like the Zay Flowers pick more than the Njigba pick because, I, I mean, he you get even an increase of what you had in Hollywood Brown when he was with Lamar Jackson, he could do more. He still can stretch the field. He can also get the ball from short and take it the distance. And, you know, you go from Lamar Jackson, who a month ago it seemed like they weren't going to be able to work anything out. They go get Odell Beckham. It probably restarts the talks. And now he has Zay Flowers. He has weapons on the outside for the first time in a long time. I'm just a man of the people. I'm just telling you what the people are telling you. Who we got here? Give me a guess. Mm. I'm going Hyatt. Why did you leave again? You said what the people told you. Is there any pass rush no. for you? <laughs> oh, finally. Oh, there it is. Oh, okay. oh, there it is. All right. Uh, you guys can find me on my side hustle as a psychic. Coming up soon. <laughs> All right. Oh, Dalton is... Kincaid, the first of the tight ends you, to go. We should have known this, by the way, because the Bills jumped ahead to the Dallas Cowboys. Who so need a tight end. Everybody's been talking about the yep. Cowboys being the most likely team to take a tight end. But Dalton Kincaid is an incredible story. Zero star recruit. Wasn't even on the recruiting radar. That's how we ended up at San Diego. You saw those highlights there a moment ago. Goes to Utah. Uh, absolutely smashed this past year. Uh, 
there's a lot that's going right for Lincoln Riley right now at USC. Do not mention the two words Dalton Kincaid around him. He literally tore that defense apart in both games they played this past season. 16 catches <laughs> in one of those games. Absolutely incredible. Had a pre-draft back issue, which was a big deal for uh, him in the process. Didn't see a lot of him uh, in terms of some of the physical testing metrics, but was recently cleared by one of the top back doctors in the country. This guy is the, you know, he's the, the best. He can get open the best at the top of routes of all the tight ends in this year's class. And the Bills all of a sudden have some real horsepower at tight end with both he and Dawson Knox. I love the athleticism, uh, the savviness to also get to the blind spot of the defender to set him up and break his route off. I'm not going to sit up here and say this pick makes me nervous, but aren't the Buffalo Bills supposed to be trying to establish the run game? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what happen, made right? me raise my eyebrow at this one because he is not polished as a, as a blocker. Yep. Mm -hmm. And when I look at what they need, a Darnell Washington to me makes more sense at tight end for them just because that's like having another lineman out there. Yep. And you did not run the football last year, which, mm -hmm. again, like his athletic ability is one thing. He's a great player. But to your point, I would have thought they would have gone somewhere else. I, I mean – Josh Allen wants to stretch the field. He wants to throw it. He has that rocket arm. He could put the ball anywhere. They could have used some help in the slot, but now you get that with the, the, the tight end position, right? You give him a huge target at Kincaid down the middle of the field. It takes pressure um, off of Steph and, and that offensive firepower that they already have. I can see it, but you're right. They do need to establish the run, but it's hard. To, I mean, Chicks love the long ball, man. This, this is what Kincaid <laughs> yeah. Chicks dig it up. <laughs> it's a weird portion. We talked about this last year in the playoffs on all of our shows. Like, the Bills are built for modern football in a world where you have to compete with the Chiefs, but they're also not built the best for their own home field advantage, which is snowy, disgusting football in the middle of January. Yeah. So yeah. Like, they need to draft a draft roof like, on that but, but, see, but here's the difference between <laughs> the Chiefs and the Bills in, in my eyes. When the Chiefs need to run the football and have to run the football, they're able to do it. I can't say the same about the Buffalo Bills outside of Josh Allen. And I think early on in the year, you kind of want to lean on your running backs. So when you're down the stretch, okay, now Josh Allen is making all those he-man plays and, and running people over yeah. potentially and, and gaining all the yards he can on the ground. I just think at some point you got to establish the run because I think that's one of the deficiencies in their offense. Yeah. Yeah, someone still believes in not reaching for a running back in the first round. Yeah. <laughs> someone. I also someone think it's well, no, no, no. I'm not, I'm, not saying, maybe, I'm not saying pick a running back. Oh, I'm not. No, I'm not saying that either. I'm just saying they're the one team who was like, you know what? We'll just take the tight end. <laughs> yeah. We'll wait on it. <laughs> Traditional pass catching tight end. I think the yeah, big yeah. thing here with the running backs is like we've reached the sweet spot. There were two that merited first round consideration. One in Bijan, who was obviously going high, and then mm -hmm. one in Jameer Gibbs, who I thought would go in the first round. I didn't expect it to be 12, but I thought he'd be a – Top 25-ish pick. Now we're at the point where, like, the drop-off is real, right? There are a lot of good running backs in this class, but there's not a guy that I think is in the same tier as those two guys. So Buffalo could still address that running back spot probably a little bit further down the board. I feel like, though, that if they're going to do it, they got to add some beef to that backfield for the long term, too. Like James Cook last year, second-round pick, good mm -hmm. player, yep. but not a ton of size. Damian Harris, they added in a one-year deal. Um, he's got some power to him. I thought that at times he got a little bit – I would say be a little guilty of playing smaller than a stature. So the Bills, if they do end up going with a, uh, a running back at some point, could really use to a guy that is the initiator of contact as opposed to the receiver. And, and, of I, and I hate that they traded for Naheem Hines and barely used them offensively last yeah. season. Mm -hmm. So the Cowboys now are on the clock. And you just mentioned they need a tight end. Well, there's another great one on the board yeah. for most people. Michael Mayer out of New England – or New England, out of Notre Dame. From Kentucky. Uh, is is – I mean, is he that guy? Does he now make sense for the Cowboys? A couple days ago, Mike McCarthy was talking about what he looks forward to tight end in his pre-draft press conference, and he was like, I like guys who are about 6'4", 250, can block, hold their own, like um, Michael Mayer. Yeah, like, was, was He could have just said him by name. That would have been – I think that's not tampering. You, can, you, don't, you, you can't be accused of tampering uh, in the NFL before a guy's actually been drafted. So it feels like this would be the perfect Michael Mayer landing spot given the Cowboys' very obvious need. And the fact that, like, talk about a safe pick – and, and high, high ceiling, too, but, like, he's going to play. Like, there's no doubt he'll play for 10 years in the league. I don't know if he's going to yeah. be as electric as Dalton Kincaid. He'll play for a long time because he can hold his own as a blocker, Not too. the downfield threat. Right. Not the guy who's going to be making these balletic catches in the end zone like mm -hmm. Dalton Kincaid. Well, Amen. This yeah. is a tank. Yeah, he is a Yeah. Tank. We talked about this. But, His Chipotle order might be the biggest red flag. Also, <laughs> hey. The double sour cream? Double sour cream. I think is he has more savvy, though, than people give cream? him credit for. Yeah. Because yeah. – 
like the re his release game off the line of scrimmage. It's not like he's a, a stiff guy with you know bricks and stone at, for feet. Yeah. Like he can still get off press coverage, and his release game I think is good enough to be you know more than feasible in the National Football League. But I love complete tight ends. Like you love the flashy ones too, but. A guy that can line up in a three-point stance, you could detach him and be one-on-one -on -one with a corner or a safety, but also play him in the slot. I think Michael Mayer could do all of those things. I also, he was it for a lot of Notre Dame this year, right? Like, yeah. let's mm -hmm. just acknowledge the fact that, like, yep. everybody knew he was getting the ball, and yep. it wasn't like he had Peyton Manning getting him the ball, right? Yeah. So, yeah. it is interesting to see. Like, I like high-level productivity when everybody knows what's coming and everybody – like, even, when your own fans and the opposing fan base all know that you're the only hope and you still yep. get it done – that does mean something to me. Something. So, you know, yeah. uh, we'll yeah. see if that's how, where the Cowboys go. Uh, the pick is in. So, uh, if you're just tuning in, the free fall of Will Levis continues. And I don't say that with any level of joy. I want to be clear here, as Harry pointed out earlier, it is not a good situation for any kid to have to be in that green room just watching as their name doesn't get called. But the shock of the draft so far is that Will Levis, to many, is that Will Levis is still available this late in the draft. The Cowboys have made their selection. We obviously know that is not a quarterback, which means the fall will continue. We've got about 30 seconds until we get that pick. Obviously, uh, after that will be the Jags. The Jags have traded down twice already in this draft. So Good Jags business, by the way, by the Jaguars. They moved down three spots and added three picks in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's actually like that's that's like rock solid business by the Jaguars. And while you were briefly away, we mentioned it's not usual for the Jags to be like, hey, we don't really need anything, so let's just like uh, the Jags are window shopping, but they don't actually have to buy anything. Like they don't need any furniture; they're just out there saying window shopper. <laughs> ah, it's my fault, America. I did that to everybody. Field Yates, Harry Douglas, Spencer Hall, Adam, Adam Andrew Hawkins, uh, Harry Lyles. I'm Jason Fitz. We're getting you every single pick. Throughout the course of the draft, including this glorious Cowboys pick. Mozzie Smith. Ooh. All that time talking about tight ends, and All I was right. wrong. Mozzie Smith is the pick. What do we think, boys? Well, you want a big, stout, interior, run-stuffing defensive lineman? Mozzie Smith is your pick, and this guy is an absolute freak athlete. If you guys don't read the column every year by Bruce Feldman on The oh, Athletic, yeah. yep. but the best freak athletes in all of college football, this guy, I think Mozzie Smith was number one. I mean, just obviously is just like toying with interior offensive linemen and some of the highlights that we are seeing so far. Massive need for the Cowboys, who got some play out of Jonathan Hankins in recent seasons, but they needed a guy who can be kind of a grit and grind defensive lineman for that uh, front there. They've got obviously a lot of athletes in that defense, but Mozzie Smith fills uh, maybe literally a couple of gaps for them. I think a pick that will also allow a guy like Michael Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence be that much more valuable and also have the ability to make that much more plays moving forward. Yeah, if you want an interior anchor, that man did 22 reps at 325. 22 reps of a bench press at 325 pounds. <sighs> That's all right. Like my shoulders at, hurt. At his That's size, insane. At his size, which is, Oof. if I could say, a heavy 340, like a heavier than normal yeah. 340, <laughs> an unnaturally dense 340, um, he was able to do a 33 and a half vertical leap. That's absurd. He is a freak. Yeah, freak athlete. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for the Cowboys, like, I actually think that, um, like, you go back and look at their track record in the first round, it actually stood the test of time. But the Cowboys are under a different microscope than basically every franchise in the sport because of some of it is, is most of it is self-inflicted, right? Jerry invites a lot of it. But, like, they have done a pretty darn good job in the first round. And last year they took us a player and Tyler Smith, who people thought was a little bit of a reach in the first round in the Tulsa, worked out really well for them. By the end of the season, he looked like a legit left tackle that was so promising that Tyron Smith, who'd been their left tackle for a decade, moved to the right side for the first time ever. So the Cowboys, they tend to figure it out in the first round. I wouldn't be surprised if Mozzie Smith adds them, helps them a lot mm -hmm. uh, in terms of their run stuffing. I also like, I don't know, durability, dependability uh, started – uh, 20, what, uh, it was uh, 28 games over the past two seasons, also had zero penalties in his career. Like, that's just, like, to me, I just read that, it just feels like that's staggering. Like, you're playing for Michigan, you're not, uh, like, this. Mm -hmm. it, there seems like there's an opportunity to make mistakes somewhere. I just love that level of efficiency. Yeah, yeah I, actually would, I actually would not hate it if, like, my new defensive tackle had, like, a handful uh, of, of, of 
penalty. 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 Help you out. <laughs> well, yeah. 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 Which, which penalty? Maybe a little, edge. Maybe which a little personal foul. Every little little yeah, yeah, yeah. They're in a position of power, right? The Cowboys' mm-hmm. defense, and 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 what Mozzie Smith, to your point, strong yeah. interior anchor, could do a little better from a pass rush perspective. But with Michael Parsons, you don't need to, right? So they're like. Filling little blind spots in the defense that's going to help them continue to kind of rise up. Eat up that division. space. Yes, eat exactly. up that space to allow other guys to eat even it, more. Absolutely. Sweet baby Jesus, the Jags made a pick. I'm just letting you know the pick <laughs> no, is actually hey. in. It's been the, 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 the great conundrum of the Well, they the must have had a player. That they just moved down three spots. They must have had somebody at yeah. 23 that sure. they were like, we're good here. And they moved down, picked up three selections. Like, to me, this is – it's the Jaguars doing new age Jaguar stuff here. But it also speaks to something we've mentioned a couple of times with teams like Philadelphia in the draft. Uh, when you talk about nailing the draft, over the last couple of years, the Jags have drafted well enough and they've gotten enough. Uh, they, they changed the coaching staff, obviously. Yeah. Last year they spent money wisely, a little bit like what we talked about with the Bears. The whole perception around that franchise a year ago today was wildly different than it is right now. I mean, like, Mm -hmm. the Jags, we're sitting here talking about competence. We're sitting here talking about the growth of Trevor Lawrence. We're sitting here talking about the fact that they don't have a million holes. Like, I think the Jags are sort of one of the case studies on, hey, you can turn the whole direction around pretty quickly if you do these things really well. And I would not have expected it to be them. Yeah. (laughs) No, no, no. Like, like bottom three franchises you expect that from. And they've gotten it out the mud. And it looks good. I'm honestly waiting for something to go wrong. (laughs) <laughs> but it's just, it's just amazing, like, like what a simple human being, like as in a head coach, can do for an organization. Mm-hmm. Also for a young quarterback, man. Absolutely. Yep. Like yeah. Yeah. And they, by the way, they they day. set themselves up, but like they've built some margin for error now. Yeah. By the way, you know, it's like they, they they've done like a legit like like they, they've I've done a legit 180. Like I, yeah. Because that was going the very wrong direction. They were a joke like, for a while. Doug Peterson yeah. s- probably saved Trevor Lawrence's career. Yeah, I, I don't think that's extreme to say. Yeah, that. Like they, they they were going the absolute wrong direction, even for them, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I said going into this whole experiment with Trevor Lawrence that I, I felt like the Jags would disappoint, let Trevor Lawrence down before Trevor Lawrence yep. would let the Jags down. And by God, they almost did that. Uh, but you think about what they were able to add uh, last year: Christian Kirk, Zay Jones, um, you know, Evan Ingram. That's a lot of productivity, and they're a team that, you know, according to our ESPN.com right now, has the team needs for them: defensive end, corner, tight end, linebacker, wide receiver. Well, Jaguars, you know what? For the Jags, mm-hmm. I'd add one more here though, and it came in the form of a suspension that we found out about this morning. Cam Robinson, That's yeah. right. oh yeah, left mm-hmm. tackle is going to miss multiple games now because of that PED suspension, and as a result of that, the guaranteed money in his contract voided. Like, that could really be a chance for the Jaguars to get out from underneath that contract, Oof. which mm-hmm. they were tied up against the cap. That $16 million might evaporate. Mm. All right, so where do they go at this Damn. point? Like, if you look at our best available list. I would say. Not Will Levis. Yeah. Tight in, <laughs> potentially, because Evan Ingram is on the franchise tag. Right, Field? He is. He's on the franchise yeah. tag. Yes, he is. Mm. So, yep. again, Michael Mayer makes sense uh, there to, to, to that end. You know, yep. that's what they're looking for. Yeah. So. Certainly, but this uh, is also a team now that's that's getting Calvin Ridley added to what they already had last mm-hmm. season. So that's a good point. Let's not forget that. Yeah. That's a that's a number one wide receiver that Trevor Lawrence is getting Absolutely. this season. Absolutely. How about that? You're just like you know what? We're just gonna add Calvin Ridley to this, and Calvin Ridley is gonna have this weird benefit of uh, like obviously nobody in his situation wants a year suspension for gambling, but he, the the opportunity for your body to heal at that level in the middle of an NFL career, like mm-hmm. I understand rust and all these things you have to knock off, but I can't imagine how his legs are gonna feel like once he gets into that season. You know, just having that rest. The pick is in. Goodell is at the podium, letting us know exactly who it is. It's the Jacksonville Jaguars. Oh, no, they did and not. And on Harrison. Ooh. Damn, this is my guy, too. Are the Jaguars really doing things left and right correctly? Why Ooh. do you love him? Uh, I, 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 I was surprised he wasn't higher up in most people's draft boards. Left tackle at Oklahoma. The hardest part about evaluating offensive tackles at Oklahoma is that funky offense they run, even under a new head coach of Brett Venables. A lot of, we talked to, who's, it, who's it earlier that we were talking about? Like, oh, Darnell Wright. Yep. Yep. Never had to get low in a stance. Same thing here for Anton Harrison, but this dude's good. He got some serious power. Been a left tackle for a long time. Not worried about him playing that at the pro level. Big physical dude, like unafraid. I think, like, playing on an island. I, I was sort of surprised he was not talked about 
in the same breath as some of the other offensive tackles. And I think the reason because of that is just Oklahoma had a down year. Yeah. And I honestly yeah. kind of feel the same way with B. John Robinson. If Texas would have been better, he probably would have been talked about even more than he already was. Well, this pick, and you just mentioned it, Phil, Cam Robinson and is Robinson. going to be suspended. Mm -hmm. yep. You yep. have a left tackle to kind of fill in right there and, and, and fill that void. Because you, what you don't want, especially from an offensive line perspective, when your, your quarterback has went through a year where his yeah. confidence has shot yep. up, yep. you don't want that to be shot down you don't want to because of a, a suspension of your left tackle. So you pick somebody that can fill a void right now. So what do they do when the contract's voided? What does that mean for the team Well, now? the guarantees would be voided. So right. if you have guaranteed money left in your contract, if he gets suspended for certain things, it's subject to forfeiture of that guarantee. So we've seen that in other players' instances where that player all of a sudden goes from being a lock on the roster to bye-bye. Um, I am not guaranteeing they're going to cut Cam Robinson, but you put a couple of pieces together. You have a $16 million left tackle. And you now have a first-round offensive tackle. Sure seems unlikely you'd keep both of them around. Yep. Even the fact, even though we know in the NFL you can probably never have enough offensive line depth. But if you go through their cap sheet this year, uh, the Jaguars did not – this is getting super nerdy, but bear with me for a Let's second. Let's go. No, guess, Everybody yeah, with these big base salaries in Jacksonville this offseason, Christian Kirk, Zay Jones, a bunch of guys on both sides of the ball had their contracts restructured. The value of that is you kick money into the future, but it buys you some extra cap space. Now, the only player with a real base salary who did not have his contract restructured, Cam Robinson. So they, they told us something without tell us, telling us something specifically. So um, I would not be surprised if, uh, if Cam Robinson – is no longer with the Jaguars going forward. Now that we've seen – oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say one more thing on Anton. Those hands are free, and they are nasty, and he'll give them to anybody. Mm. Mean. <laughs> mean when he gets them on you. <laughs> How mean? Oh, 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 we're talking dirt mean. We're talking way meaner than that gimmicky little offense would indicate, okay? <laughs> we're, talk we're talking somebody who will slap you. I He's love a it. nasty dude. <laughs> the man's are rated E for yeah. everybody. Oh, E for, e for everybody. Listen, we're past 11 <laughs> where the twang's going to come out. <laughs> Our super anonymous uh, big boy breakdown said when he's dialed in and ready to go, wow, does he pop. Yeah. Sudden off the edge, great front side zone, elite mirror dodge player, stays attached through the rep. I just feel so – I feel like a beefy, like, man when well, I read this You assessment. see that thing? Sometimes, sometimes when you get alignment in those offenses and they are kind of upright, it mm -hmm. can kind of come down to, like, mm, who's going to hit you or slap you harder? And usually he wins those. Favorite line? Throws his hands like he hates Throws your guts. Hands. Yeah, because he does. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah. I'm just telling you. God, I feel like a big boy. All right, the Bengals picked. Here we go. Is in. Cincinnati Bengals have made their selection. Put my glasses on for this one. I'm having a hard time seeing at this juncture of the night. Also telling you, I'm pretty <laughs> sure this is not Will Levis, too. I'm going to be. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that mm. Will Levis yes. not about to be selected. Yes, Miles, Murphy, Miles Murphy out of Clemson. Edge. Miles Murphy, somebody that months ago was being mocked by many to be a top 10 pick over yep. the course of the process and the draft seems to have fallen but comes into this what do we think gentlemen? love it I mean one of the things that Clemson has been known for the last what decade at this point <laughs> has been a get like defensive line play getting to the quarterback and that guy does it just about as well as anybody big thing get off yeah he, get he off. was uh, he's such a freak athlete that he could rely on the athleticism a lot uh, the ACC, as we know, I mean, it has not exactly been a stellar conference over the past five years, but Clemson's just been running roughshod over the entire conference. Got to become a more refined technician, but go to Cincinnati, play behind Trey Hendrickson, right? Like, they've got some pieces up front in Cincinnati that can handle some of the, the more veteran reps. Like, I like this pick. This is an upside pick. And the Bengals, another team that I've been talking about, we talked about how the, 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 some recent draft has helped you know, teams like the, the Jaguars turn things around. Mm -hmm. Cincinnati has earned that benefit of the doubt as well. I like Miles Murphy. This is a spot now where like a lot of the players are kind of interchangeable in terms of overall value. Like Murphy could have gone yep. 38th and what is 38th and it wouldn't have surprised me. So 28th, good spot there for him. I, I love it. They beef up this defense, and obviously in this in this division, you got to go against a, a freshly paid Lamar Jackson, Deshaun Watson, guys who run around. And again, for Cincinnati, Bengals fans in general, like you're in a completely different world than you've been in in the last 30 years. Mm. They are for, and also a position of luxury that now they're adding things to the pieces to kind of maintain their position as the top dogs in the AFC North, which is, again, it's just something that most Ouch. Bengals fans would never even imagine possible. I feel like he is similar to Tyree in this. I feel like there's room to grow. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of potential that really hasn't been developed there that I think if he ends up in the right place like Cincy, you're going to see it. 
Well, and what have you guys all stressed throughout the course of this? There are certain areas that you just you can't have enough of, right? Like yeah. you, mm -hmm. if you can bring somebody else that can be rotational value out of the bottom of the first round, particularly somebody that they don't have to come in and be a superstar oh, yeah. out of the, the gates. They just got to give you snaps well, and give you fresh legs. That can matter a lot later. How did their the season. season end? Their season end against the Chiefs. Mm -hmm. Patrick Mahomes playing on half an ankle. It didn't sack him once. Yep. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, it's weird. You don't normally want to sort of to break your, to shake your roster up and then retool it based simply off of one player or one team. But I feel like we are seeing some, like, big game hunting yeah. at the top in the AFC. Mm -hmm. like the Bills are like, you know what? we got to have another middle-of-the-field tight end to keep up with the Chiefs. The Bengals are saying we got to find another pass rusher to slow down the Chiefs. Mm -hmm. It's 271 pounds, runs a 4 5 three. Well, it's crazy. fine. Oh my God. The That's athleticism fine. is yeah. unbelievable, but I like the speed converted to power, and you've seen it mm -hmm. getting off the ball and mm -hmm. then chugging the offense alignment with one arm. Yeah. That, that long arm? Go, that long yeah. arm hey, nut. Man, that's demoralizing. We're yep. starting to see it now in the NFL a lot more, I think, is um, I'm starting to see more and more like you're not – they're going to be older players because of the COVID rules. There's going to be, you know, surprises. But athletes are not – like you're getting athletes only in the first round now, right? Like yeah. mm -hmm. that we're seeing some guys that – like, I can't, I'm just, I'm looking through the board right now, and I'm trying to find the, like, and no matter, you think Emmanuel Forbes a little too high, whatever, like, even Jack Campbell a little too high, but, like, all of them are athletes, all really yeah. good athletes yeah. in the NFL. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like, in prior years, like, this is, this is a little bit of a flash, but, you know, Cleveland Farrell went high, he went fourth, that was way higher. Sorry. I'm right here. Sorry, but, like, that, he wasn't, like, a premium <laughs> athlete, right? Is that, like, is that the Raiders? Athleticism yeah. is, is rating supreme right now. Uh, in the NFL. Your Raiders. You've right, time to so absorb that blow, come on. This yeah. is an interesting nugget for you here. All right. We are on the clock right now, obviously. The New Orleans Saints are on the clock. Why is that interesting? Well, they're on the clock with the 29th pick. That pick was originally the 49ers pick, which was then traded to Miami for Trey Lance, which was then traded to Denver for Bradley Chubb, which was then sent to the Saints for Sean Payton. This pick has been around the block. I think, like, uh, you know, at this point, I wanted, again, to, get, I'm, I wanted to get traded again. Yeah, I think to. they should trade it, yeah. I, it feels like that's the right thing to do right now. I yeah. mean, <laughs> uh, this, paint, this pick has gone all over the place uh, uh, again, but New Orleans ends up with this pick. Again, we only have three picks left in the first round. Uh, we have the Saints, the Eagles, and the Chiefs all waiting to make their picks. So, uh, as you look at the best available and you think about where the Saints are. Well, I, I would think – they will go defensive line, knowing the simple mm -hmm. fact that the Atlanta Falcons stole two of their players in David Omiyata and also Key Needless. They got stole? They just went out. You know, just <laughs> Give me that. You know, little, you know where I'm from? Uh, throw a little shade there? Throw you know where I'm from? Throw a little shade there? Uh, no, but it does make sense, right? Yes. Uh, but I'll ask Field, you asked a question earlier, like what's the identity of the Titans? Like who are these teams? Who are, the, who are the Saints right now? Well, the Saints are saying that we're the best team in the NFC South. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, Harry. Mm. Falcons probably in that mix as well, right? But, like, they're saying <laughs> to themselves, we don't have to be – what's the old – you don't have to be the fast – you don't have to be the fastest bear. You got to be the fastest and the slowest bear. I don't have to be faster than the bear. Okay, faster, yeah. Bear. yeah, okay, yeah. Fast, yeah. <laughs> totally bungled that one. But that was the concept I was looking <laughs> yeah, for. Yeah, no, right no, we're there. there. Right? And it's yeah. like, you got a pathway into the playoffs in the NFC South right now because Derek Carr is the best quarterback in the division. Bryce Young will get there one day, but Derek mm. Carr is. And all of a sudden, you got a team that – probably thinks, like, we have a chance to win 10, 11 games and make the playoffs again and play nasty defense. So where do you go in this draft? I mean, as we look at the best I mean, available. You, so if you look at some of the, so let's talk about some of the players they lost this offseason. David Onyemata to the Falcons. Mm -hmm. Caden Ellis to the Falcons. Uh, Onyemata, probably a bigger blow. They also yeah. lost Shai Tuttle to the Panthers. That's two defensive tackles. They certainly need some interior defensive line help. I think offensive line, they got a question mark in Cesar Ruiz, whether they're going to pick up his fifth-year option. That could be that could be a, Osiris Torrance makes some sense here uh, for the Saints. So those would be some of the places that come to mind for me. If there was a, uh, a difference-making tight end, uh, it could justify that one as well because Michael Mayer would be different than uh, who they re recently reinvested in, which was Jawan Johnson. All right, so the pick is in, and that means that there is no trade. Uh, Dang! Me, Captain Obvious. Oh. There is no trade. The pick is in. And uh, we will see where New Orleans goes with this as, uh, as we, again, come to the end of the first round in Kansas City. Only three picks remaining. If you're just tuning in, uh, don't forget, we'll be with you for every pick tomorrow also. Starting at 7 o'clock Eastern, you can hang out with us. We will be crushing it through every single pick. Roger Goodell coming up to the podium. He gets to take tomorrow night off. I've never understood that. Like, you know, come on, Rog. Come back. Tell everybody the picks. I feel like, um, like back in the day... 
Roger, uh, Brian, there we go. All right, Brian there Brzee. We go. Brian Brzee. Brian Brzee. All right, we'll talk another, about Another, another Clemson D lineman. Mm -hmm. But it, it, here, he's a guy. His freshman year had a phenomenal year. Yeah. Um, second year, 2021, tore his ACL. Last year, you know, went through a lot. Sister passed away yep. with cancer. He did. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing this guy stay on the field for an, for an entire year, but also just getting a fresh start, right? It's just something to be said, man, when you're going through two tragic things like that and, and once your sister passed away and then tearing your ACL after having a phenomenal rookie uh, or freshman year. So really looking forward to him, but also a need from the Saints because they lost so much on the defensive line. You, you He's got something to prove here. He does. I, mean, I think Harry hit on all the key notes there. Uh, you know, and the personal tragedy is something that you can't, I mean, you can't quantify that. I mean, yeah. sister we had a great relationship with, and obviously that's heartbreaking for him and his entire family. But came to Clemson, like number one high school recruit in the entire country. This guy was supposed to be the dude on that at Clemson defense. Nine career sacks, which is an interior defensive lineman. It's not going to be 39 defense uh, sacks. But um, this, this is a traits pick. And... You know, the Saints, we'll see how that defense takes shape this year with a new defensive coordinator and new defensive line coach. It's Ryan Nielsen, who was their defensive line coach and considered one of the best in the NFL. Where did he, he go? He goes to the Falcons. So, I'll just one I'll be damn, projection, Phil. right? Like, he's got no doubt Brzee has some upside. But this was a player who I think if you looked uh, at early mock drafts last year, yep. he might have been like a top eight. 100%. Yep. You mentioned the injuries. I just want to – I don't want to pile on to that, but more information on that. He sprained his left knee in 2020. All right. Then he sort of suffered a torn ACL in his left knee in 2021, that required season-ending surgery. Just as he got back, he had a case of strep that caused a kidney infection and landed him in the hospital where he added 45 pounds of water weight while he was sick. He played only 40 or more snaps in three games, and the coaches had to limit his practice reps. I say all of that to say we talked earlier about how, like, the meeting matters. This is one to me that the medical mattered. Like, you, you needed your, your coaching staff to take a good look, your medical staff to take a good look and make sure that the player – it's not his fault. None of – like, I'm not piling any of that on him. Sometimes life just happens. But you better be comfortable with the medical portion of this. You, you know what I say about it, about everything, though? Um, he is a human being who has faced adversity mm -hmm. multiple times. Yep. So – I wouldn't mind taking a chance on a player like that because if he keeps – if he, I've seen he's kept pushing through it, and he's a high-level player. Phil, you just mentioned how he was and what he was rated coming out of high school. Mm -hmm. I think he has tremendous upside because when I mean he was dominant in his freshman season at Clemson, yep. yeah. the, the film is there from that year. He just got to, you know, overcome that adversity, and I think he already has taken that step. This is a dangerous thing. We're introducing context to nuance. No, we got right? We yeah. got to stop doing this. You, know, it's is, you, always, you always, you always like uh, on the first side of the draft. Like you get, I, 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 I've been guilty of in the past. It's like every pick. It's like Brian Brzee, Aaron Donald 2.0, right? It's like Jordan Addison. He's playing with Justin Jefferson. He might be better than Justin Jefferson, right? Like it's okay. Like you know, I think we're allowed. We're entitled to to point out why, like. A player goes to 29 as opposed yeah. to 9 overall. but yep. uh, And he truly yeah. has been through a lot. I mean, H, do you remember when we had game day at Clemson? We stood next to his family yep. while they basically laid out their own personal tragedy. Yeah. And mm -hmm. between the injuries, between his sister passing, he's clearly just been through absolutely everything you could throw at a guy. And I just have to imagine between his, his potential as a player, right, and who he was coming out of high school, you mentioned his freshman year at Clemson, they had to have come away just so impressed with him because the yeah. fact that he is chugging along in this way, I really do see the upside with him. And honestly, I mean, I think we want everybody who we're seeing their name pop up tonight to have success, but that person I think I'm rooting a little bit extra for. And his defensive line coach at Clemson, Nick Eason, has been a defensive line coach in the National Football League for a very, very long time. So I'm pretty sure scouts had that one-on-one -on -one with him. I mean, it, at some level, both of you have referenced it from your respective positions. And I, mm -hmm. I, as much as we all tease, let's respect the fact that you guys were in the league for a long time. You had impactful careers. To do that, you had to overcome a lot of doubts, right? Like, there's just sure, – once yeah. you're in the league, that's all that matters. And I think one thing about this show is that as much as we're going to talk about the context of injury mm -hmm. or the context of life that happens for all these kids, that doesn't mean that we're saying any anybody's a bad pick or doesn't – you know, now you get in the door and then it's what you do with the opportunity. Absolutely. It's about investing and where you invest in players at, right? So if, um, you know, someone gets hurt, like you said, with that kind of injury history, he probably would be even higher – then maybe even Mozzie Smith, maybe even Cancy, if it wasn't for the injury. So that makes sense of why he drops to the bottom of the first round. But to your point, when you play in the NFL, 
it's a 100% injury rate. So the guys that play through, that can deal with that, can come back from injury, are typically the ones that last the longest. Also, a laundry list that we listed earlier on the injuries and still picked in the first round. Exactly. That tells you what kind of player he is. So the Eagles are on the clock. Uh, Jalen Carter was selected earlier. Nolan Smith, just so they can become Georgia of Philly. Bring them all. Bring Uh, another one. Georgia. (laughs) I mean... I joke, but at the same time, they definitely seem to have a pipeline of understanding, right? Like, they, they seem to be comfortable with, with draftees from Georgia. No doubt. Yeah. No, I mean, can you blame them? Who was what? Uh, Which defense was better, do you think? Last year's or the 2021 defense for Georgia? 2020, 2021. 2021. And they have already three of the best players yeah. for that defense. Like Kobe yeah. Dean and Jalen Carter yep. and obviously uh, last year Jordan Davis. So, hey, what the heck? Can they trade for Eric Stokes, too? No, it's going to be the sense. Georgia Eagles, so... Right. But we all know that there are certain coaching staffs in the NFL that have great relationships with, with certain programs, with certain yep. programs yeah. right? So, like, actually kind of makes sense, you know? Absolutely. Nolan Smith would be a great pick here, I think. And the reason that he frightens me, he always plays with a smile on his face. Mm. <laughs> ter- <laughs> that, ter- that is a, like, a glass. glasses, like, too. Like He's got glasses. And he, yeah, yes, terrifying. glasses all the time. Absolutely terrifying. Kyle Pitts, same way, always wearing glasses. Yep. Yeah. But physically imposing, but always smiling. Yeah. You, you don't want to line up on the other side and see that. A 4-3. Four, 4-3-9. Three. Four, three, That's right. It's not uh-huh. uh-huh. yeah. uh-huh. yeah. the 40-yard day. He's like a, I mean, he plays a lot like Hassan Riddick, the faster version, right? Yep. And you can imagine uh-huh. those two guys are in the same team. Another yeah, one to look out for is Brian Branch, safety. And, out of Alabama. and, and, and by the way, an, like under, an undersold yeah. aspect of all these Georgia defenders, they're all smart as hell. They yeah. are all yep. so cerebral, and they understand concepts and, and sets. They know exactly what they're looking at at all times. It's terrifying. And with that, that defense and coming out of that program, whenever you play with other NFL-caliber players, uh-huh. oh, yeah. it teaches you to focus on your job, right? Because a lot of times when you're the best or you're in, certain, in certain programs, you're doing more than you're going to be asked to do in the NFL because everybody's on scholarship in the NFL. Everyone's getting paid here. And so when they get to the league – it's not as much of a curve. Like, you're already used to having yep. NFL caliber guy to your right, NFL caliber guy to your left. Yep. Mm-hmm. The pick is in for Philly. Uh, that is noted because that means there's only one pick after this that would be Kansas City that will go on the clock. That will conclude the draft. So now that we know that this pick is in, we definitely know that either Will Levis or Hendon Hooker, for all the thought of trading back into the first round, one of those quarterbacks is going to be available when the draft starts tomorrow. We know that at this point. Yep. The Eagles have made this pick. Kansas City still rocking. To nobody's surprise. I mean, Kansas City, you know they're out there having a good time. Our colleagues have eaten too much, uh, too much barbecue this week. That yeah. Is that Mama good. Kelsey there? Oh, that's good. I mean. That's dude perfect. Well, <laughs> that's dude perfect? <laughs> that is dude perfect. My son right now is at home going bananas Freaking out. right now. <laughs> yeah. That's dude perfect. Wow. Mama Kelsey and Dude Perfect. We're both right. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Naturally, Kelsey. together at last, yeah. Donna Kelsey and Dude Perfect. This is the collaboration the world didn't know it We needed. didn't know it happened. Yeah. We didn't yeah. know Mama Kelsey was going to join Did Dude Perfect. That. I mean, this is, a, this is a brilliant moment. This is what, a little pomp and circumstance to the draft, Let's, uh, which, by the way, we're all thankful for. Many of us have covered the draft now for ESPN for several years in this format. Wouldn't happen without moments like this. Like, let's remember Absolutely. there was a yeah. period where they didn't even televise this stuff. So. Yep. Uh, now it's become a phenomenon that people consume mock drafts on, and we build radio content around for months. Mm-hmm. Respect the dude perfect, by the way. Bro. What a, what a hey, great story. Yeah. We're on you top know? of the world, huh? Uh, I believe they're Cowboys fans. Yeah. This does seem kind of like heresy to me, but uh, <laughs> you know what? Donna Kelsey's about to throw a basketball off the top of a stadium and through a hoop <laughs> from like 100 yards away, and we're all going to clap. Yeah, I'm it's here It's going to be it. incredible. Yep. The Philadelphia Eagles have made their selection. Go full dog. Go full dog. Oh. Come on. What, 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 what exactly yeah, We need is Gator Lobsky barking hey, right just now. Get another, get another Georgia dude. Okay. I, get I, the band back together. I just thought maybe you were going to give us like a bark or like maybe a Maybe there's a third Kelsey or... brother we don't know about. <laughs> yeah, no. Wow. 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 <laughs> there you go, oh, man. There it is. I just like it when we spend several minutes talking about something and then it actually comes to fruition. Look, okay. at, the, look at the bubbly. Look, <laughs> that you. white is fresh. Or is that oh. cream? No, I, you know what? <laughs> that cream or white? Like, He's the top three tonight. That's, like, look at that. Too. That's nice. That is nice. Yeah. I mean, talk about it. This is the guy that runs up 4-3. Uh-huh. That is ridiculous. He's in the white suit. He's got champagne even before the draft pick comes yeah. out. He's got the red bottom and the red tops. 
I don't know if AC has that. So for everyone He's definitely got the <laughs> who said office. the Philadelphia Eagles, because they lost their two coordinators, aren't going to be right back in the thick of things, please stop talking. <laughs> because <laughs> what they've been able to do in signing, you know, Jalen Hurts, but getting ahead of the curve last year, taking Nicobe Dean, taking um, Jordan Davis, mm-hmm. You look at this year's draft, Jalen Carter, Nolan Smith, they're, they're right there. They're not only trying to get back to the Super Bowl, they're actually trying to win the Super Bowl this season. But, th- but that speaks to one thing that we've mentioned about several teams, right? When you pay your quarterback, you better nail the draft. Yep. Philly has nailed the draft last year. Philly looks like they have nailed the draft again this year. I mean, that, this is just... Benefit of the doubt that certain franchises Is this even real? They sort of do things right. You know, they keep it simple. And, you know, listen, they're not all going to work out. Uh, N'Kobe Dean should have a bigger role this year, but, like, barely saw the field last year. So, like, you know, we we gave him a ton of flowers for that pick last year, and he was like a special teams guy for them. Mm -hmm. So maybe these things don't pan out as quickly as we expect them to. But Philly has a blueprint. You know, you, you draft guys that are freak athletes, have played basically NFL defense already. In fact, there are four guys from the same team. I'm sure won't be anything they'll be disappointed about. So Philly is primed, despite losing a ton of players in free agency this offseason. They are so primed to make a deep run in what looks like a very weak NFC. The, yeah. the division will be fine, right? But the rest of the – like this conference, Aaron Rodgers gone, Tom Brady retired, the Rams are like still rebuilding this thing. Like the Eagles are – damn, they are back up, man. It's, it's really hard to argue against in – I don't think people realize, like, yo, we're not kidding when we said that Georgia defense in 2021 was the best of all time. Yeah. It's showing up in these picks. Like, these are guys that were rotational players, some of them, on 2021's team, and they were just waiting for their turn to become first-round picks. Right? Because you just can't pick all of them in round one. That's absolutely just absurd. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy. absurd, but but they are that talented. Are key and I'm, I'm out. It, it's, it's, it's unreal. Like these are the players to, it, to look at it like this, right? Ooh. Alabama has dominated college football the past 15 years. Mm. These are the guys that stop that. Yeah. Yep. These are the guys yeah. that put that to rest. Totally. This, but the fact this that it's happening way. again, also, and you're right, they were all part of one defense a couple of years ago. It also speaks to what Georgia's mm-hmm. doing right yeah. now. Yeah. Like when people in college football say that Georgia is, is the new Alabama. I'm not taking Alabama off the throne, but I think what you have to acknowledge is that Georgia is recruiting at a level where it is not it is not wild to consider that this is just this is the new norm. Like yeah. Georgia's yeah. going to have three or four guys every year that are first round caliber defensive players that can come out and absolutely crush anybody. And then they get to go uh, escape the high pressure of Athens and play in a relaxed environment like Philly. So let me let me ask y'all a question. <laughs> so, so tomorrow the Eagles have the 62nd pick. If they take Keely Ringo, if he's still there, mm. uh-huh. I'm, I may just throw my pen and my highlighter up in the air. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Kirby Smart, New hey. Eagles defensive coordinator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But, out of Georgia. But. I, I will pull this, and I, I hate it when TV people do this, but I'm going to do this for a second, so just kick me if you need to. We mentioned earlier we really like Jalen Carter to Philly because of the support group. Mm-hmm. Now they add another person to that support group. Like, I just feel like all of this continues to just make me feel, yeah. not that my feelings matter, but make me feel better about Jalen Carter. Like, it feels like the, just the right situation mm-hmm. because now you have guys that have been in the league for a second that can help mentor, but also somebody that is still with him right now that knows what he's going through as a grieving person in this situation. Somebody else that lost a teammate. Somebody else that understands where they are in this yep. process. Yep. Like, yep. Uh, like uh, it's almost like a therapy buddy. Like, you, you end up with somebody that truly knows the ish you're living through right then. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That just feels like it just it, it, yeah, it makes point. me even, even happier for for Jalen Carter, that that's where he ended up. Yep. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And and Nolan Smith, I mean, again, we can't understate it enough. I mean, overstate enough is that he is an incredible athlete. Like, the yes. things against him is he's a little lean, he's a little light, right? And yeah. Intelligent, strong, too. But incredible intelligence, Intelligent. great yep. football character, yep. high motor, yep. plays kid, to yep. the whistle every time, you know? And, and it's like he runs a 4-3, 41-inch vertical leap. That's incredible. <laughs> if he was a wide receiver – or a corner yep. with those numbers, you would say, oh, that's an explosive athlete. To be an edge rusher, I mean, they, the rich got richer. Imagine, yeah. being, imagine coming out of the backfield, by the way. I get past Jordan Davis. <laughs> I get past Jalen Carter, and I look up, and there's a 4-3-9 missile headed at so, me. Yeah, I'm only going to interrupt you guys quickly to tell with you. Rick Spicks. The pick yeah. is in. 
Nick, is, <laughs> the Kansas City Chiefs in. have made the 31st, 31st selection. You know, they got a lot of needs, don't they? Yeah. No, they don't. The last five years, they've won two Super Bowls. Look at that record. They score 30 points a game, and they've cost me thousands of dollars in liquor that I just have to consume. At least twice a year when I watch them kick the snot out of the Raiders. They are the reason that I have no hope. And uh, they've made their pick. <laughs> the reason and I have no hope. Importantly, Jeez. though, this officially means right now we can – Is this – 100% Will Levis is, is going to be a day two pick. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so Bar- that is – Barring the wildest pick in the history of the NFL draft, right. yes. Hendon, <laughs> for all the speculation of Hendon Hooker and Will Levis – we now know that the beginning of tomorrow's draft is going to be this insane. Rules, because but by the way, this rules right now. The defending Super Bowl champions hosting the draft, making a pick. Like, what a moment this is right now in yeah. Kansas City. This That's is true. awesome. We have it on a separate screen here. Hopefully you're not watching it. Instead, you're just watching us. But this <laughs> is really cool. I hadn't for a great actually thought about town. the fact that it's a defending Super Bowl champion doing that at the same time. So There's so many people there. Yeah. yeah. The draft is a spectacle. Like, we've been lucky to get to go several times. And... Uh, I, really I mean, I, I don't know that I've ever experienced anything in my adult life like the Nashville draft was. Like, it was other level. Uh, and really perfectly done. And this for you and some other people that they didn't intend for it to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the Chiefs here probably are looking. So let's talk about some of the things that they can need. I know they don't have a ton, but, uh, you know, th- there's a chance they would consider a right tackle, I would think. Pass rush remains in need. This offseason they mm-hmm. signed... Charles Omenahu, hmm. um, who was uh, with the most recently with the 49ers, good player there, but they cut Frank Clark. So pass rush could be a uh, could be one to consider here. So uh, the Chiefs wide receiver would be one too, but the wide receiver run took place already. Sky Moore going to play a more pronounced role this year. Same with Kadarius Tony. Can I throw a wild card out there? Please do. Yeah, we, we got a Jalen Hyatt lurking, right? We do. Andy yep. likes Andy likes toys. Mm, mm, Andy mm. likes fast things. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. I saw a couple of mocks that had uh, one of the two top two tight ends going to him too. So, I mean, Mingo. Yeah. Mm. Mingo could could be. Another Mingo. Yeah. yeah. I like Mingo. He, I like he has that, he's, that, he's that AJ Brown type, yep. type player. Yeah. Yep. Strong, physical, uh, but Hyatt is like a, <clears throat> a deep threat. And <clears throat> Beep beep. Yeah, he, he can do a little better on the route running, and he can, you know, really mature as a receiver. But when you would have with Patrick Mahomes, <laughs> yeah, you don't need to. Saying. Hey, run deep, <laughs> and he has great ball skills. They've and, done this before. Yeah, exactly. The other thing with Jalen Hyatt, to your point, like he didn't have to do a lot of creative route running to kick the mm out of Alabama in that game. No. Like, Mm-mm. no, my touchdown right? Well, I, th- I think top. what's unique is that we seen Tyreek Hill be in this offense, right? And mm-hmm. those guys stack the receivers and. Find ways to get free releases. I yep. think that's the that's the thing for, with Jalen Hyatt. You didn't see him face press coverage, but when you have a guy like Andy Reid, he's going to make sure he minimizes that at the next level as well. If yep. you have a guy with that kind of speed, that can take top off. I mean, isn't that what Josh Heupel did so well for him in Tennessee? Like Josh yep. Heupel found a nice yep. way to get him moved around to spots where Alabama, mm-hmm. a defense that is certainly capable and has a lot of well, players, had we're talking up, about. got him matched up with safeties time and time again, and mm-hmm. we Not all. Knew how that also, you know who bites every single cool college play ever and puts it in the offense the <laughs> next week with like eight <laughs> different bells and whistles and shifts and for Andy Reid. Yeah. Like Andy yep. Reid. If, if anybody's watching the cool kids, it's, it's Andy Reid. They play yep. ring around a rosy during a football in game. In the NFL. Right? You stop mm-hmm. it. Like they it's did. too soon. Yeah. Most that wasn't against, that wasn't against your team, NFL was it? History. Yeah. Was, it, was that the Talk Raiders? About, oh, the lack, of, the lack yeah. of respect. I wouldn't let people <laughs> talk to me during – Warm-ups because I was so scared to mess up. And they're playing Ring Around a Rosie yeah. Yeah. in the middle of a game. Crazy. Menace. I don't know how I feel about any of that. We don't need to relive it. All right. Mm. That, was that against the Raiders? Yes. Ooh. Oh, all right. It is. My guy. All right. So, yep. The next uh, like the next pick's one. Felix and your DK Uzama. That's right. Mm-hmm. We had a great couple of seasons uh, at Kansas State the past couple of years. I believe lightly recruited coming out of high school. Almost positive that Walk he on. was getting looks at like the FCS level, you know, the uh, Kansas State coaching staff, is is it entirely former North Dakota State coaches? I mean, it's mostly pretty more, much, you know, yeah. that's, it's yeah. pretty much they, they basically imported the program uh, from Fargo. So that was the radar that Felix Onyedike Uzoma was on prior to lending up at Kansas State, but had a great couple of years. Freak athlete. This guy can really scoot off the edge. So uh, the Chiefs addressing that pass rushing need we were talking about just a little while ago, and uh, local one here. 
As somebody who used to live in Kansas City, there was about, I don't know, 85% Jayhawks fans, probably 10% Mizzou, and then another 5%. Good old Manhattan, Kansas, where K-State's located. Ah, I've played plenty of concerts in Manhattan, Kansas City. It's really? It's a wild good scene. spot there, yeah, no? Yeah, it's a good scene. Like yeah, I mean, that program, really I mean, they, they, they kick tail. I think KC has a nice nucleus of young guys. Like, whether they were late-round draft picks who played meaningful snaps last year, and now you just add another guy to that fold. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, really good athlete. Yeah. yeah. Really good athlete. Should play for them. And, uh, you know, the Chiefs are going to have a lead a lot, so you're going to need to have a – you can afford to have pass rushers who can just pin their ears back and do their job there, even if they can't buck up against the run, which, which Uzama can do. But uh, the Chiefs are going to need to have plenty of pass rushers because they're going to be a big – in a lot of second halves. And this is a Kansas State team that does not win the Big 12, which nobody expected them to do yeah. that last year without mm -hmm. this guy. Totally. Yeah. It's not going to be for a couple of days, probably Saturday, but I can't wait to see where Deuce Vaughn gets drafted just while we're talking about Kansas mm -hmm. State. Oh, yeah. Five, oh. five. Five, five, five all might, yeah. Giants, yeah. What I know is that it took a whole bunch of people behind the scenes to make this show happen over the course of the last several hours. Amen. So we got to make sure that we say thank you to everybody that has sacrificed and worked their tails off to let us sit here and act like a bunch of idiots. And we genuinely appreciate every single one of you that have given us your time to watch this draft broadcast. I also know we will be back tomorrow, 7 p.m. Eastern, for all of the picks in the second and third round. So we are just getting rolling. Well, we're actually going to take naps, but we are just getting rolling. So we hope that you'll consider coming back, hanging out with us again tomorrow. Field Yates, Let's Harry Douglas, go. Spencer Hall, Andrew Hawkins, Harry Lyles. I'm Jason Fitz. We appreciate you guys hanging out with us so much. We hope you'll come back tomorrow at 7 p.m. The draft is just getting rolling, and so are we. Yeah. Enjoy it all. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh.